Introduction to The Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Chronicles of Clovis by Saki, H. H. Munro. With an introduction by A. A. Milne. To the Lynx Kitten, with his reluctantly given consent, this book is affectionately dedicated. H. H. M. August 1911 Introduction There are good things which we want to share with the world, and good things which we want to keep to ourselves. The secret of our favourite restaurant, to take a case, is guarded jealously from all but a few intimates. The secret, to take a contrary case, of our infallible remedy for seasickness, is thrust upon every traveller we meet even if he be no more than a casual acquaintance about to cross the serpentine. So with our books. There are dearly loved books of which we babble to a neighbour at dinner, insisting that she shall share our delight in them, and there are books, equally dear to us, of which we say nothing, fearing lest the praise of others should cheapen the glory of our discovery. The books of Saki were, for me at least, in the second class. It was in the Westminster Gazette that I discovered him, I like to remember now, almost as soon as he was discoverable. Let us spare a moment and a tear for those golden days in the early 1900s, when there were five leisurely papers of an evening in which the free lance might graduate, and he could speak of his alma mater, whether the Globe or the Pall Mall, with as much pride as, he never doubted, the Globe or the Pall Mall would speak one day of him. Myself but lately down from St. James, I was not too proud to take some slight but pitying interest in men of other colleges. The unusual name of a freshman, up at Westminster, attracted my attention. I read what he had to say, and it was only by reciting rapidly with closed eyes the names of our own famous alumni, beginning confidently with Barry and ending, now very doubtfully, with myself, that I was able to preserve my equanimity. Later one heard that this undergraduate from overseas had gone up at an age more advanced than customary, and just as Cambridgemen have been known to complain of the maturity of Oxford Rhodes scholars, so one felt that this Westminster freelance in the thirties was no fit competitor for the youth of other colleges. Indeed, it could not compete. Well, I discovered him but only to the few, the favoured, did I speak of him. It may have been my uncertainty, which still persists, whether he called himself Seikai, Saki, or Saki, which made me thus ungenerous of his name, or it may have been the feeling that the others were not worthy of him. But how refreshing it was when some intellectually blown-up stranger said, Do you ever read Saki? to reply, with the same pronunciation and even greater condescension, Saki, he's been my favourite author for years. A strange, exotic creature, this Saki, to us many others who were trying to do it too. For we were so domestic, he so terrifyingly cosmopolitan. While we were being funny, as planned, with collar studs and hot water bottles, he was being much funnier with werewolves and tigers. Our little dialogues were between John and Mary, his, and how much better, between Bertie Van Tan and the Baroness. Even the most casual intruder into one of his sketches, as it might be our Tomkins, had to be called Bel Turbot, or De Rob, and for his hero, weary man of the world at seventeen, nothing less thrilling than Clovis Sangrail would do. In our envy we may have wondered sometimes if it were not much easier to be funny with tigers than with collar studs, if Saki's careless cruelty, that strange boyish insensitiveness of his, did not give him an unfair start in the pursuit of laughter. It may have been so, but, fortunately, our efforts to be funny in the Saki manner have not survived to prove it. What is Saki's manner? What his magic talisman? Like every artist worth consideration, he had no recipe. If his exotic choice of subject was often his strength, it was often his weakness. If his insensitiveness carried him through, at times, to victory, 
it brought him at times to defeat. I do not think that he has that mastery of the Conte, in this book at least, which some have claimed for him. Such mastery infers a passion for tidiness, which was not in the boyish Saki's equipment. He leaves loose ends everywhere. Nor in his dialogue, delightful as it often is, funny as it nearly always is, is he the supreme master. Too much does it become monologue judiciously fed, one character giving and the other taking. But in comment, in reference, in description, in every development of his story, he has a choice of words, a way of putting things, which is as inevitably his own vintage as, once tasted, it becomes the private vintage of the connoisseur. Let us take a sample or two of Saki 1911. Quote, the earlier stages of the dinner had worn off. The wine lists had been consulted by some with the blank embarrassment of a schoolboy suddenly called upon to locate a minor prophet in the tangled hinterland of the Old Testament, by others with the severe scrutiny which suggests that they have visited most of the higher-priced wines in their own homes and probed their family weaknesses. End quote. Locate is the pleasant word here. Still more satisfying, in the story of the man who was tattooed, quote, from collarbone to waistline with a glowing representation of the fall of Icarus, end quote, is the word privilege. Quote, the design, when finally developed, was a slight disappointment to M. Desplis, who had suspected Icarus of being a fortress taken by Wallenstein in the Thirty Years' War, but he was more than satisfied with the execution of the work which was acclaimed by all who had the privilege of seeing it as Pincini's masterpiece. End quote. This story, the background, and Mrs. Packletide's Tiger seem to me to be the masterpieces of this book. In both of them, Clovis exercises needlessly his titular right of entry, but he can be removed without damage, leaving Saki at his best and most characteristic save that he shows here, in addition to his own shining qualities, a compactness and a finish which he did not always achieve. With these I introduce you to him, confident that ten minutes of his conversation, more surely than any words of mine, will have given him the freedom of your house. A. A. Milne End of the Introduction Chapter One of the Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter is read by Hilary Hugh. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. Esme, all hunting stories are the same," said Clovis just as all turf stories are the same and all my hunting story isn't a bit like any you ever heard said the baroness it happened quite a while ago when i was about twenty-three i wasn't living apart from my husband then you see neither of us could afford to make the other a separate allowance in spite of everything that proverbs may say Poverty keeps together more homes than it breaks up, but we always hunted with different packs. All this has nothing to do with the story. We haven't arrived at the meat yet. I suppose there was a meat, said Clovis. Of course there was a meat, said the Baroness. All the usual crowd were there, especially Constance Bradel. Constance is one of those strapping florid girls that go so well with autumn scenery or Christmas decorations in church. I feel a presentiment that something dreadful is going to happen, she said to me. Am I looking pale? She was looking as pale as a beetroot that had suddenly heard bad news. You are looking nicer than usual, I said to her but that's so easy for you before she had got the right bearings of this remark we had settled down to business 
Hans had found a fox lying out in some gorse bushes. I knew it, said Clovis. In every fox hunting story that I have ever heard, there's been a fox and some gorse bushes. Constance and I were well mounted, continued the Baroness serenely, and we had no difficulty in keeping ourselves in the first flight, thought it was a fairly stiff run. Towards the finish, however, we must have held rather too independent a line, for we lost the hounds and found ourselves plodding aimlessly along miles away from anywhere. It was fairly exasperating, and my temper was beginning to let itself go by inches, when on pushing our way through an accommodating hedge, we were gladdened by the sight of hounds in full cry in a hollow beneath us. There they go, cried Constance, and then added in a gasp, In heaven's name, what are they hunting? It was certainly no mortal fox. It stood more than twice as high, had a short, ugly head, and an enormous thick neck. It's a hyena, I cried. It must have escaped from Lord Pabham's park. At that moment, the hunted beast turned and faced its pursuers, and the hounds, there were only about six couple of them, stood round in a half circle and looked foolish evidently they had broken away from the rest of the pack on the trail of this alien scent and were not quite sure how to treat their quarry now they had got him the hyena hailed our approach with unmistakable relief and demonstrations of friendliness it had probably been accustomed to uniform kindness from humans, while its first experience of a pack of hounds had left a bad impression. The hounds looked more than ever embarrassed as the quarry paraded its sudden intimacy with us, and the faint toot of horn in the distance was seized on as a welcome signal for an obstructive departure. Constance and I and the hyena were left alone in the gathering twilight. What are we to do? asked Constance. What a person you are for questions, I said. Well, we cannot stay here all night with the hyena, she retorted. I don't know what your ideas of comfort are, I said, but I shouldn't think of staying here all night even without a hyena. My home may be an unhappy one, but at least it has hot and cold water laid on, and domestic service, and other conveniences which we shouldn't find here. We had better make for that ridge of trees to the right. I imagine the Crowley Road is just beyond. We trotted off slowly along a faintly marked cart track, with the beast falling cheerfully at our heels. What on earth are we to do with this hyena? came the inevitable question. What does one generally do with hyenas? I asked crossly. I've never had anything to do with one before, said Constance. Well, neither have I. If we even knew its sex, we might give it a name. Perhaps we might call it Esme. That would do in either case. There was still sufficient daylight for us to distinguish wayside objects, and our listless spirits gave an upward spark as we came upon a small half-naked gypsy brat picking blackberries from a low-growing bush. The sudden apparition of two horsewomen and a hyena set it off crying, and in any case, we should scarcely have gleaned any useful geographical information from that source. But there was a probability that we might strike a gypsy encampment somewhere along our route. We rode on hopefully, but uneventfully, for another mile or so. I wonder what that child was doing there, 
said Constance presently. Picking blackberries, obviously. I don't like the way it cried, pursued Constance. Somehow, its veil keeps ringing in my ears. I did not chide Constance for her morbid fancies. As a matter of fact, the same sensation of being pursued by a persistent fretful veil had been forcing itself on my rather overtired nerves. For company's sake, I hallowed to Esme, who had lagged somewhat behind. With a few springy bounds, he drew up level and then shot past us. The wailing accompaniment was explained. The gypsy child was firmly, and I expect painfully, held in his jaws. Merciful heaven! screamed Constance. What on earth shall we do? What are we to do? I am perfectly certain that at the last judgment Constance will ask more questions than any of the examining seraphs. Can't we do something? she persisted tearfully. As Esme cantered easily along in front of our tired horses. Personally, I was doing everything that occurred to me at the moment. I stormed and scolded and coaxed in English and French and gamekeeper language. I made absurd, ineffectual cuts in the air with my tongueless hunting crop. I hurled my sandwich case at the brute. In fact, I really don't know what more I could have done. And still, we lumbered on through the deepening dusk with the dark, uncaught shape lumbering ahead of us with a drone of lugubrious music floating in our ears. Suddenly, Esme bounded aside into some thick bushes where we could not follow. The veil rose to a shriek and then stopped altogether. This part of the story I always hurry over because it is really rather horrible. When the beast joined us again, after an absence of a few minutes, there was an air of patient understanding about him, as though he knew that he had done something of which we disapproved, but which he felt to be thoroughly justifiable. How can you let that ravening beast trot by your side? asked Constance. She was looking more than ever like an albino beetroot. In the first place, I can't prevent it, I said, and in the second place, whatever else he may be, I doubt if he is ravening at the present moment. Constance shuddered. Do you think the poor little thing suffered much? came another of her futile questions. The indications were all that way, I said. On the other hand, of course, it may have been crying from sheer temper. Children sometimes do. It was nearly pitch dark when we emerged suddenly into the high road. A flash of lights and the whir of a motor went past us at the same moment at uncomfortably close quarters. A thud and a sharp screeching yell followed a second later. The cart drew up, and when I had ridden back to the spot, I found a young man bending over a dark, motionless mass lying by the roadside. You have killed my Esme, I explained bitterly. I'm so awfully sorry said the young man. I keep dogs myself, so I know what you must feel about it. I'll do anything I can in reparation. Please bury him at once, I said. That much I think I may ask of you. Bring the spade, William, he called to the chaffer. Evidently, hasty roadside internments were contingencies that had been provided against. The digging of a sufficiently large grave took some little time. I say, what a magnificent fellow, said the motorist as the corpse was rolled over into the trench. I'm afraid he must have been rather a valuable animal. 
he took second in the puppy class at birmingham last year i said resolutely conscience nodded loudly don't cry dear i said brokenly it was all over in a moment he couldn't have suffered much look here said the young fellow desperately you simply must let me do something by way of reparation i refused sweetly but as he persisted i let him have my address of course we kept our counsel as to the earlier episodes of the evening lord Popham never advertised the loss of his hyena when a strictly fruit-eating animal strayed from his park a year or two previously he was called upon to give compensation in eleven cases of sheep worrying and practically to restock his neighbor's poultry yards and an escaped hyena would have mounted up to something on the scale of a government grant the gypsies were equally unobstructive over their missing offspring i don't suppose in large encampments they really know to a child or two how many they have got the baroness paused reflectively and then continued there was a sequel to the adventure though i got through the post a charming little diamond brooch with the name esme set in a sprig of rosemary incidentally too i lost the friendship of constance Brodel. you see when i sold the brooch i quite properly refused to give her any share of the proceeds i pointed out that the esme part of the affair was my own invention and the hyena part of it belonged to lord pebham if it really was his hyena of which of course i've no proof end of chapter this recording is in the public domain section two of the chronicles of clovis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by anna simon the chronicles of clovis by hector munro the matchmaker the grill-room clock struck eleven with the respectful unobtrusiveness of one whose mission in life is to be ignored when the flight of time should really have rendered abstinence and migration imperative the lighting apparatus would signal the fact in the usual way six minutes later clovis approached the supper-table in the blessed expectancy of one who has dined sketchily and long ago i'm starving he announced making an effort to sit down gracefully and read the menu at the same time so i gathered said his host from the fact that you were nearly punctual i ought to have told you that i'm a food reformer i've ordered two bowls of bread and milk and some health biscuits i hope you don't mind clovis pretended afterwards that he didn't go white above the collar line for the fraction of a second all the same he said you ought not to joke about such things there really are such people i've known people who've met them to think of all the adorable things there are to eat in the world and then to go through life munching sawdust and being proud of it they're like the flagellants of the middle ages who went about mortifying themselves they had some excuse said clovis they did it to save their immortal souls didn't they you needn't tell me that a man who doesn't love oysters and asparagus and good wines has got a soul or a stomach either he simply got the instinct for being unhappy highly developed clovis relapsed for a few golden moments into tender intimacies with a succession of rapidly disappearing oysters i think oysters are more beautiful than any religion he resumed presently they not only forgive our unkindness to them they justify it they incite us to go on being perfectly horrid to them once they arrive at the supper table they seem to enter thoroughly into the spirit of the thing there is nothing in christianity or buddhism that quite matches the sympathetic unselfishness of an oyster 
Do you like my new waistcoat? I'm wearing it for the first time tonight. It looks like a great many others you've had lately, only worse. New dinner waistcoats are becoming a habit with you. They say one always pays for the excesses of one's youth. Mercifully, that isn't true about one's clothes. My mother is thinking of getting married. Again? It's the first time. Of course, you ought to know. I was under the impression that she'd been married once or twice at least. Three times, to be mathematically exact. I meant that it was the first time she'd thought about getting married. The other times she did it without thinking. As a matter of fact, it's really I who am doing the thinking for her. As a matter of fact, it's really I who am doing the thinking for her in this case. You see, it's quite two years since her last husband died. You evidently think that brevity is the soul of widowhood. Well, it struck me that she was getting moped and beginning to settle down, which wouldn't suit her a bit. The first symptom that I noticed was when she began to complain that we were living beyond our income. All decent people live beyond their incomes nowadays, and those who aren't respectable live beyond other people's. A few gifted individuals manage to do both. It's hardly so much a gift as an industry. The crisis came, returned Clovis, when she suddenly started the theory that late hours were bad for one, and wanted me to be in by one o'clock every night. Imagine that sort of thing for me, who was eighteen on my last birthday. On your last two birthdays, to be mathematically exact. Oh, well, that's not my fault. I'm not going to arrive at nineteen as long as my mother remains at thirty-seven. One must have some regard for appearances. Perhaps your mother would age a little in the process of settling down. That's the last thing she'd think of. Feminine reformations always start in on the failings of other people. That's why I was so keen on the husband idea. Did you go as far as to select the gentleman, or did you merely throw out a general idea and trust to the force of suggestion? If one wants a thing done in a hurry, one must see to it oneself. I found a military johnny hanging round on a loose end at the club, and took him home to lunch once or twice. He'd spent most of his life on the Indian frontier, building roads and relieving famines and minimizing earthquakes and all that sort of thing that one does do on frontiers. He could talk sense to a peevish cobra in fifteen native languages, and probably knew what to do if you found a rogue elephant on your croquet lawn, but he was shy and diffident with women. I told my mother privately that he was an absolute woman-hater. So, of course, she laid herself out to flirt all she knew, which isn't a little. And was the gentleman responsive? I hear he told someone at the club that he was looking out for a colonial job with plenty of hard work for a young friend of his, so I gather that he has some idea of marrying into the family. You seem destined to be the victim of the Reformation after all. Clovis wiped the trays of Turkish coffee and the beginnings of a smile from his lips, and slowly lowered his dexter eyelid, which, being interpreted, probably meant, I don't think. End of section two. Chapter three of the Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe Tobermory It was a chill, rain-washed afternoon of a late August day, that indefinite season when partridges are still in security or cold storage, and there is nothing to hunt, unless one is bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel, in which case one may lawfully gallop after fat red stags. Lady Blemley's house party was not bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel. Hence there was a full gathering of her guests round the tea table on this particular afternoon. And, in spite of the blankness of the season and the triteness of the occasion, there was no trace in the company of that fatigued restlessness 
which means a dread of the pianola and a subdued hankering for auction bridge. The undisguised open-mouthed attention of the entire party was fixed on the homely negative personality of Mr. Cornelius Appin. Of all our guests, he was the one who had come to Lady Blemley with the vaguest reputation. Someone had said he was clever, and he had got his invitation in the moderate expectation, on the part of his hostess, that some portion at least of his cleverness would be contributed to the general entertainment. Until tea time that day, she had been unable to discover in what direction, if any, his cleverness lay. He was neither a wit nor a croquet champion, a hypnotic force nor a begetter of amateur theatricals. Neither did his exterior suggest the sort of man in whom women are willing to pardon a generous measure of mental deficiency. He had subsided into mere Mr. Appin, and the Cornelius seemed a piece of transparent baptismal bluff and now he was claiming to have launched on the world a discovery beside which the invention of gunpowder, of the printing press, and of steam locomotion were in considerable trifles. Science had made bewildering strides in many directions during recent decades, but this thing seemed to belong to the domain of miracle rather than to scientific achievement. "'And do you really ask us to believe,' Sir Wilfrid was saying, that you have discovered a means for instructing animals in the art of human speech, and that dear old Tobermory has proved your first successful pupil? It is a problem at which I have worked for the last seventeen years, said Mr. Appin. But only during the last eight or nine months have I been rewarded with glimmerings of success. Of course, I have experimented with thousands of animals, but latterly only with cats." Those wonderful creatures which have assimilated themselves so marvelously with our civilization while retaining all their highly developed feral instincts. Here and there among cats one comes across an outstanding superior intellect, just as one does among the ruck of human beings. And when I made the acquaintance of Tobermore a week ago, I saw at once that I was in contact with a beyond cat of extraordinary intelligence. I had gone far along the road to success in recent experiments with Tobermory as you call him, I have reached the goal. Mr. Appin concluded his remarkable statement in a voice which he strove to divest of a triumphant inflection. No one said rats, though Clovis's lips moved in a monosyllabic contortion which probably invoked those rodents of disbelief. And do you mean to say, asked Miss Resker, after a slight pause, that you have taught Tobermore to say and understand easy sentences of one syllable? My dear Miss Resker, said the wonder worker patiently, one teaches little children and savages and backward adults in that piecemeal fashion. When one has once solved the problem of making beginning with an animal of highly developed intelligence, one has no need for those halting methods. Tobermory can speak our language with perfect correctness. This time Clovis very distinctly said, Beyond rats! Sir Wilfrid was more polite, but equally skeptical. "'Hadn't we better have the cat in and judge for ourselves?' suggested Lady Blemley. Sir Wilfrid went in search of the animal, and the company settled themselves down to the languid expectation of witnessing some more or less adroit drawing-room ventriloquism. In a minute Sir Wilfrid was back in the room, his face white beneath its tan, and his eyes dilated with excitement. "'By God, it's true!' His agitation was unmistakably genuine, and his hearers started forward in a thrill of awakened interest. Collapsing into an armchair, he continued breathlessly. I found him dozing in the smoking room and called out to him to come for his tea. He blinked at me in his usual way, and I said, Come on, Toby, don't keep us waiting. And by God, he drawled out in a most horribly natural voice that he'd come when he dashed well pleased. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Appen had preached to absolutely incredulous hearers. Sir Wilfrid's statement carried instant conviction. A babble-like chorus of startled exclamation arose, amid which the scientist sat mutely, enjoying the first fruit of his stupendous discovery. In the midst of the clamor, Tobermory entered the room and made his way with velvet tread and studied, unconcerned, across to the group seated round the tea table. A sudden hush of awkwardness and constraint fell on the company. Somehow there seemed an element of embarrassment in addressing on equal terms a domestic cat of acknowledged dental ability. "'Will you have some milk, Tobermory?' asked Lady Blemley in a rather strained voice. "'I don't mind if I do,' 
was the response, couched in a tone of even indifference. A shiver of suppressed excitement went through the listeners, and Lady Blenley might be excused for pouring out the saucerful of milk rather unsteadily. "'I'm afraid I've spilt a good deal of it,' she said apologetically. "'After all, it's not my Axminster,' was Tobermory's rejoinder. Another silence fell on the group, and then Miss Resker, in her best district visitor manner, asked if the human language had been difficult to learn. Tobermory looked squarely at her for a moment, and then fixed his gaze serenely on the middle distance. It was obvious that boring questions lay outside his scheme of life. "'What do you think of human intelligence?' asked Mavis Pellington lamely. "'Of whose intelligence in particular?' asked Tobermory coldly. "'Oh, well, mine, for instance,' said Mavis with a feeble laugh. "'You've put me in an embarrassing position,' said Tobermory, whose tone and attitude certainly did not suggest a shred of embarrassment. "'When your inclusion in this house-party was suggested, Sir Wilfrid protested that you were the most brainless woman of his acquaintance, and that there was a wide distinction between hospitality and the care of the feeble-minded.' Lady Blenley replied that your lack of brain power was the precise quality which had earned you your invitation, as you were the only person she could think of who might be idiotic enough to buy their old car. You know, the one they call the Envy of Sisyphus, because it goes quite nicely uphill if you push it. Lady Blenley's protestations would have had greater effect if she had not casually suggested to Mavis only that morning that the car in question would be just the thing for her down at her Devonshire home. Major Barfield plunged in heavily to effect a diversion. How about your carryings on with the tortoiseshell puss up at the stables, eh? The moment he had said it, every one realized the blunder. One does not usually discuss these matters in public, said Tobermory frigidly. From a slight observation of your ways, since you've been in this house, I should imagine you'd find it inconvenient if I were to shift the conversation onto your own little affairs. The panic which ensued was not confined to the Major. "'Would you like to go and see if Cook has got your dinner ready?' suggested Lady Blemley hurriedly, affecting to ignore the fact that it wanted at least two hours to Tobermory's dinner time. "'Thanks,' said Tobermory. "'Not quite so soon after my tea. I don't want to die of indigestion.' "'Cats have nine lives, you know,' said Sir Wilfrid heartily. "'Possibly,' answered Tobermory. "'But only one liver.' Adelaide, said Mrs. Cornett, do you mean to encourage that cat to go out and gossip about us in the servants' hall? The panic had indeed become general. A narrow ornamental balustrade ran in front of most of the bedroom windows at the towers, and it was recalled with dismay that this had formed a favorite promenade for Tobermory at all hours. Hence he could watch the pigeons, and heaven knew what else besides. If he intended to become reminiscent in his present outspoken strain, the effect would be something more than disconcerting. Mrs. Cornett, who spent much time at her toilet table, and whose complexion was reputed to be a nomadic though punctual disposition, looked as ill at ease as the major. Miss Scrawen, who wrote fiercely sensuous poetry and led a blameless life, merely displayed irritation. If you are methodical and virtuous in private, you don't necessarily want everyone to know it. Bertie Van Tan, who was so depraved at seventeen, that he had long ago given up trying to be any worse, turned a dull shade of gardenia white. But he did not commit the error of dashing out of the room like Odo Finsbury, a young gentleman who was understood to be reading for the church, and who was possibly disturbed at the thought of scandals he might hear concerning other people. Clovis had the presence of mind to maintain a composed exterior. Privately he was calculating how long it would take to procure a box of fancy mice through the agency of the exchange in Mart, as a species of hush money. Even in a delicate situation like the present, Agnes Resker could not endure to remain too long in the background. Why did I ever come down here? she asked dramatically. Tobermore immediately accepted the opening. Judging by what you said to Mrs. Cornett on the croquet lawn yesterday, you were out for food. You described the Blumleys as the dullest people to stay with that you knew, but said they were clever enough to employ a first-rate cook. Otherwise, they'd find it difficult to get anyone to come down a second time. There's not a word of truth in it. I appeal to Mrs. Cornett, exclaimed the discomfited Agnes. Mrs. Cornett repeated your remark afterwards to Bertie Van Tan, 
continued Tobomori, and said, That woman is a regular hunger marcher. She'd go anywhere for four square meals a day, said Bertie Van Ton. And Bertie Van Ton said, At this point the chronicle mercifully ceased. Tobermory had caught a glimpse of the big yellow tom from the rectory, working his way through the shrubbery towards the stable wing. In a flash he had vanished through the open French window. With the disappearance of his two brilliant pupil, Cornelius Appen found himself beset by a hurricane of bitter upbraiding, anxious inquiry, and frightened entreaty. The responsibility for the situation lay with him, and he must prevent matters from becoming worse. Could Tobermory impart his dangerous gift to other cats was the first question he had to answer. It was possible, he replied, that he might have initiated his intimate friend, the stable puss, into his new accomplishment. But it was unlikely that his teaching could have taken a wider range as yet. Then, said Mrs. Cornett, Tobermory may be a valuable cat and a great pet, but I'm sure you'll agree, Adelaide, that both he and the stable cat must be done away with without delay. You don't suppose I've enjoyed the last quarter of an hour, do you? said Lady Blemley bitterly. My husband and I are very fond of Tobermory. At least we were before this horrible accomplishment was infused into him. But now, of course, the only thing is to have him destroyed as soon as possible. We can put some strike nine in the scraps he always gets at dinner time, said Sir Wilfrid and I will go and drown the stable cat myself. The coachman will be very sore at losing his pet, but I'll say a very catching form of mange has broken out in both cats, and we're afraid of it spreading to the kennels. But my great discovery, expostulated Mr. Appen, after all my years of research and experiment, you can go and experiment on the shorthorns at the farm, who are under proper control, said Mrs. Cornett, or the elephants at the zoological gardens. They're said to be highly intelligent, and they have this recommendation that they don't come creeping about our bedrooms and under chairs and so forth. An archangel ecstatically proclaiming the millennium and then finding that it clashed unpardonably with Henley and would have to be indefinitely postponed could hardly have felt more crestfallen than Cornelius Appen at the reception of his wonderful achievement. Public opinion, however, was against him. In fact, had the general voice been consulted on the subject, it is probable that a strong minority vote would have been in favor of including him in the strike nine diet. Defective train arrangements and a nervous desire to see matters brought to a finish prevented an immediate dispersal of the party, but dinner that evening was not a social success. Sir Wilfrid had had rather a trying time with the stable cat and subsequently with the coachman. Agnes Resker ostentatiously limited her repast to a morsel of dry toast which she bit as though it were a personal enemy, while Mavis Pellington maintained a vindictive silence throughout the meal. Lady Blemley kept up a flow of what she hoped was conversation, but her attention was fixed on the doorway. A plateful of carefully dozed fish scraps was in readiness on the sideboard, but sweets and savory and dessert went their way, and no Tobermory appeared either in the dining room or kitchen. The sepulchral dinner was cheerful compared with the subsequent vigil in the smoking room. Eating and drinking had at least supplied a distraction and cloaked to the prevailing embarrassment. Bridge was out of the question in the general tension of nerves and tempers, and after Odo Finsbury had given a lugubrious rendering of Melisande in the Wood to a frigid audience, music was tactily avoided. At eleven the servants went to bed announcing that the small window in the pantry had been left open as usual for Tobermory's private use. The guests read steadily through the current batch of magazines and fell back gradually on the badminton library and bound volumes of punch. Lady Blemley made periodic visits to the pantry, returning each time with an expression of listless depression which forestalled questioning. At two o'clock, Clovis broke the dominating silence. "'He won't turn up tonight,' He's probably in the local newspaper office at the present moment, dictating the first installment of his reminiscences. Lady What's-Her-Name's book won't be in it. It will be the event of the day. Having made this contribution to the general cheerfulness, Clovis went to bed. At long intervals, the various members of the house party followed his example. The servants taking round the early tea made a uniform announcement in reply to a uniform question. Tobermory had not returned. Breakfast was, if anything, a more unpleasant function than dinner had been, 
but before its conclusion, the situation was relieved. Tobermory's corpse was brought in from the shrubbery, where a gardener had just discovered it. From the bites on his throat and the yellow fur which coated his claws, it was evident that he had fallen in unequal combat with the big tom from the rectory. By midday, most of the guests had quitted the towers, and after lunch, Lady Blenley had sufficiently recovered her spirits to write an extremely nasty letter to the rectory about the loss of her valuable pet. Tobermory had been Appen's one successful pupil, and he was destined to have no successor. A few weeks later, an elephant in the Dresden Zoological Garden which had shown no previous signs of irritability, broke loose and killed an Englishman who had apparently been teasing it. The victim's name was variously reported in the papers as Oppen and Eppelin, but his front name was faithfully rendered Cornelius. If he was trying German irregular verbs on the poor beast, said Clovis, he deserved all he got. End of chapter 3「Chapter Number Four of the Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Naomi Brewster, Melbourne, Australia. Mrs. Packletide's Tiger. It was Mrs. Packletide's pleasure and intention that she should shoot a tiger. Not that the lust to kill had suddenly descended on her or that she felt that she would leave India safer and more wholesome than she had found it, with one fraction less of wild beast per million of inhabitants. The compelling motive for her sudden deviation towards the footsteps of Nimrod was the fact that Luna Bibberton had recently been carried eleven miles in an aeroplane by an Algerian aviator, and had talked of nothing else. Only a personally procured tiger skin and a heavy harvest of press photographs could successfully counter that sort of thing. Mrs. Packletide had already arranged in her mind the lunch that she would give at her house in Curzon Street, ostensibly in Luna Burberton's honour, with a tiger skin rug occupying most of the foreground and all of the conversation. She had also already designed in her mind the tiger claw brooch that she was going to give Luna Bibberton on her next birthday. In a world that is supposed to be chiefly swayed by hunger and by love, Mrs. Packletide was an exception. Her movements and motives were largely governed by dislike of Luna Bibberton. Circumstances proved propitious. Mrs. Packletide had offered a thousand rupees for the opportunity of shooting a tiger without overmuch risk or exertion, and it so happened that a neighbouring village could boast of being the favoured rendezvous of an animal of respectable antecedents, which had been driven by the increasing infirmities of age to abandon game-killing and confine its appetite to the smaller domestic animals. The prospect of earning the thousand rupees had stimulated the sporting and commercial instinct of the villagers. Children were posted night and day on the outskirts of the local jungle to head the tiger back in the unlikely event of his attempting to roam away to fresh hunting grounds, and cheaper kinds of goats were left about with elaborate carelessness to keep him satisfied with his present quarters. The one great anxiety was lest he should die of old age before the date appointed for the mensab's shoot. Mothers carrying their babies home through the jungle after the day's work in the fields hushed their singing lest they might curtail the restful sleep of the venerable herd robber. The great night duly arrived, moonlit and cloudless. A platform had been constructed in a comfortable and conveniently placed tree, and thereon crouched Mrs. Packletide and her paid companion, Miss Mebbin. A goat, gifted with a particularly persistent bleat, such as even a partially deaf tiger might be reasonably expected to hear on a still night, was tethered at the correct distance. 
with an accurately sighted rifle and a thumbnail pack of patience cards the sportswoman awaited the coming of the quarry i suppose we are in some danger said miss mebbin she was not actually nervous about the wild beast but she had a morbid dread of performing an atom more service than she had been paid for nonsense said mrs packletide it's a very old tiger it wouldn't spring up here even if it wanted to if it's an old tiger i think you ought to get it cheaper a thousand rupees is a lot of money louisa mebbin adopted a protective elder sister attitude towards money in general irrespective of nationality or denomination her energetic intervention had saved many a rouble from dissipating itself in tips in some moscow hotel and franks and centimes clung to her instinctively under circumstances which would have driven them headlong from less sympathetic hands her speculations as to the market depreciation of tiger remnants were cut short by the appearance on the scene of the animal itself as soon as it caught sight of the tethered goat it lay flat on the earth seemingly less from a desire to take advantage of all available cover than for the purpose of snatching a short rest before commencing the grand attack i believe it's ill said louisa mebbin loudly in hindustani for the benefit of the village headman who was in ambush in the neighbouring tree hush said mrs packletide and at that moment the tiger commenced ambling towards his victim now now urged miss mebbin with some excitement if he doesn't touch the goat we needn't pay for it the bait was extra the rifle flushed out with a great report and the great tawny beast sprang to one side and then rolled over in the stillness of death in a moment a crowd of excited natives had swarmed on to the scene and their shouting speedily carried the glad news to the village where a thumping of tom-toms took up the chorus of triumph and their triumph and rejoicing found a ready echo in the heart of mrs packletide already that luncheon party in curzon street seemed immeasurably nearer it was louisa mebbin who drew attention to the fact that the goat was in death throes from a mortal bullet wound while no trace of the rifle's deadly work could be found on the tiger evidently the wrong animal had been hit and the beast of prey had succumbed to heart failure caused by the sudden report of the rifle accelerated by senile decay mrs packletide was pardonably annoyed at the discovery but at any rate she was the possessor of a dead tiger and the villagers anxious for their thousand rupees gladly connived at the fiction that she had shot the beast and miss mebbin was a paid companion therefore did mrs packletide face the cameras with a light heart and her pictured fame reached from the pages of the texas weekly snapshot to the illustrated monday supplement of the nove vremia as for luna bibberton she refused to look at an illustrated paper for weeks and her letter of thanks for the gift of a tiger claw brooch was a model of repressed emotions the luncheon party she declined there are limits beyond which repressed emotions become dangerous from curzon street the tiger skin rug travelled down to the manor house and was duly inspected and admired by the county and it seemed a fitting and appropriate thing when mrs packletide went to the country costume ball in the character of diana she refused to fall in however with clovis's tempting suggestion of a primeval dance party at which everyone should wear the skins of beasts they had recently slain i should be in rather a baby bunting condition confessed clovis with a miserable rabbit skin or two to wrap up in but then 
he added with a rather malicious glance at diana's proportions my figure is quite as good as that russian dancing boy's how amused everyone would be if they knew what really happened said louisa mebbin a few days after the ball what do you mean asked mrs packletide quickly how you shot the goat and frightened the tiger to death said miss mebbin with her disagreeably pleasant laugh no one would believe it said mrs packletide her face changing colour as rapidly as though it were going through a book of patterns before post time luna bibberton would said miss mebbin mrs packletide's face settled on an unbecoming shade of greenish white you surely wouldn't give me away she asked i've seen a weekend cottage near dorking that i should rather like to buy said miss mebbin with seeming irrelevance six hundred and eighty freehold quite a bargain only i don't happen to have the money louisa mebbin's pretty weekend cottage christened by her le fauve and gay in summertime with its garden borders of tiger lilies is the wonder and admiration of her friends it's a marvel how louisa manages to do it is the general verdict mrs packletide indulges in no more big game shooting the incidental expenses are so heavy she confides to inquiring friends End of chapter 4、chapter、five of the Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. Chapter 5. The stampeding of Lady Bastable. It would be rather nice if you would put Clovis up for another six days while I go up north to the MacGregors, said Mrs. Sandral sleepily across the breakfast table. It was her invariable plan to speak in a sleepy, comfortable voice whenever she was unusually keen about anything. It put people off their guard, and they frequently fell in with her wishes before they had realized that she was really asking for anything. Lady Bastable, however, was not so easily taken unawares. Possibly she knew that voice and what it betokened. At any rate, she knew Clovis. She frowned at a piece of toast and ate it very slowly, as though she wished to convey the impression that the process. Hurt her more than it hurt the toast, but no extension of hospitality on Clovis's behalf rose to her lips. It would be a great convenience to me, pursued Mrs. Angrell, abandoning the careless tone. I particularly don't want to take him to the MacGregors, and it will only be for six days. It will seem longer, said Lady Bastable dismally. The last time he stayed here for a week. I know, interrupted the other hastily, but that was nearly two years ago. He was younger then. But he hasn't improved, said her hostess. It's no use growing older if you only learn new ways of misbehaving yourself. Mrs. Sandra was unable to argue the point. Since Clovis had reached the age of seventeen, she had never ceased to bewail his irrepressible waywardness to all her circle of acquaintances, and a polite scepticism would have greeted the slightest hint at a prospective reformation. She discarded the fruitless effort at cajolery and resorted to undisguised bribery. If you'll have him here for these six days, I'll cancel that outstanding bridge account. It was only For forty nine shillings, but Lady Bastable loved shillings with a great, strong love. To lose money at bridge and not to have to pay it was one of those rare experiences which gave the card table a glamour in her eyes which it could never otherwise have possessed. Mrs. Sangrel was almost equally devoted to her card winnings, but the prospect of 
conveniently warehousing her offspring for six days and incidentally saving his railway fare to the north reconciled her to the sacrifice when clovis made a belated appearance at the breakfast table the bargain had been struck just think said mrs sangra sleepily lady bastable has very kindly asked you to stay on here while i go to the macgregors clovis said suitable things in a highly unsuitable manner and proceeded to make punitive expeditions among the breakfast dishes with a scowl on his face that would have driven the purr out of a peace conference the arrangement that had been concluded behind his back was doubly distasteful to him in the first place he particularly wanted to teach the macgregor boys who could well afford the knowledge how to play poker patience secondly the bastable catering was of the kind that is classified as a rude plenty which clovis translated as a plenty that gives rise to rude remarks watching him from behind ostentatiously sleepy lids his mother realized in the light of long experience that any rejoicing over the success of her manoeuvre would be distinctly premature it was one thing to fit clovis into a convenient niche of the domestic jigsaw puzzle it was quite another matter to get him to stay there lady bastable was wont to retire in state to the morning-room immediately after breakfast and spend a quiet hour in skimming through the papers they were there so she might as well get their money's worth out of them politics did not greatly interest her but she was obsessed with a favorite foreboding that one of these days there would be a great social upheaval in which everybody would be killed by everybody else it will come sooner than we think she would observe darkly a mathematical expert of exceptionally high powers would have been puzzled to work out the approximate date from the slender and confusing groundwork which this assertion afforded on this particular morning the sight of lady bastable enthroned among her papers gave clovis the hint towards which his mind had been groping all breakfast time his mother had gone upstairs to supervise packing operations and he was alone on the ground floor with his hostess and the servants the latter were the key to the situation bursting wildly into the kitchen quarters clovis screamed a frantic though strictly non-committal summons poor lady bastable in the morning-room oh quick the next moment the butler cook page-boy two or three maids and a gardener who had happened to be in one of the outer kitchens were following in a hot scurry after clovis as he headed back for the morning-room lady bastable was roused from the world of newspaper lore by hearing a japanese screen in the hall go down with a crash then the door leading from the hall flew open and her young guest tore madly through the room shrieked at her in passing the jackery they're on us and dashed like an escaping hawk out through the french window the scared mob of servants burst in on his heels the gardener still clutching the sickle with which he had been trimming hedges and the impetus of their headlong haste carried them slipping and sliding over the smooth parquet flooring towards the chair where their mistress sat in panic-stricken amazement if she had had a moment granted her for reflection she would have behaved as she afterwards explained with considerable dignity it was probably the sickle which decided her but anyway she followed the lead that Clovis had given her through the French window, and ran well and far across the lawn, before the eyes of her astonished retainers. Lost dignity is not a possession which can be restored at a moment's notice, and both Lady Bastable and the butler found the process of returning to normal conditions almost as painful as a slow recovery from drowning. A jackery, even if carried out with the most respectful of intentions, cannot fail to leave some traces of embarrassment behind it by lunchtime however decorum had reasserted itself with enhanced rigour as a natural rebound from its recent overthrow and the meal was served in a frigid stateliness that might have been framed on a byzantine model halfway through its duration 
mrs sangro was solemnly presented with an envelope lying on a silver salver it contained a check for forty-nine shillings the mcgregor boys learned how to play poker patience after all they could afford to End of chapter 5chapter six of the chronicles of clovis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john burlinson the chronicles of clovis by hector monroe chapter six the background that woman's art jargon tires me said clovis to his journalist friend she's so fond of talking of certain pictures as growing on one as though they were a sort of fungus that reminds me said the journalist of the story of henri deppis have i ever told it you clovis shook his head henri deppis was by birth a native of the grand duchy of luxembourg on maturer reflection he became a commercial traveller his business activities frequently took him beyond the limits of the grand duchy and he was stopping in a small town of northern italy when news reached him from home that a legacy from a distant and deceased relative had fallen to his share it was not a large legacy even from the modest standpoint of henri deplis but it impelled him towards some seemingly harmless extravagances in particular it led him to patronize local art as represented by the tattoo needles of signor andreas pincini signor pincini was perhaps the most brilliant master of tattoo craft that italy had ever known but his circumstances were decidedly impoverished and for the sum of six hundred francs he gladly undertook to cover his client's back from the collarbone down to the waistline with a glowing representation of the fall of icarus the design when finally developed was a slight disappointment to m deplis who had suspected icarus of being a fortress taken by wallenstein in the thirty years war but he was more than satisfied with the execution of the work which was acclaimed by all who had the privilege of seeing it as pincini's masterpiece it was his greatest effort and his last without even waiting to be paid the illustrious craftsman departed this life and was buried under an ornate tombstone whose winged cherubs would have afforded singularly little scope for the exercise of his favourite art there remained however the widow pincini to whom the six hundred francs were due and thereupon arose the great crisis in the life of henri deplis traveller of commerce the legacy under the stress of numerous little calls on its substance had dwindled to very insignificant proportions and when a passing wine-bill and sundry other current accounts had been paid there remained little more than four hundred and thirty francs to offer to the widow the lady was properly indignant not wholly as she volubly explained on account of the suggested writing off of one hundred seventy francs but also at the attempt to depreciate the value of her late husband's acknowledged masterpiece in a week's time deplis was obliged to reduce his offer to four hundred and five francs which circumstance fanned the widow's indignation into a fury she cancelled the sale of the work of art and a few days later deplis learned with the sense of consternation that she had presented it to the municipality of bergamo which had gratefully accepted it he left the neighbourhood as unobtrusively as possible and was genuinely relieved when his business commands took him to rome where he hoped his identity and that of the famous picture might be lost sight of but he bore on his back the burden of the dead man's genius 
On presenting himself one day in the steaming corridor of a vapour bath, he was at once hustled back into his clothes by the proprietor, who was a North Italian, and who emphatically refused to allow the celebrated fall of Icarus to be publicly on view without the permission of the municipality of Bergamo. Public interest and official vigilance increased as the matter became more widely known, and Deplis was unable to take a simple dip in the sea or river on the hottest afternoon, unless clothed up to the collarbone in a substantial bathing garment. Later on, the authorities of Bergamo conceived the idea that salt water might be injurious to the masterpiece, and a perpetual injunction was obtained which debarred the muchly harassed commercial traveller from sea-bathing under any circumstances. Altogether, he was fervently thankful when his firm of employers found him a new range of activities in the neighbourhood of Bordeaux. His thankfulness, however, ceased abruptly at the Franco-Italian frontier. An imposing array of official force barred his departure, and he was sternly reminded of the stringent law which forbids the exportation of Italian works of art. A diplomatic parley ensued between the Luxembourgian and Italian governments, and at one time the European situation became overcast with the possibilities of trouble. But the Italian government stood firm. It declined to concern itself in the least with the fortunes or even the existence of Henri Deplis, commercial traveller, but was immovable in its decision that the fall of Icarus, by the late Pincini Andreas, at present the property of the municipality of Bergamo, should not leave the country. The excitement died down in time, but the unfortunate Deplis, who was of a constitutionally retiring disposition, found himself a few months later once more the storm centre of a furious controversy. A certain German art expert, who had obtained from the municipality of Bergamo permission to inspect the famous masterpiece, declared it to be a spurious Pincini, probably the work of some pupil whom he had employed in his declining years. The evidence of Deplis on the subject was obviously worthless, as he had been under the influence of the customary narcotics during the long process of pricking in the design. The editor of an Italian art journal refuted the contentions of the German expert, and undertook to prove that his private life did not conform to any modern standard of decency. The whole of Italy and Germany were drawn into the dispute, and the rest of Europe was soon involved in the quarrel. There were stormy scenes in the Spanish Parliament, and the University of Copenhagen bestowed a gold medal on the German expert, afterwards sending a commission to examine his proofs on the spot, while two Polish schoolboys in Paris committed suicide to show what they thought of the matter. Meanwhile, the unhappy human background fared no better than before, and it was not surprising that he drifted into the ranks of Italian anarchists. Four times, at least, he was escorted to the frontier as a dangerous and undesirable foreigner, but he was always brought back as the fall of Icarus, attributed to Pincini Andreas, early twentieth century, and then one day, at an anarchist congress at Genoa, a fellow worker, in the heat of debate, broke a file full of corrosive liquid over his back. The red shirt that he was wearing mitigated the effects, but the Icarus was ruined beyond recognition. His assailant was severely reprimanded for assaulting a fellow anarchist, and received seven years' imprisonment for defacing a national art treasure. As soon as he was able to leave the hospital, Henri Deplis was put across the frontier as an undesirable alien. In the quieter streets of Paris, especially in the neighbourhood of the Ministry of Fine Arts, you may sometimes meet a depressed, anxious-looking man, who, if you pass him the time of day, 
will answer you with a slight Luxembourgian accent. He nurses the illusion that he is one of the lost arms of the Venus de Milo, and hopes that the French government may be persuaded to buy him. On all other subjects I believe he is tolerably sane. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of the Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Wasaga Beach, Ontario. Chapter 7 Herman the Irascible. A Story of the Great Weep. It was in the second decade of the twentieth century, after the Great Plague had devastated England, that Herman the Irascible nicknamed also the wise, sat on the British throne. The mortal sickness had swept away the entire royal family unto the third and fourth generations, and thus it came to pass that Herman the Fourteenth of Saxe, Drachen, Wechenstein, who had stood thirtieth in the order of succession, found himself one day ruler of the British dominions within and beyond the seas. He was one of the great unexpected things that happened in politics, and he happened with great thoroughness. In many ways he was the most progressive monarch who had sat on an important throne. Before people knew where they were, they were somewhere else. Even his ministers, progressive though they were by tradition, found it difficult to keep pace with his legislative suggestions. As a matter of fact, admitted the Prime Minister. We are hampered by these votes for women creatures. They disturb our meetings throughout the country, and they try to turn Downing Street into a sort of political picnic ground. They must be dealt with, said Herman. Dealt with, said the Prime Minister. Exactly. Just so. But how? I will draft you a bill, said the King, sitting down at his typewriting machine, enacting that women shall vote at all future elections. Shall vote, you observe, or, to put it plainer, must. Voting will remain optional, as before, for male electors, but every woman between the ages of twenty-one and seventy will be obliged to vote, not only at elections for Parliament, county councils, district boards, parish councils, and municipalities, but for coroners, school inspectors, church wardens, curators of museums, sanitary authorities, police court interpreters, swimming bath instructors, contractors, choir masters, market superintendents, art school teachers, cathedral vergers, and other local functionaries, whose names I will add as they occur to me. All these offices will become elective, and failure to vote at any election falling within her area of residence will involve the female elector in a penalty of ten pounds. Absence, unsupported by an adequate medical certificate, will not be accepted as an excuse. Pass this bill through the two Houses of Parliament, and bring it to me for signature the day after tomorrow. From the very outset, the compulsory female franchise produced little or no elation even in circles which had been loudest in demanding the vote. The bulk of the women of the country had been indifferent or hostile to the franchise agitation, and the most fanatical suffragettes began to wonder what they had found so attractive in the prospect of putting paper ballots into a box. In the county districts, the task of carrying out the provisions of the new act was irksome enough. In the towns and cities, it became an incubus, there seemed no end to the elections. Laundresses and seamstresses had to hurry away from their work to vote, often for a candidate whose name they hadn't heard before, and whom they selected at haphazard. Female clerks and waitresses got up extra early to get their voting done before starting off to their places of business. Society women found their arrangements impeded and upset by the continual necessity for attending the polling stations. And weekend parties and summer holidays 
became gradually a masculine luxury. As for Cairo and the Riviera, they were possible only for genuine invalids or people of enormous wealth, for the accumulation of ten-pound fines during a prolonged absence was a contingency that even ordinary wealthy folk could hardly afford to risk. It was not wonderful that the female disenfranchisement agitation became a formidable movement. The No Votes for Women League numbered its feminine adherents by the million. Its colors, citron and old Dutch matter, were flaunted everywhere, and its battle hymn, We Don't Want to Vote, became a popular refrain. As the government showed no signs of being impressed by peaceful persuasion, more violent methods came into vogue. Meetings were disturbed, ministers were mobbed, policemen were bitten, an ordinary prison fare rejected, and on the eve of the anniversary of Trafalgar, women bound themselves in tears up to the entire length of the Nelson Column, so that its customary floral decoration had to be abandoned. Still the government obstinately adhered to its conviction that women ought to have the vote. Then, as a last resort, some woman would hit upon an expedient which it was strange that no one had thought of before. The great weep was organized. Relays of women, ten thousand at a time, wept continuously in the public places of the metropolis. They wept in railway stations, in tubes and omnibuses, in the National Gallery, at the Army and Navy stores, in St. James's Park, at ballad concerts, at Prince's, and in the Burlington Arcade. The hitherto unbroken success of the brilliant farcical comedy, Henry's Rabbit, was imperiled by the presence of drearily weeping women in stalls and circle and gallery, and one of the brightest divorce cases that had been tried for many years was robbed of much of its sparkle by the lachrymose behavior of a section of the audience. "'What are we to do?' asked the Prime Minister, whose cook had wept into all the breakfast dishes, and whose nursemaid had gone out, crying quietly and miserably, to take the children for a walk in the park. "'There is a time for everything,' said the King. "'There is a time to yield. Pass a measure through the two houses, depriving women of the right to vote, and bring it to me for the royal assent the day after tomorrow.' As the Minister withdrew, Herman the Irascible, who was also nicknamed the Wise, gave a profound chuckle. There are more ways of killing a cat than by choking it with cream, he quoted. But I'm not sure, he added, that it's not the best way. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of the Chronicles of Clovis » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. Chapter 8 The Unrest Cure. On the rack in the railway carriage, immediately opposite Clovis, was a solidly wrought travelling bag with a carefully written label on which was inscribed j p huddle the warren tilfield near slobra immediately below the rack sat the human embodiment of the label a solid sedate individual sedately dressed sedately conversational even without his conversation, which was addressed to a friend seated by his side and touched chiefly on such topics as the backwardness of Roman hyacinths and the prevalence of measles at the rectory, one could have gauged fairly accurately the temperament and mental outlook of the travelling bag's owner. But he seemed unwilling to leave anything to the imagination of a casual observer, and his talk grew presently personal and introspective. "'I don't know how it is,' he told his friend. "'I'm not much over forty, but I seem to have settled down into a deep groove of elderly middle age. My sister shows the same tendency. We like everything to be exactly in its accustomed place. We like things to happen exactly at their appointed times. 
we like everything to be usual orderly punctual methodical to a hair's breadth to a minute it distresses and upsets us if it is not so for instance to take a very trifling matter a thrush has built its nest year after year in the catkin tree on the lawn this year for no obvious reason it is building in the ivy on the garden wall we have said very little about it but i think we both feel that the change is unnecessary and just a little irritating perhaps said the friend it is a different thrush we have suspected that said j p huddle and i think it gives us even more cause for annoyance we don't feel that we want a change of thrush at our time of life and yet as i have said we have scarcely reached an age when these things should make themselves seriously felt what you want said the friend is an unrest cure an unrest cure i've never heard of such a thing you've heard of rest cures for people who've broken down under stress of too much worry and strenuous living well you're suffering from overmuch repose and placidity, and you need the opposite kind of treatment. But where would one go for such a thing? Well, you might stand as an orange candidate for Kilkenny, or do a course of district visiting in one of the Apache quarters of Paris, or give lectures in Berlin to prove that most of Wagner's music was written by Gambetta, and there's always the interior of Morocco to travel in but to be really effective the unrest cure ought to be tried in the home how you would do it i haven't the faintest idea it was at this point in the conversation that clovis became galvanized into alert attention after all his two days visit to an elderly relative at slowborough did not promise much excitement before the train had stopped he had decorated his sinister shirt cuff with the inscription j p huddle the warren tilfield near slowborough two mornings later mr huddle broke in on his sister's privacy as she sat reading country life in the morning room it was her day and hour and place for reading country life and the intrusion was absolutely irregular but he bore in his hand a telegram and in that household telegrams were recognized as happening by the hand of god this particular telegram partook of the nature of a thunderbolt bishop examining confirmation class in neighborhood unable stay rectory on account measles invokes your hospitality sending secretary arrange i scarcely know the bishop i've only spoken to him once exclaimed j p huddle with the exculpating air of one who realizes too late the indiscretion of speaking to strange bishops Miss Huddle was the first to rally. She disliked thunderbolts as fervently as her husband did, but the womanly instinct in her told her that thunderbolts must be fed. "'We can curry the cold duck,' she said. It was not the appointed day for curry, but the little orange envelope involved a certain departure from rule and custom. Her brother said nothing, but his eyes thanked her for being brave. "'A young gentleman to see you.' announced the parlor-maid the secretary murmured the huddles in unison they instantly stiffened into a demeanor which proclaimed that though they held all strangers to be guilty they were willing to hear anything they might have to say in their defense the young gentleman who came into the room with a certain elegant haughtiness was not at all huddle's idea of a bishop's secretary he had not supposed that the episcopal establishment could have afforded such an expensively upholstered article when there were so many other claims on its resources the face was fleetingly familiar if he had bestowed more attention on the fellow traveller sitting opposite him in the railway carriage two days before he might have recognized clovis in his present visitor you are the bishop's secretary asked huddle becoming consciously differential his confidential secretary answered clovis you may call me stanislaus my other name doesn't matter the bishop and colonel alberti may be here to lunch i shall be here in any case it sounded rather like the program of a royal visit the bishop is examining a confirmation class in the neighborhood isn't he 
asked Miss Huddle. Ostensibly, was the dark reply, followed by a request for a large-scale map of the locality. Clovis was still immersed in a seemingly profound study of the map when another telegram arrived. It was addressed to Prince Stanislaus, care of Huddle, the Warren, etc. Clovis glanced at the contents and announced, The bishop and Alberti won't be here till late in the afternoon. Then he returned to his scrutiny of the map. The luncheon was not a very festive function. The princely secretary ate and drank with fair appetite, but severely discouraged conversation. At the finish of the meal, he broke suddenly into a radiant smile, thanked his hostess for a charming repast, and kissed her hand with deferential rapture. Miss Huddle was unable to decide in her mind whether the action savored of Louis Quatorcian courtliness or the reprehensible Roman attitude towards the Sabine women. It was not her day for having a headache, but she felt that the circumstances excused her and retired to her room to have as much headache as possible before the bishop's arrival. Clovis, having asked the way to the nearest telegraph office, disappeared presently down the carriage drive. Mr. Huddle met him in the hall some two hours later and asked when the bishop would arrive. "'He is in the library with Alberti,' was the reply. "'But why wasn't I told? I never knew he had come!' exclaimed Huddle. "'No one knows he is here,' said Clovis. "'The quieter we can keep these matters, the better. "'And on no account disturb him in the library. Those are his orders.' "'But what is all this mystery about? Who is Alberti? And isn't the bishop going to have tea?' the bishop is out for blood not tea blood gasped huddle who did not find that the thunderbolt improved on acquaintance to-night is going to be a great night in the history of christendom said clovis we are going to massacre every jew in the neighborhood to massacre the jews said huddle indignantly do you mean to tell me there's a general rising against them no it's the bishop's own idea he's in there arranging all the details now but the bishop is a tolerant humane man that is precisely what will heighten the effect of his action the sensation will be enormous that at least huddle could believe he will be hanged he exclaimed with conviction a motor is waiting to carry him to the coast where a steam yacht is in readiness but there aren't thirty jews in the whole neighborhood protested Huddle, whose brain under the repeated shocks of the day was operating with the uncertainty of a telegraph wire during earthquake disturbances. "'We have twenty-six on our list,' said Clovis, referring to a bundle of notes. "'We shall be able to deal with them all the more thoroughly.' "'Do you mean to tell me that you are meditating violence against a man like Sir Leon Burberry?' stammered Huddle. "'He's one of the most respected men in the country. He's down on our list.' said Clovis carelessly. After all, we've got men we can trust to do our job, so we shan't have to rely on local assistance. And we've got some Boy Scouts helping us as auxiliaries. Boy Scouts? Yes, when they understood there was real killing to be done, they were even keener than the men. This thing will be a blot on the twentieth century. And your house will be the blotting pad. Have you realized that half the papers of Europe and the United States will publish pictures of it? By the way, I've sent some photographs of you and your sister that I found in the library to the Matin and Di Volca. I hope you don't mind. Also, a sketch of the staircase. Most of the killing will probably be done on the staircase. The emotions that were surging in J.P. Huddle's brain were almost too intense to be disclosed in speech, but he managed to gasp out, there aren't any jews in this house not at present said clovis i shall go to the police shouted huddle with sudden energy in the shrubbery said clovis are posted ten men who have orders to fire on anyone who leaves the house without my signal permission another armed picket is in ambush near the front gate the boy scouts watch the back premises at this moment the cheerful hoot of a motor horn was heard from the drive huddle rushed to the hall door with the feeling of a man half awakened from a nightmare and beheld sir leon burberry who had driven himself over in his car i got your telegram he said what's up telegram it seemed to be a day of telegrams come here at once urgent james huddle was the purport of the message displayed before huddle's bewildered eyes i see it all 
he exclaimed suddenly in a voice shaken with agitation and with a look of agony in the direction of the shrubbery he hauled the astonished burberry into the house tea had just been laid in the hall but the now thoroughly panic-stricken huddle dragged his protesting guest upstairs and in a few minutes time the entire household had been summoned to that region of momentary safety clovis alone graced the tea-table with his presence the fanatics in the library were evidently too immersed in their monstrous machinations to dally with the solace of teacup and hot toast once the youth rose in answer to the summons of the front door-bell and admitted mr paul isaacs shoemaker and parish councillor who had also received a pressing invitation to the warren with an atrocious assumption of courtesy which a borgia could hardly have outdone the secretary escorted this new captive of his net to the head of the stairway where his involuntary host awaited him and then ensued a long ghastly vigil of watching and waiting once or twice clovis left the house to stroll across to the shrubbery returning always to the library for the purpose evidently of making a brief report once he took in the letters from the evening postman and brought them to the top of the stairs with punctilious politeness after his next absence he came halfway up the stairs to make an announcement the boy scouts mistook my signal and have killed the postman i've had very little practice in this sort of thing you see another time i shall do better the housemaid who was engaged to be married to the evening postman gave way to clamorous grief remember that your mistress has a headache said j p huddle miss huddle's headache was worse clovis hastened downstairs and after a short visit to the library returned with another message the bishop is sorry to hear that miss huddle has a headache he is issuing orders that as far as possible no firearms shall be used near the house any killing that is necessary on the premises will be done with cold steel the bishop does not see why a man should not be a gentleman as well as a christian that was the last they saw of clovis it was nearly seven o'clock and his elderly relative liked him to dress for dinner but though he had left them for ever the lurking suggestion of his presence haunted the lower regions of the house during the long hours of the wakeful night and every creak of the stairway every rustle of the wind through the shrubbery was fraught with horrible meaning at about seven next morning the gardener's boy and the early postman finally convinced the watchers that the twentieth century was still unblotted i don't suppose mused clovis as an early train bore him townwards that they will be in the least grateful for the unrest cure End of chapter 8chapter nine of the chronicles of clovis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john burlinson the chronicles of clovis by hector monroe chapter nine the jesting of arlington stringham arlington stringham made a joke in the house of commons it was a thin house and a very thin joke something about the anglo-saxon race having a great many angles it is possible that it was unintentional but a fellow-member who did not wish it to be supposed that he was asleep because his eyes were shut laughed one or two of the papers noted a laugh in brackets and another which was notorious for the carelessness of its political news mentioned laughter things often begin in that way arlington made a joke in the house last night said eleanor stringham to her mother in all the years we've been married neither of us has made jokes and i don't like it now i'm afraid it's the beginning of the rift in the lute what lute said her mother it's a quotation said eleanor to say that anything was a quotation 
was an excellent method in Eleanor's eyes for withdrawing it from discussion, just as you could always defend indifferent lamb late in the season by saying, It's mutton. And, of course, Arlington Stringham continued to tread the thorny path of conscious humour into which fate had beckoned him. The country's looking very green, but, after all, that's what it's there for, he remarked to his wife two days later. That's very modern, and I dare say very clever, but I'm afraid it's wasted on me, she observed coldly. If she had known how much effort it had cost him to make the remark, she might have greeted it in a kinder spirit. It is the tragedy of human endeavour that it works so often unseen and unguessed. Arlington said nothing, not from injured pride, but because he was thinking hard for something to say. Eleanor mistook his silence for an assumption of tolerant superiority, and her anger prompted her to a further jibe. "'You had better tell it to Lady Isabel. I've no doubt she would appreciate it.' Lady Isabel was seen everywhere with a fawn-coloured collie at a time when everyone else kept nothing but Pekingese and she had once eaten four green apples at an afternoon tea in the botanical gardens, so she was widely credited with a rather unpleasant wit. The censorious said she slept in a hammock, and understood Yeats's poems, but her family denied both stories. "'The rift is widening to an abyss,' said Eleanor to her mother that afternoon. "'I should not tell that to anyone,' remarked her mother, after long reflection. "'Naturally I should not talk about it very much,' said Eleanor. "'But why shouldn't I mention it to anyone?' "'Because you can't have an abyss in a lute. There isn't room.' Eleanor's outlook on life did not improve as the afternoon wore on. The page-boy had brought from the library by mere and wold, instead of by mere chance, the book which everyone denied having read. The unwelcome substitute appeared to be a collection of nature notes contributed by the author to the pages of some northern weekly and when one had been prepared to plunge with disapproving mind into a regrettable chronicle of ill-spent lives, it was intensely irritating to read, The dainty yellow hammers are now with us, and flaunt their jaundiced livery from every bush and hillock. Besides, the thing was so obviously untrue, Either there must be hardly any bushes or hillocks in those parts, or the country must be fearfully overstocked with yellow hammers. The thing scarcely seemed worth telling such a lie about, and the page-boy stood there with his sleekly brushed and parted hair, and his air of chaste and callous indifference to the desires and passions of the world. Eleanor hated boys, and she would have liked to have whipped this one long and often. It was perhaps the yearning of a woman who had no children of her own. She turned at random to another paragraph. Lie quietly concealed in the fern and bramble, in the gap by the old rowan tree, and you may see almost every evening during early summer, a pair of lesser white throats creeping up and down the nettles and hedge growth that mask their nesting place. The insufferable monotony of the proposed recreation! 
eleanor would not have watched the most brilliant performance at his majesty's theatre for a single evening under such uncomfortable circumstances and to be asked to watch lesser white throats creeping up and down a nettle almost every evening during the height of the season struck her as an imputation on her intelligence that was positively offensive impatiently she transferred her attention to the dinner menu which the boy had thoughtfully brought in as an alternative to the more solid literary fare rabbit curry met her eye and the lines of disapproval deepened on her already puckered brow the cook was a great believer in the influence of environment and nourished an obstinate conviction that if you brought rabbit and curry powder together in one dish a rabbit curry would be the result and clovis and the odious bertie van tan were coming to dinner surely thought eleanor if arlington knew how much she had had that day to try her he would refrain from joke-making at dinner that night it was eleanor herself who mentioned the name of a certain statesman who may be decently covered under the disguise of x x said arlington stringham has the soul of a meringue it was a useful remark to have on hand because it applied equally well to four prominent statesmen of the day which quadrupled the opportunities for using it meringues haven't got souls said eleanor's mother it's a mercy that they haven't said clovis they would always be losing them and people like my aunt would get up missions to meringues and say it was wonderful how much one could teach them and how much more one could learn from them what could you learn from a meringue asked eleanor's mother my aunt has been known to learn humility from an ex-viceroy said clovis i wish cook would learn to make curry or have the sense to leave it alone said arlington suddenly and savagely eleanor's face softened it was like one of his old remarks in the days when there was no abyss between them it was during the debate on the foreign office vote that stringham made his great remark that the people of crete unfortunately make more history than they can consume locally it was not brilliant but it came in the middle of a dull speech and the house was quite pleased with it old gentlemen with bad memories said it reminded them of disraeli it was eleanor's friend gertrude ilpton who drew her attention to arlington's newest outbreak eleanor in these days avoided the morning papers it's very modern and i suppose very clever she observed of course it's clever said gertrude all lady isabel's sayings are clever and luckily they bear repeating are you sure it's one of her sayings asked eleanor my dear i've heard her say it dozens of times so that is where he gets his humour said eleanor slowly and the hard lines deepened round her mouth the death of eleanor stringham from an overdose of chloral occurring at the end of a rather uneventful season excited a certain amount of unobtrusive speculation clovis who perhaps exaggerated the importance of curry in the home hinted at domestic sorrow and of course arlington never knew it was the tragedy of his life that he should miss the fullest effect 
of his jesting. End of chapter 9《Mrs. Dirop was Condorin's cousin and guardian, and in his eyes she represented those three-fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. The other two-fifths, in perpetual antagonism to the foregoing, were summed up in himself and his imagination. One of these days, Condorin supposed he would succumb to the mastering pressure of wearisome necessary things such as illnesses and coddling restrictions and drawn-out dullness. Without his imagination, which was rampant under the spur of loneliness, he would have succumbed long ago. Mrs. Durop would never, in her honestest moments, have confessed to herself that she disliked Condren, though she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his good was a duty which she did not find particularly irksome. Condren hated her with a desperate sincerity which he was perfectly able to mask. Such few pleasures as he could contrive for himself gained an added relish from the likelihood that they would be displeasing to his guardian, and from the realm of his imagination she was locked out, an unclean thing which should find no entrance. In the dull, cheerless garden, overlooked by so many windows that were ready to open with a message not to do this or that, or a reminder that medicines were due, he found little attraction. The few fruit trees that it contained were set jealously apart from his plucking, as though they were rare specimens of their kind blooming in an arid waste. It would probably have been difficult to find a market gardener who would have offered ten shillings for their entire yearly produce. In a forgotten corner, however, almost hidden behind a dismal shrubbery, was a disused tool shed of respectable proportions, and within its walls Condren found a haven, something that took on the varying aspects of a playroom and a cathedral. He had peopled it with a legion of familiar phantoms, evoked partly from fragments of history and partly from his own brain, but it also boasted two inmates of flesh and blood. In one corner lived a ragged plumaged Houdan hen, on which the boy lavished an affection that had scarcely another outlet. Further back in the gloom stood a large hutch, divided into two compartments one of which was fronted with close iron bars. This was the abode of a large polecat ferret, which a friendly butcher boy had once smuggled, cage and all, into its present quarters, in exchange for a long-secreted hoard of small silver. Condorin was dreadfully afraid of the light, sharp-fanged beast, but it was his most treasured possession. Its very presence in the tool shed was a secret and fearful joy, to be kept scrupulously from the knowledge of the woman, as he privately dubbed his cousin. And one day, out of heaven knows what material, he spun the beast a wonderful name, and from that moment it grew into a god and a religion. The woman indulged in religion once a week at a church nearby, and took Condorin with her, but to him the church service was an alien rite in the house of Rimon. Every Thursday, in the dim and musty silence of the tool shed, he worshipped with mystic and elaborate ceremonial before the wooden hutch, where dwelt Shredni Vashtar, the great ferret. Red flowers in their season and scarlet berries in the winter time were offered at his shrine, for he was a god who laid some special stress on the fierce, impatient side of things, as opposed to the woman's religion, which, as far as Condorin could observe, went to great lengths in the contrary direction. And on great festivals, powdered nutmeg was strewn in front of his hutch, an important feature of the offering being that the nutmeg had to be stolen. These festivals were of irregular occurrence and were chiefly appointed to celebrate some passing event. On one occasion, when Mrs. de Rupp suffered from an acute toothache for three days, Conrin kept up the festival during the entire three days, 
and almost succeeded in persuading himself that Shredni Vashtar was personally responsible for the toothache. If the malady had lasted for another day, the supply of nutmeg would have given out. The Hudan hen was never drawn into the cult of Shredni Vashtar. Condren had long ago settled that she was an Anabaptist. He did not pretend to have the remotest knowledge as to what an Anabaptist was, but he privately hoped that it was dashing and not very respectable. Mrs. de Rupp was the ground plan on which he based and detested all respectability. After a while, Conran's absorption in the tool shed began to attract the notice of his guardian. It is not good for him to be pottering down there in all weathers, she promptly decided, and at breakfast one morning she announced that the Hodan hen had been sold and taken away overnight. With her short-sighted eyes, she peered at Condorin, waiting for an outbreak of rage and sorrow, which she was ready to rebuke with a flow of excellent precepts and reasoning. But Condorin said nothing. There was nothing to be said. Something, perhaps in his white-set face, gave her a momentary qualm. For at tea that afternoon, there was toast on the table, a delicacy which she usually banned on the ground that it was bad for him. Also, because the making of it gave trouble, a deadly offence in the middle-class feminine eye. I thought you liked toast, she exclaimed with an injured air, observing that he did not touch it. Sometimes, said Conorin. In the shed that evening, there was an innovation in the worship of the hutch god. Conorin had been wont to chant his praises. Tonight, he asked a boon. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashtar. The thing was not specified. As Shredni Vashtar was a god, he must be supposed to know. And choking back a sob as he looked at that other empty corner, Conrin went back to the world he so hated. And every night, in the welcome darkness of his bedroom, and every evening in the dusk of the tool shed, Conrin's bitter litany went up. Do one thing for me, Shredni Vashtar. Mrs. Dirop noticed that the visits to the shed did not cease, and one day she made a further journey of inspection. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? she asked. I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them all cleared away. Condorin shut his lips tight, but the woman ransacked his room till she found the carefully hidden key, and forthwith marched down to the shed to complete her discovery. It was a cold afternoon and Condren had been bidden to keep to the house. From the furthest window of the dining room, the door of the shed could just be seen beyond the corner of the shrubbery, and there Condren stationed himself. He saw the woman enter, and then he imagined her opening the door of the sacred hutch and peering down with her short-sighted eyes into the thick straw bed where his god lay hidden. Perhaps she would prod at the straw in her clumsy impatience and Condorin fervently breathed his prayer for the last time. But he knew as he prayed that he did not believe. He knew that the woman would come out presently with that pursed smile he loathed so well on her face, and that, in an hour or so, the gardener would carry away his wonderful god, a god no longer, but a simple brown ferret in a hutch. And he knew that the woman would triumph always, as she triumphed now, and that, he would grow ever more sickly under her pestering and domineering and superior wisdom, till one day nothing would matter much more with him, and the doctor would be proved right. And in the sting and misery of his defeat, he began to chant loudly and defiantly the hymn of his threatened idol. Shredni Vashtar went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts, and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Shredni Vashtar, the beautiful. And then, of a sudden, he stopped his chanting and drew closer to the window pane. The door of the shed still stood ajar as it had been left, and the minutes were slipping by. They were long minutes, but they slipped by nevertheless. He watched the starlings running and flying in little parties across the lawn. He counted them over and over again with one eye always on that swinging door. A sour-faced maid came in to lay the table for tea, and still Condren stood and waited and watched. Hope had crept by inches into his heart, 
And now a look of triumph began to blaze in his eyes that had only known the wistful patience of defeat. Under his breath, with a furtive exultation, he began once more the pain of victory and devastation. And presently his eyes were rewarded. Out through the doorway came a long, low, yellow and brown beast, with eyes a blink and the waning daylight, and dark wet stains around the fur of jaws and throat. Condren dropped on his knees. The great polecat ferret made its way down to a small brook at the foot of the garden, drank for a moment, then crossed a little plank bridge and was lost to sight in the bushes. Such was the passing of Shred Niwashtar. Tea is ready, said the sour-faced maid. Where is the mistress? She went down to the shed some time ago, said Condorin. And while the maid went to summon her mistress for tea, Condorin fished a toasting fork out of the sideboard drawer and proceeded to toast himself a piece of bread. And during the toasting of it, and the buttering of it with much butter, and the slow enjoyment of eating it, Condorin listened to the noises and silences which fell in quick spasms beyond the dining room door. The loud, foolish screaming of the maid, the answering chorus of wandering ejaculations from the kitchen region, the scuttering footsteps and hurried embassies for outside help, and then, after a lull, the scared sobbings and the shuffling tread of those who bore a heavy burden into the house. Whoever will break it to the poor child? I couldn't for the life of me, exclaimed a shrill voice. And while they debated the matter amongst themselves, Condren made himself another piece of toast. End of chapter 10 Recording by Rohit Tajit Kumar Chapter 11 of the Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. Chapter 11. Adrian. A Chapter in Acclimatization. His baptismal register spoke of him pessimistically as John Henry, but he had left that behind with the other maladies of infancy, and his friends knew him under the front name of Adrian. His mother lived in Bethnal Green, which was not altogether his fault. One can discourage too much history in one's family, but one cannot always prevent geography. And after all, the Bethnal Green habit has this virtue, that it is seldom transmitted to the next generation— Adrian lived in a roomlet, which came under the auspicious constellation of W. How he lived was to a great extent a mystery even to himself. His struggle for existence probably coincided in many material details with the rather dramatic accounts he gave of it to sympathetic acquaintances. All that is definitely known is that he now and then emerged from the struggle to dine at the Ritz or Carlton, correctly garbed and with a correctly critical appetite. On these occasions, he was usually the guest of Lucas Croydon, an amiable worldling who had 3,000 a year and a taste for introducing impossible people to irreproachable cookery. Like most men who combine 3,000 a year with an uncertain digestion, Lucas was a socialist, and he argued that you cannot hope to elevate the masses until you have brought plover's eggs into their lives and taught them to appreciate the difference between Coupe Jacques and Massé Douane de Fouy. His friends pointed out that it was a doubtful kindness to initiate a boy from behind a drapery counter into the blessedness of the higher catering, to which Lucas invariably replied that all kindnesses were doubtful, which was perhaps true. It was after one of his Adrian evenings that Lucas met his aunt, Mrs. Meberly, at a fashionable tea shop, where the lamp of family life is still kept burning, and you meet relatives who might otherwise have slipped your memory. "'Who was that good-looking boy who was dining with you last night?' she asked. "'He looked much too nice to be thrown away upon you.' Susan Meberly was a charming woman, but she was also an aunt." Who are his people, she continued, when the protégé's name, revised version, had been given her. His mother lives at Beth, 
Lucas checked himself on the threshold of what was perhaps a social indiscretion. Beth, where is it? It sounds like Asia Minor. Is she mixed up with counselor people? Oh, no, her work lies among the poor. This was a side-slip into truth. The mother of Adrian was employed in a laundry. I see, said Mrs. Meberly, mission work of some sort, and meanwhile the boy has no one to look after him. It's obviously my duty to see that he doesn't come to harm. Bring him to call on me. My dear Aunt Susan, expostulated Lucas, I really know very little about him. He may not be at all nice, you know, on further acquaintance. He has delightful hair and a weak mouth. I shall take him with me to Hamburg or Cairo. It's the maddest thing I ever heard of, said Lucas angrily. Well, there is a strong strain of madness in our family. If you haven't noticed it yourself, all your friends must have. One is so dreadfully under everybody's eyes at Hamburg. At least you might give him a preliminary trial at Etretat. And be surrounded by Americans trying to talk French? No, thank you. I love Americans. But not when they try to talk French. What a blessing it is that they never try to talk English. Tomorrow at five you can bring your young friend to call on me and Lucas, realizing that Susan Meberly was a woman as well as an aunt, saw that she would have to be allowed to have her own way. Adrian was duly carried abroad under the Meberly wing, but as a reluctant concession to sanity, Hamburg and other inconveniently fashionable resorts were given a wide berth, and the Meberly establishment planted itself down in the best hotel at Dolledorf, an alpine townlet somewhere at the back of the Engadine. It was the usual kind of resort, with the usual type of visitors that one finds over the greater part of Switzerland during the summer season, but to Adrian it was all unusual. The mountain air, the certainty of regular and abundant meals, and in particular the social atmosphere, affected him much as the indiscriminating fervor of a forcing house might affect a weed that had strayed within its limits. He had been brought up in a world where breakages were regarded as crimes and expiated as such. It was something new and altogether exhilarating to find that you were considered rather amusing if you smashed things in the right manner and at the recognized hours. Susan Meberly had expressed the intention of showing Adrian a bit of the world. The particular bit of the world, represented by Dolledorf, began to be shown a good deal of Adrian. Lucas got occasional glimpses of the Alpine sojourn, not from his aunt or Adrian, but from the industrious pen of Clovis, who was also moving as a satellite in the Meberly constellation. The entertainment which Susan got up last night ended in disaster. I thought it would. The Grubmeyer child, a particularly loathsome five-year-old, had appeared as bubbles during the early part of the evening and been put to bed during the interval— Adrian watched his opportunity and kidnapped it when the nurse was downstairs and introduced it during the second half of the entertainment, thinly disguised as a performing pig. It certainly looked very like a pig and grunted and slobbered just like the real article. No one knew exactly what it was, but everyone said it was awfully clever, especially the Grubmeyers. At the third curtain, Adrian pinched it too hard and it yelled, Mamar. I am supposed to be good at descriptions, but don't ask me to describe the sayings and doings of the Grubmeyers at that moment. It was like one of the angrier psalms set to Strauss's music. We have moved to an hotel higher up the valley. Clovis's next letter arrived five days later and was written from the Hotel Steinbach. We left the Hotel Victoria this morning. It was fairly comfortable and quiet. At least there was an air of repose about it when we arrived. Before we had been in residence 24 hours, most of the repose had vanished like a dutiful dream, as Adrian expressed it. However, nothing duly outrageous happened till last night, when Adrian had a fit of insomnia and amused himself by unscrewing and transposing all the bedroom numbers on his floor. He transferred the bathroom label to the adjoining bedroom door, which happened to be that of Frau Hoftat Schilling, and this morning, from seven o'clock onwards, the old lady had a stream of involuntary visitors. She was too horrified and scandalized, it seems, to get up and lock her door. 
the would-be bathers flew back in confusion to their rooms and of course the change of numbers led them astray again in the corridor gradually filled with panic-stricken scantily robed humans dashing wildly about like rabbits in a ferret-infested warren it took nearly an hour before the guests were all sorted into their respective rooms and the frau hofrat's condition was still causing some anxiety when we left susan is beginning to look a little worried she can't very well turn the boy adrift as he hasn't got any money and she can't send him to his people as he doesn't know where they are adrian says his mother moves about a good deal and he's lost her address probably if the truth were known he's had a row at home so many boys nowadays seem to think that quarrelling with one's family is a recognized occupation lucas's next communication from the travellers took the form of a telegram from mrs meberly herself it was sent reply prepaid and consisted of a single sentence in heaven's name where is beth end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the chronicles of clovis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by pamela nagami chapter twelve the chaplet a strange stillness hung over the restaurant it was one of those rare moments when the orchestra was not discoursing the strains of the ice cream sailor waltz did i ever tell you asked clovis of his friend the tragedy of music at meal times it was a gala evening at the grand sybaris hotel and a special dinner was being served in the amethyst dining hall the amethyst dining hall had almost a european reputation especially with that section of europe which is historically identified with the jordan valley its cooking was beyond reproach and its orchestra was sufficiently highly salaried to be above criticism Thither came in shoals the intensely musical and the almost intensely musical, who are very many, and in still greater numbers the merely musical, who know how Tchaikovsky's name is pronounced, and can recognize several of Chopin's nocturnes if you give them due warning. These eat in the nervous, detached manner of roebuck, feeding in the open, and keep anxious ears cocked toward the orchestra for the first hint of a recognizable melody." ah yes pagliacci they murmur as the opening strains follow hot upon the soup and if no contradiction is forthcoming from any better informed quarter they break forth into subdued humming by way of supplementing the efforts of the musicians sometimes the melody starts on level terms with the soup in which case the banqueters contrive somehow to hum between the spoonfuls the facial expression of enthusiasts who are punctuating potage saint germain with pagliacci is not beautiful but it should be seen by those who are bent on observing all sides of life one cannot discount the unpleasant things of this world merely by looking the other way in addition to the aforementioned types the restaurant was patronized by fair sprinkling of the absolutely non-musical their presence in the dining hall could only be explained on the supposition that they had come there to dine the earlier stages of the dinner had worn off the wine lists had been consulted by some with the blank embarrassment of a schoolboy suddenly called on to locate a minor prophet in the tangled hinterland of the old testament by others with the severe scrutiny which suggests that they have visited most of the higher priced wines in their own homes and probed their family weaknesses the diners who choose their wine in the latter fashion always give their orders in a penetrating voice with a plentiful garnishing of stage directions by insisting on having your bottle pointing to the north when the cork is being drawn and calling the waiter max you may induce an impression on your guests which hours of laboured boasting might be powerless to achieve for this purpose however the guests must be chosen as carefully as the wine standing aside from the revellers in the shadow of a massive pillar was an interested spectator who was assuredly of the feast and yet not in it Monsieur Aristide Saucourt was the chef of the Grand Sybaris Hotel, and if he had an equal in his profession, he had never acknowledged the fact. In his own domain, he was a potentate, hedged around with the cold brutality that genius expects rather than excuses in her children. 
he never forgave, and those who served him were careful that there should be little to forgive. In the outer world, the world which devoured his creations, he was an influence, how profound or how shallow an influence he never attempted to guess. It is the penalty and the safeguard of genius that it computes itself by troy weight in a world that measures by vulgar hundredweights. Once in a way, the great man would be seized with a desire to watch the effects of his master efforts, just as the guiding brain of Krupp's might wish at a supreme moment to intrude into the firing line of an artillery duel. And such an occasion was the present. For the first time in the history of the Grand Siberos Hotel, he was presenting to its guests the dish which he had brought to that pitch of perfection which almost amounts to scandal. Caneton à la mode d'Ambleve. In thin gilt lettering on the creamy white of the menu, how little those words conveyed to the bulk of the imperfectly educated diners. And yet, how much specialized effort had been lavished, how much carefully treasured lore had been ungarnered before those six words could be written. In the department of De Sèvres, ducklings had lived peculiar and beautiful lives and died in the odor of satiety to furnish the main theme of the dish. Champignon, which even a purist for Saxon English would have hesitated to address as mushrooms, had contributed their languorous atrophied bodies to the garnishing, and a sauce devised in the twilight reign of the fifteenth Louis had been summoned back from the imperishable past to take its part in the wonderful confection. Thus far had human effort labored to achieve the desired result. The rest had been left to human genius, the genius of Aristide Saucourt. And now the moment had arrived for the serving of the great dish, the dish which world-weary Grand Dukes and market-obsessed money magnates counted among their happiest memories. And at the same moment something else happened. The leader of the highly salaried orchestra placed his violin caressingly against his chin, lowered his eyelids, and floated into a sea of melody. Hark, said most of the diners, he is playing the chaplet. They knew it was the chaplet because they had heard it played at luncheon and afternoon tea and at supper the night before and had not had time to forget. Yes, he is playing the chaplet, they reassured one another. The general voice was unanimous on the subject. The orchestra had already played it eleven times that day, four times by desire, and seven times from force of habit, but the familiar strains were greeted with the rapture due to a revelation. A murmur of much humming rose from round the tables in the room, and some of the more overwrought listeners laid down knife and fork in order to be able to burst in with loud clappings at the earliest permissible moment. And the caneton à la mode d'Ambleve? In stupefied, sickened wonder, Aristide watched them grow cold in total neglect or suffer the almost worst indignity of perfunctory pecking and listless munching while the banqueters lavished their approval and applause on the music-makers. Calves liver and bacon with parsley sauce could hardly have figured more ignominiously in the evening's entertainment, and while the master of culinary art leaned back against the sheltering pillar, choking with a horrible brain-searing rage that could find no outlet for its agony, the orchestra leader was bowing his acknowledgments of the hand-clappings that rose in a storm around him, Turning to his colleagues, he nodded the signal for an encore, but before the violin had been lifted anew into position, there came from the shadow of the pillar an explosive negative. No, no, you do not play that again. The musician turned in furious astonishment. Had he taken warning from the look of the other man's eyes, he might have acted differently, but the admiring plaudits were ringing in his ears, and he snarled out sharply, That is for me to decide. No. You play that never again, shouted the chef, and the next moment he had flung himself violently upon the loathed being who had supplanted him in the world's esteem. A large metal tureen, filled to the brim with steaming soup, had just been placed on a side table in readiness for a late party of diners. Before the waiting staff or the guests had time to realize what was happening, Aristide had dragged his struggling victim up to the table and plunged his head deep down into the almost boiling contents of the tureen. 
At the further end of the room the diners were still spasmodically applauding in view of an encore. Whether the leader of the orchestra died from drowning by soup or from the shock to his professional vanity or was scalded to death, the doctors were never wholly able to agree. Monsieur Aristide Saucourt, who now lives in complete retirement, always inclined to the drowning theory. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Chronicles of Claus》by Hector Munro. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Quest. An unwanted peace hung over the Villa Elsinore, broken, however, at frequent intervals by clamorous lamentations suggestive of bewildered bereavement. The Mombes had lost their infant child hence the peace which its absence entailed. They were looking for it in wild, undisciplined fashion, giving tongue the whole time, which accounted for the outcry which swept through house and garden whenever they returned to try the home converts anew. Clovis, who was temporarily and unwillingly paying guest at the villa, had been dozing in a hammock, at the far end of the garden, when Mrs. Mumbai had broken the news to him. We lost Baby, she screamed. Do you mean that it's dead or stampeded or that you staked it at cards and lost it in that way? asked Clovis lazily. He was toddling about quite happily on the lawn, said Mrs. Mumbai tearfully. And Arnold just came in, and I was asking him what sort of sauce he would like with the asparagus. Oh, I hope he said Hollandaise, interrupted Clovis with a show of quickened interest, because if there is anything I hate... And all of a sudden I miss Baby, continued Mrs. Mumbai in a shriller tone. We have hunted high and low in house and garden and outside the gates, and he is nowhere to be seen. Uh, is he anywhere to be heard? asked Clovis. If not, he must be at least two miles away. But where and how? asked the distracted mother. Oh, perhaps an eagle or a wild beast has carried him off, suggested Clovis. There aren't eagles and wild beasts in Surrey, said Mrs. Mumbai, but a note of horror had crept in her voice. They escape now and then from traveling shows. Sometimes I think they uh, let them lose for the sake of the advertisement. Uh, think what a sensational headline it would make in the local papers. Infant son of prominent nonconformist devoured by spotted hyena. Uh, your husband isn't a prominent nonconformist. But his mother came of uh, Wesleyan stock, and you must allow the newspaper some latitude. But we should have found his remains, sobbed Mrs. Mumbai. If the hyena was really hungry and not merely toying with his food, there wouldn't be much in the way of remains. It would be like the small boy and apple story. Uh, there ain't going to be no core. Mrs. Mumbai turned away hastily to seek comfort and counsel in some other direction. With the selfish absorption of young motherhood, she entirely disregarded Clovis's obvious anxiety about the asparagus cells. Before she had gone a yard, however, the click of the side gate caused her to pull up sharp. Miss Gilpet, from the Villa Peterhof, had come over to hear details of the bereavement. Clovis was already rather bored with the story, but Mrs. Mumbai was equipped with that merciless faculty, which finds as much joy in the ninetieth time of telling as in the first. Arnold had just come in. He was complaining of rheumatism. There are so many things to complain of in this household that it would never have occurred to me to complain of rheumatism, murmured Clovis. He was complaining of rheumatism, continued Miss Mumbai, trying to throw a chilling inflection into a voice that was already doing a good deal of sobbing and talking at high pressure as well. She was again interrupted. There is no such thing as rheumatism, said Miss Gilpet. 
She said it with the conscious air of defiance that a waiter adopts in announcing that the cheapest priced claret in the wine list is no more. She did not proceed, however, to offer the alternative of some more expensive malady, but denied the existence of them all. Mrs. Mumbai's temper began to shine out through her grief. I suppose you'll say next that baby hasn't really disappeared? He has disappeared, conceded Miss Gilpet, but only because you haven't sufficient faith to find him. It's only lack of faith on your part that prevents him from being restored to you safe and well. But if he's been eaten in the meantime by a hyena and partly digested, said Clovis, who clung affectionately to his wild beast theory, surely some ill effects would be noticeable. Miss Gilpit was rather staggered by this complication of the question. I feel sure that the hyena has not eaten him, she said lamely. Oh, the hyena may be equally certain that it has. You see, it may have just as much faith as you have, and more special knowledge as to the present whereabouts of the baby. Mrs. Mumbai was in tears again. If you have faith, she sobbed, struck by a happy inspiration. Won't you find our little Eric for us? I'm sure you have powers that are denied to us. Rosemary Gilpit was thoroughly sincere in her adherence to Christian science principles. Whether she understood or correctly expounded them, the learned in such matters may best decide. In the present case, she was undoubtedly confronted with a great opportunity and as she started forth on her vague search, she strenuously summoned to her aid every scrap of faith that she possessed. She passed out onto the bare and open high road, followed by Mrs. Mumbai's warning. It's no use going there. We have searched there a dozen times. But Rosemary's ears were already deaf to all things save self-congratulation. For sitting in the middle of the highway, playing contentedly with the dust and some faded buttercups, was a white pinafored baby with a mop of tow-colored hair tied over one temple with a pale blue ribbon. Taking first the usual feminine precaution of looking to see that no motor car was on the distant horizon, Rosemary dashed at the child and bore it, despite its vigorous opposition, in through the portals of Elsinore. The child's furious screams had already announced the fact of its discovery, and the almost hysterical parents raced down the lawn to meet their restored offspring. The aesthetic value of the scene was marred in some degree by Rosemary's difficulty in holding the struggling infant which was born wrong end foremost towards the agitated bosom of its family. Our own little Eric, come back to us, cried the Mumbais in unison, as the child had rammed its fists tightly into the eye sockets and nothing could be seen of its face but a widely gaping mouth. The recognition was in itself almost an act of faith. Is he glad to get back to daddy and mummy again? crooned Mrs. Mumbai. The preference which the child was showing for its dust and buttercup distractions was so marked that the question struck Clovis as being unnecessarily tactless. Give him a ride on the roly-poly, suggested the father brilliantly, as the howls continued with no signs of early abatement. In a moment, the child had been placed astride the big garden roller, and a preliminary tug was given to set it in motion. From the hollow depths of the cylinder came an ear-splitting roar, drowning even the vocal efforts of the squalling baby, and immediately afterwards there crept forth a white pinafored infant with a mop of tow-colored hair tied over one temple with a pale blue ribbon. There was no mistaking either the features or the lung power of the new arrival. Our own little Eric, screamed Mrs. Mumbai, pouncing on him and nearly smothering him with kisses. 
Did he hide in the roly poly to give us all a big fright? This was the obvious explanation of the child's sudden disappearance and equally abrupt discovery. There remained, however, the problem of the interloping baby, which now sat whimpering on the lawn in a disfavor as chilling as its previous popularity had been unwelcome. The Mumbais glared at it as though it had wormed its way into their short-lived affections by heartless and unworthy pretenses. Miss Gilpet's face took on an ashen tinge as she stared helplessly at the bunched-up figure that had been such a gladsome sight to her eyes a few moments ago. When love is over, how little of love even the lover understands, quoted Clovis to himself. Rosemary was the first to break the silence. If that is Eric you have in your arms, who is that? That, I think... Is for you to explain, said Mrs. Mumbai stiffly. Obviously, said Clovis, it's a duplicate, Eric, that your powers of faith called into being. The question is, what are you going to do with him? The ashen pallor deepened in Rosemary's cheeks. Mrs. Mumbai clutched the genuine Eric close to her side, as though she feared that her uncanny neighbor might out of sheer pique turn him into a ball of goldfish. I found him sitting in the middle of the road, said Rosemary weakly. You can't take him back and leave him there, said Clovis. The highway is meant for traffic, not to be used as a lumber room for disused miracles. Rosemary wept. The proverb, weep and you weep alone, broke down as badly on application as most of its kind. Both babies were wailing lugubriously, and the parent Mumbais had scarcely recovered from their earlier lacrimose condition. Clovis alone maintained an unruffled cheerfulness. Must I keep him always? asked Rosemary dolefully. Not always, said Clovis consolingly. He can go into the Navy when he's thirteen. Rosemary wept afresh. Of course, said it Clovis, there may be no end of a bother about his birth certificate. You'll have to explain matters to the Admiralty, and they are dreadfully hidebound. It was rather a relief when a breathless nursemaid from the Villa Charlottenburg over the way came running across the lawn to claim little Percy who had slipped out of the front gate and disappeared like a twinkling from the high road. And even then Clovis found it necessary to go in person to the kitchen to make sure about the asparagus sauce. End of chapter 13, The Quest Chapter 14 of The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. Ratislav. The Grafins' two elder sons had made deplorable marriages. It was, observed Clovis, a family habit. The youngest boy, Ratislav, who was the black sheep of a rather grayish family, had as yet made no marriage at all. There is certainly this much to be said for viciousness, said the Grafin. It keeps boys out of mischief. Does it? asked the Baroness Sophie, not by way of questioning the statement, but with a painstaking effort to talk intelligently. It was the one matter in which she attempted to override the decrees of Providence, which had obviously never intended that she should talk otherwise than inanely. I don't know why I shouldn't talk cleverly, she would complain. My mother was considered a brilliant conversationalist. These things have a way of skipping one generation, said the Grafin. That seems so unjust, said Sophie. One doesn't object to one's mother having outshone one as a clever talker, but I must admit that I should be rather annoyed if my daughters talked brilliantly. Well, none of them do, said the Grafin consolingly. I don't know about that, said the Baroness, promptly veering round in defense of her offspring. Elsa said something quite clever on Thursday about the Triple Alliance. Something about it being like a paper umbrella. 
that was all right as long as you didn't take it out in the rain. It's not everyone who could say that. Everyone has said it, at least everyone that I know. But then I know very few people. I don't think you are particularly agreeable today. I never am. Haven't you noticed that women with a really perfect profile like mine are seldom even moderately agreeable? I don't think your profile is so perfect as all that, said the baroness. It would be surprising if it wasn't. My mother was one of the most noted classical beauties of her day. These things sometimes skip a generation, you know put in the baroness with the breathless haste of one to whom repartee comes as rarely as the finding of a gold-handed umbrella. My dear Sophie, said the Graffin sweetly, that isn't in the least bit clever, but you do try so hard that I suppose I oughtn't to discourage you. Tell me something, has it ever occurred to you that Elsa would do very well? For Ratislav. It's time he married somebody, and why not Elsa? Elsa marry that dreadful boy? grasped the Baroness. Beggars can't be choosers, observed the Graffin. Elsa isn't a beggar. Not financially, or I shouldn't have suggested the match. But she's getting on, you know, and has no pretensions to brains or looks or anything of that sort. You seem to forget that she is my daughter. That shows my generosity. But seriously, I don't see what there is against Ratislav. He has no debts, at least nothing worth speaking about. But think of his reputation. If half the things they say about him are true. Probably three quarters of them are, but what of it? You don't want an archangel for a son-in-law. I don't want Ratislav. My poor Elsa would be miserable with him. A little misery wouldn't matter very much with her. It would go so well with the way she does her hair. And if she couldn't get on with Ratislav, she could always go and do good among the poor. The Baroness picked up a framed photograph from the table. He certainly is very handsome she said doubtfully, adding even more doubtfully, I dare say dear Elsa might reform him. The Graffin had the presence of mind to laugh in the right key. Three weeks later, the Graffin bore down upon the Baroness Sophie in a foreign bookseller's shop in the Graben, where she was possibly buying books of devotion, though it was the wrong counter for them. I have just left the dear children at the rodden stalls, was the Graffin's greeting. Were they looking very happy? asked the Baroness. Ratislav was wearing some new English clothes, so of course he was quite happy. I overheard him telling Tony a rather amusing story about a nun in the mouse trap, which won't bear repetition. Elsa was telling everyone else a witticism about the Triple Alliance being like a paper umbrella, which seems to bear repetition with Christian fortitude. Did they seem much wrapped up in each other? To be candid, Elsa looked as if she were wrapped up in a horse rug, and why let her wear saffron color? I always think it goes with her complexion. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It stays with it. Ah, don't forget you're lunching with me on Thursday. The Baroness was late for her luncheon engagement the following Thursday. Imagine what happened, she screamed as she burst into the room. Something remarkable to make you late for a meal, said the Graffin. Elsa has run away with the Rodenstall chauffeur. Colossal! Such a thing as that no one in our family has ever done, gasped the Baroness. Perhaps he didn't appeal to them in the same way, suggested the Graffin judicially. The Baroness began to feel that she was not getting the astonishment and sympathy to which her catastrophe entitled her. At any rate, she snapped, 
Now she can't marry Rakislov. She couldn't in any case, said the Grafin. He left suddenly for abroad last night. For abroad? Where? Uh, for Mexico, I believe. Mexico? But what for? Why Mexico? The English have a proverb. Conscience makes cowboys of us all. I didn't know Ratislav had a conscience. My dear Sophie, he hasn't. It's other people's consciousness that send one abroad in a hurry. Let's go and eat. End of chapter 14, Ratislav. Chapter 15 of The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Easter Egg. It was distinctly hard lines for Lady Barbara, who came of good fighting stock and was one of the bravest women of her generation, that her son should be so undisguisedly a coward. Whatever good qualities Lester Slagby may have possessed, and he was in some respects charming. Courage could certainly never be imputed to him. As a child, he had suffered from childish timidity, as a boy, from unboyish funk, and as a youth, he had exchanged unreasoning fears for others which were more formidable from the fact of having a carefully thought out basis. He was frankly afraid of animals, nervous with firearms, and never crossed the channel without mentally comparing the numerical proportion of life belts to passengers. On horseback, he seemed to require as many hands as a Hindu god, at least four for clutching the reins, and two more for patting the horse soothingly on the neck. Lady Barbara no longer pretended not to see her son's prevailing weakness. With her usual courage, she faced the knowledge of it squarely, and, mother-like, loved him none the less. Continental travel, anywhere away from the great tourist tracks, was a favoured hobby with Lady Barbara, and Lester joined her as often as possible. Eastertide usually found her at Knubaltheim, an upland township in one of those small princedoms that make inconspicuous freckles on the map of Central Europe. A long-standing acquaintance with the reigning family made her a personage of due importance in the eyes of her old friend the Burgomaster, and she was anxiously consulted by that worthy on the momentous occasion when the prince made known his intentions of coming in person to open a sanatorium outside the town. All the usual items in a programme of welcome, some of them fatuous and commonplace, others quaint and charming, had been arranged for but the burgomaster hoped that the resourceful English lady might have something new and tasteful to suggest in the way of loyal greeting. The prince was known to the outside world, if at all, as an old-fashioned reactionary, combating modern progress, as it were, with a wooden sword. To his own people he was known as a kindly old gentleman with a certain endearing stateliness, which had nothing of standoffishness about it. Knobal time was anxious to do its best. Lady Barbara discussed the matter with Lester and one or two acquaintances in her little hotel, but ideas were difficult to come by. "'Might I suggest something to the Gnadigfrau?' asked a sallow, high-cheekboned lady, to whom the Englishwoman had spoken once or twice, and whom she had set down in her mind as probably a southern Slav. "'Might I suggest something for the reception fest?' she went on, with a certain shy eagerness. "'Our little child here, our baby, we will dress him in little white coat, with small wings as an Easter angel, and he will carry a large white Easter egg, and inside shall be a basket of plover eggs, of which the prince is so fond, and he shall give it to his highness as Easter offering.' It is so pretty an idea. We have seen it done once in Styria. Lady Barbara looked dubiously at the proposed Easter angel, a fair, wooden-faced child of about four years old. She had noticed it the day before in the hotel, and wondered rather how such a tow-headed child could belong to such a dark-visaged couple as the woman and her husband. 
probably she thought an adopted baby especially as the couple were not young of course gnadig of frau will escort the little child up to the prince pursued the woman but he will be quite good and do as he is told if you have some pluffer's eggs shall come fresh from vine said the husband the small child and lady barbara seemed equally unenthusiastic about the pretty idea lester was openly discouraging but when the burgomaster heard of it he was enchanted the combination of sentiment and plover's eggs appealed strongly to his teutonic mind on the eventful day the easter angel really quite prettily and quaintly dressed was a centre of kindly interest to the gala crowd marshalled to receive his highness the mother was unobtrusive and less fussy than most parents would have been under the circumstances merely stipulating that she should place the easter egg herself in the arms that had been carefully schooled how to hold the precious burden then lady barbara moved forward the child marching stolidly and with grim determination at her side it had been promised cakes and sweeties galore if it gave the egg well and truly to the kind old gentleman who was waiting to receive it lester had tried to convey to it privately that horrible smackings would attend any failure in its share of the proceedings but it is doubtful if his german caused more than an immediate distress lady barbara had thoughtfully provided herself with an emergency supply of chocolate sweetmeats children may sometimes be time servers but they do not encourage long accounts as they approached nearer to the princely dais lady barbara stood discreetly aside and the stolid-faced infant walked forward alone with staggering but steadfast gait encouraged by a murmur of elderly approval lester standing in the front row of the onlookers turned to scan the crowd for the beaming faces of the happy parents in a side road which led to the railway station he saw a cab entering the cab with every appearance of furtive haste were the dark-visaged couple who had been so plausibly eager for the pretty idea the sharpened instinct of cowardice lit up the situation to him in one swift flash the blood roared and surged to his head as though thousands of floodgates had been opened in his veins and arteries and his brain was the common sluice in which all the torrents met he saw nothing but a blur around him then the blood ebbed away in quick waves till his very heart seemed drained and empty and he stood nervelessly helplessly dumbly watching the child bearing its accursed burden with slow relentless steps nearer and nearer to the group that waited sheep-like to receive him a fascinated curiosity compelled lester to turn his head towards the fugitives the cab had started at hot pace in the direction of the station the next moment lester was running running faster than any of those present had ever seen a man run and he was not running away for that stray fraction of his life some unwonted impulse beset him some hint of the stock he came from and he ran unflinchingly towards danger he stooped and clutched at the easter egg as one tries to scoop up the ball in rugby football what he meant to do with it he had not considered the thing was to get it but the child had been promised cakes and sweetmeats if it safely gave the egg into the hands of the kindly old gentleman it uttered no scream but it held to its charge with limpid grip lester sank to his knees tugging savagely at the tightly clasped burden and angry cries rose from the scandalized onlookers a questioning threatening ring formed round him then shrank back in recoil as he shrieked out one hideous word lady barbara heard the word and saw the crowd race away like scattered sheep saw the prince forcibly hustled away by his attendants also she saw her son lying prone in an agony of overmastering terror his spasm of daring shattered by the child's unexpected resistance still clutching frantically as though for safety at that white satin jujaw unable to crawl even from its deadly neighbourhood able only to scream and scream and scream in her brain she was dimly conscious of balancing or striving to balance the abject shame which had him now in thrall against the one compelling act of courage 
which had flung him grandly and madly on to the point of danger. It was only for the fraction of a minute that she stood watching the two entangled figures, the infant with its woodenly obstinate face and body tense with dogged resistance, and the boy, limp and already nearly dead with a terror that almost stifled his screams, and over them the long gala streamers flapping gaily in the sunshine. She never forgot the scene, but then it was the last she ever saw. Lady Barbara carries her scarred face with its sightless eyes as bravely as ever in the world, but at Eastertide her friends are careful to keep from her ears any mention of the children's Easter symbol. The End of Chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of the Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Philboid Studge, the story of a mouse that helped. I want to marry your daughter, said Mark Spaley with faltering eagerness. I am only an artist with an income of two hundred a year, and she is the daughter of an enormously wealthy man so I suppose you will think my offer a piece of presumption. Duncan de Lamy, the great company inflator, showed no outward sign of displeasure. As a matter of fact, he was secretly relieved at the prospect of finding even a two hundred a year husband for his daughter, Leonore. A crisis was rapidly rushing upon him from which he knew he would emerge with neither money nor credit. All his recent ventures had fallen flat, and flattest of all had gone the wonderful new breakfast food, Pipenta, on the advertisement of which he had sunk such huge sums. It could scarcely be called a drug in the market. People bought drugs, but no one bought Pipenta. "'Would you marry Lenore if she were a poor man's daughter?' asked the man of phantom wealth. "'Yes,' said Mark, wisely avoiding the error of over-protestation and to his astonishment leonore's father not only gave his consent but suggested a fairly early date for the wedding i wish i could show my gratitude in some way said mark with genuine emotion i'm afraid it's rather like the mouse proposing to help the lion get people to buy that beastly muck said de Lamy, nodding savagely at a poster of the despised pipenta and you'll have done more than any of my agents have been able to accomplish it wants a better name said mark reflectively and something distinctive in the poster line anyway i'll have a shot at it three weeks later the world was advised of the coming of a new breakfast food heralded under the resounding name of philboid studge spaley put forth no pictures of massive babies springing up with fungus-like rapidity under its forcing influence or of representatives of the leading nations of the world scrambling with fatuous eagerness for its possession. One huge sombre poster depicted the damned in hell suffering a new torment from their inability to get at the philboid studge, which elegant young fiends held in transparent bowls just beyond their reach. The scene was rendered even more gruesome by a subtle suggestion of the features of leading men and women of the day in the portrayal of the lost souls. Prominent individuals of both political parties, society hostesses, well-known dramatic authors and novelists, and distinguished aeroplanists were dimly recognizable in that doomed throng. Noted lights of the musical comedy stage flickered wanly in the shades of the inferno, smiling still from force of habit but with the fearsome smiling rage of baffled effort. The poster bore no fulsome allusions to the merits of the new breakfast food, but a single grim statement ran in bold letters along its base, They cannot buy it now. Spaley had grasped the fact that people will do things from a sense of duty, which they would never attempt as a pleasure. 
there are thousands of respectable middle-class men who if you found them unexpectedly in a turkish bath would explain in all sincerity that a doctor had ordered them to take turkish baths if you told them in return that you went there because you liked it they would stare in pained wonder at the frivolity of your motive in the same way whenever a massacre of armenians is reported from asia minor everyone assumes that it has been carried out under orders from somewhere or another no one seems to think that there are people who might like to kill their neighbours now and then and so it was with the new breakfast food no one would have eaten philboyd studge as a pleasure but the grim austerity of its advertisement drove housewives in shoals to the grocers shops to clamour for an immediate supply in small kitchens solemn pigtailed daughters helped depressed mothers to perform the primitive ritual of its preparation on the breakfast tables of cheerless parlours it was partaken of in silence once the women-folk discovered that it was thoroughly unpalatable their zeal in forcing it on their households knew no bounds you haven't eaten your filboid studge would be screamed at the appetiteless clerk as he hurried weariedly from the breakfast table and his evening meal would be prefaced by a warmed-up mess which would be explained as your filboid studge that you didn't eat this morning those strange fanatics who ostentatiously mortify themselves inwardly and outwardly with health biscuits and health garments battened aggressively on the new food earnest spectacled young men devoured it on the steps of the national liberal club a bishop who did not believe in a future state preached against the poster and a peer's daughter died from eating too much of the compound a further advertisement was obtained when an infantry regiment mutinied and shot its officers rather than eat the nauseous mess fortunately lord birrell of blatherstone who was war minister at the moment saved the situation by his happy epigram that discipline to be effective must be optional philboyd studge had become a household word but dulamy wisely realized that it was not necessarily the last word in breakfast dietary its supremacy would be challenged as soon as some yet more unpalatable food should be put on the market there might even be a reaction in favour of something tasty and appetising and the puritan austerity of the moment might be banished from domestic cookery at an opportune moment therefore he sold out his interests in the article which had brought him in colossal wealth at a critical juncture and placed his financial reputation beyond the reach of cavil as for lenore who was now an heiress on a far greater scale than ever before he naturally found her something a vast deal higher in the husband market than a two hundred a year poster designer mark spaley the brain mouse who had helped the financial lion with such untoward effect was left to curse the day he produced the wonder-working poster after all said clovis meeting him shortly afterwards at his club you have this doubtful consolation that tis not in mortals to countermand success the end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the chronicles of clovis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley the music on the hill sylvia seltoon ate her breakfast in the morning room at yesney with a pleasant sense of ultimate victory such as a fervent ironside might have permitted himself on the morrow of worcester fight she was scarcely pugnacious by temperament but belonged to that more successful class of fighters who are pugnacious by circumstance fate had willed that her life should be occupied with a series of small struggles usually with the odds slightly against her and usually she had just managed to come through winning and now she felt that she had brought her hardest and certainly her most important struggle to a successful issue to have married mortimer seltoon 
dead Mortimer, as his more intimate enemies called him, in the teeth of the cold hostility of his family, and in spite of his unaffected indifference to women, was indeed an achievement that had needed some determination and adroitness to carry through. Yesterday she had brought her victory to its concluding stage by wrenching her husband away from town and its group of satellite watering places and settling him down in the vocabulary of her kind in this remote wood-girt manor farm which was his country house you will never get mortimer to go his mother had said carpingly but if he once goes he'll stay yes knee throws almost as much a spell over him as town does one can understand what holds him to town but yes knee and the dowager had shrugged her shoulders there was a sombre almost savage wildness about yesney that was certainly not likely to appeal to town-bred tastes and sylvia notwithstanding her name was accustomed to nothing more sylvan than leafy kensington she looked on the country as something excellent and wholesome in its way which was apt to become troublesome if you encouraged it overmuch distrust of town life had been a new thing with her born of her marriage with mortimer and she had watched with satisfaction the gradual fading of what she called the german street look in his eyes as the woods and heather of yesney had closed in on them yesternight her will-power and strategy had prevailed mortimer would stay outside the morning-room windows was a triangular slope of turf which the indulgent might call a lawn and beyond its low hedge of neglected fuchsia bushes a steeper slope of heather and bracken dropped down into cavernous combes overgrown with oak and yew in its wild open savagery there seemed a stealthy linking of the joy of life with the terror of unseen things sylvia smiled complacently as she gazed with a school of art appreciation at the landscape and then of a sudden she almost shuddered it is very wild she said to mortimer who had joined her one could almost think that in such a place the worship of pan had never quite died out the worship of pan never has died out said mortimer other newer gods have drawn aside his votaries from time to time but he is the nature god to whom all must come back at last he has been called the father of all the gods but most of his children have been still born sylvia was religious in an honest vaguely devotional kind of way and did not like to hear her beliefs spoken of as mere aftergrowths but it was at least something new and hopeful to hear dead mortimer speak with such energy and conviction on any subject you don't really believe in pan she asked incredulously i've been a fool in most things said mortimer quietly but i'm not such a fool as not to believe in pan when i'm down here and if you're wise you won't disbelieve in him too boastfully while you're in his country it was not till a week later when sylvia had exhausted the attractions of the woodland walks round yesney that she ventured on a tour of inspection of the farm buildings a farmyard suggested in her mind a scene of cheerful bustle with churns and flails and smiling dairymaids and teams of horses drinking knee-deep in duck-crowded ponds as she wandered among the gaunt grey buildings of yesney manor farm her first impression was one of crushing stillness and desolation as though she had happened on some lone deserted homestead long given over to owls and cobwebs then came a sense of furtive watchful hostility the same shadow of unseen things that seemed to lurk in the wooded combes and coppices from behind heavy doors and shuttered windows came the restless stamp of hoof or rasp of chain halter and at times a muffled bellow from some stalled beast from a distant corner a shaggy dog watched her with intent unfriendly eyes as she drew near it slipped quietly into its kennel and slipped out again as noiselessly when she had passed by a few hens questing for food under a rick 
stole away under a gate at her approach. Sylvia felt that if she had come across any human beings in this wilderness of barn and byre, they would have fled, wraith-like, from her gaze. At last, turning a corner quickly, she came upon a living thing that did not fly from her. A stretch in a pool of mud was an enormous sow, gigantic beyond the town woman's wildest computation of swine flesh and speedily alert to resent and if necessary repel the unwonted intrusion it was sylvia's turn to make an unobtrusive retreat as she threaded her way past rickyards and cowsheds and long blank walls she started suddenly at a strange sound the echo of a boy's laughter golden and equivocal jan the only boy employed on the farm, a tow-headed, wizen-faced yokel, was visibly at work on a potato clearing halfway up the nearest hillside, and Mortimer, when questioned, knew of no other probable or possible begetter of the hidden mockery that had ambushed Sylvia's retreat. The memory of that untraceable echo was added to her other impressions of a furtive, sinister something that hung around Yesney. Of Mortimer she saw very little. Farm and woods and trout streams seemed to swallow him up from dawn till dusk. Once, following the direction she had seen him take in the morning, she came to an open space in a nut copse, further shut in by huge yew trees, in the centre of which stood a stone pedestal surmounted by a small bronze figure of a youthful pan. It was a beautiful piece of workmanship, but her attention was chiefly held by the fact that a newly cut bunch of grapes had been placed as an offering at its feet. Grapes were none too plentiful at the manor house, and Sylvia snatched the bunch angrily from the pedestal. Contemptuous annoyance dominated her thoughts as she strolled slowly homeward, and then gave way to a sharp feeling of something that was very near fright. Across a thick tangle of undergrowth, a boy's face was scowling at her, brown and beautiful, with unutterably evil eyes. It was a lonely pathway. All pathways round Yesney were lonely, for the matter of that, and she sped forward without waiting to give a closer scrutiny to this sudden apparition. It was not till she had reached the house that she discovered that she had dropped the bunch of grapes in her flight. "'I saw a youth in the wood to-day she told Mortimer that evening. "'Brown-faced and rather handsome, but a scoundrel to look at. A gypsy lad, I suppose.' "'A reasonable theory,' said Mortimer. "'Only there aren't any gypsies in these parts at present.' "'Then who was he?' asked Sylvia, and, as Mortimer appeared to have no theory of his own, she passed on to recount her finding of the votive offering. "'I suppose it was your doing,' she observed. "'It's a harmless piece of lunacy, but people would think you dreadfully silly if they knew of it.' "'Did you meddle with it in any way?' asked Mortimer. "'I—I I threw the grapes away. It seemed so silly,' said Sylvia, watching Mortimer's impassive face for a sign of annoyance. "'I don't think you were wise to do that.' he said reflectively. I've heard it said that the wood gods are rather horrible to those who molest them. Horrible, perhaps, to those that believe in them, but you see I don't, retorted Sylvia. All the same, said Mortimer in his even dispassionate tone, I should avoid the woods and orchards if I were you, and give a wide berth to the horned beasts on the farm. It was all nonsense, of course. But in that lonely wood-girt spot, nonsense seemed able to rear a bastard brood of uneasiness. Mortimer, said Sylvia suddenly, I think we will go back to town some time soon. Her victory had not been so complete as she had supposed. It had carried her on to ground that she was already anxious to quit. I don't think you will ever go back to town, said Mortimer. He seemed to be paraphrasing his mother's prediction as to himself. Sylvia noted with dissatisfaction and some self-contempt that the course of her next afternoon's ramble took her instinctively clear of the network of woods. As to the horned cattle, 
Mortimer's warning was scarcely needed, for she had always regarded them as of doubtful neutrality at the best. Her imagination unsexed the most matronly dairy cows, and turned them into bulls liable to see red at any moment. The ram who fed in the narrow paddock below the orchards, she had adjudged after ample and cautious probation to be of docile temper. Today, however, she decided to leave his docility untested, for the usually tranquil beast was roaming with every sign of restlessness from corner to corner of his meadow. A low, fitful piping, as of some reedy flute, was coming from the depth of a neighbouring copse, and there seemed to be some subtle connection between the animal's restless pacing and the wild music from the wood. Sylvia turned her steps in an upward direction, and climbed the heather-clad slopes that stretched in rolling shoulders high above Yesney. She had left the piping notes behind her, but across the wooded combes at her feet the wind brought her another kind of music, the straining bay of hounds in full chase. Yesney was just on the outskirts of the Devon and Somerset country, and the hunted deer sometimes came that way. Sylvia could presently see a dark body breasting hill after hill, and sinking again and again out of sight as he crossed the combes, while behind him steadily swelled that relentless chorus, and she grew tense with the excited sympathy that one feels for any hunted thing in whose capture one is not directly interested. And at last he broke through the outermost line of oak scrub and fern, and stood panting in the open, a fat September stag, carrying a well-furnished head. His obvious course was to drop down to the brown pools of Undercombe, and thence make his way towards the red deer's favourite sanctuary, the sea. To Sylvia's surprise, however, he turned his head to the upland slope, and came lumbering resolutely onward over the heather. "'It will be dreadful,' she thought. "'The hounds will pull him down under my very eyes.' But the music of the pack seemed to have died away for a moment, and in its place she heard again that wild piping, which rose now on this side, now on that, as though urging the failing stag to a final effort. Sylvia stood well aside from his path, half hidden in a thick growth of whirtle bushes, and watched him swing stiffly upward, his flanks dark with sweat, the coarse hair on his neck showing light by contrast. The pipe music shrilled suddenly around her, seeming to come from the bushes at her very feet, and at the same moment the great beast slewed round and bore directly down upon her. In an instant her pity for the hunted animal was changed to wild terror at her own danger. The thick heather roots mocked her scrambling efforts at flight, and she looked frantically downward for a glimpse of oncoming hounds. The huge antler spikes were within a few yards of her, and in a flash of numbing fear she remembered Mortimer's warning to beware of horned beasts on the farm, and then with a quick throb of joy she saw that she was not alone. A human figure stood a few paces aside, knee-deep in the whirtle bushes. "'Drive it off!' she shrieked, but the figure made no answering movement. The antlers drove straight at her breast. The acrid smell of the hunted animal was in her nostrils, but her eyes were filled with the horror of something she saw other than her oncoming death, and in her ears rang the echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Story of St. Vespellius. Tell me a story, said the Baroness, staring out despairingly at the rain. It was that light, apologetic sort of rain that looks as if it was going to leave off every minute and goes on for the greater part of the afternoon. "'What sort of story?' asked Clovis, giving his croquet mallet a valedictory shove into retirement. "'One just true enough to be interesting, and not true enough to be tiresome,' said the Baroness. Clovis rearranged several cushions to his personal solace and satisfaction. 
he knew that the baroness liked her guests to be comfortable and he thought it right to respect her wishes in that particular have i ever told you the story of saint vespelius he asked you've told me stories about grand dukes and lion tamers and financiers widows and a postmaster in herzegovina said the baroness and about an italian jockey and an amateur governess who went to warsaw and several about your mother but certainly never anything about a saint this story happened a long while ago he said in those uncomfortable piebald times when a third of the people were pagan and a third christian and the biggest third of all just followed whichever religion the court happened to profess there was a certain king called Hrikros, who had a fearful temper and no immediate successor in his own family his married sister however had provided him with a large stock of nephews from which to select his heir and the most eligible and royally approved of all these nephews was the sixteen-year-old vespaluus he was the best-looking and the best horseman and javelin thrower and had that priceless princely gift of being able to walk past a supplicant with an air of not having seen him but would certainly have given him something if he had my mother has that gift to a certain extent she can go smilingly and financially unscathed through a charity bazaar and meet the organizers next day with the solicitous had i but known you were in need of funds air that is really rather a triumph in audacity now hikros was a pagan of the first water and kept the worship of the sacred serpents who lived in a hallowed grove on a hill near the royal palace up to a high pitch of enthusiasm the common people were allowed to please themselves within certain discreet limits in the matter of private religion but any official in the service of the court who went over to the new cult was looked down on literally as well as metaphorically the down being from the gallery that ran round the royal bear pit consequently there was considerable scandal and consternation when the youthful vespaluus appeared one day at a court function with a rosary tucked into his belt and announced in reply to angry questionings that he had decided to adopt christianity or at any rate to give it a trial if it had been any of the other nephews the king would possibly have ordered something drastic in the way of scourging and banishment but in the case of the favoured vespaluus he determined to look on the whole thing much as a modern father might regard the announced intention of his son to adopt the stage as a profession he sent accordingly for the royal librarian the royal library in those days was not a very extensive affair and the keeper of the king's books had a great deal of leisure on his hands consequently he was in frequent demand for the settlement of other people's affairs when these strayed beyond normal limits and got temporarily unmanageable you must reason with prince vespaluus said the king and impress on him the error of his ways we cannot have the heir to the throne setting such a dangerous example but where shall i find the necessary arguments asked the librarian i give you free leave to pick and choose your arguments in the royal woods and coppices said the king if you cannot get together some cutting observations and stinging retorts suitable to the occasion you are a person of a very poor resource so the librarian went into the woods and gathered a goodly selection of highly argumentative rods and switches and then proceeded to reason with vespaluus on the folly and iniquity and above all the unseemliness of his conduct his reasoning left a deep impression on the young prince an impression which lasted for many weeks during which time nothing more was heard about the unfortunate lapse into christianity then a further scandal of the same nature agitated the court at a time when he should have been engaged in audibly invoking the gracious protection and patronage of the holy serpents vespaluus was heard singing a chant in honour of saint odilo of cluny the king was furious at this new outbreak and began to take a gloomy view of the situation 
Vespaluus was evidently going to show a dangerous obstinacy in persisting in his heresy, and yet there was nothing in his appearance to justify such perverseness. He had not the pale eye of the fanatic, or the mystic look of the dreamer. On the contrary, he was quite the best-looking boy at court. He had an elegant, well-knit figure, a healthy complexion, eyes the colour of very ripe mulberries, and dark hair, smooth and very well cared for. It sounds like a description of what you imagine yourself to have been like at the age of sixteen, said the baroness. My mother has probably been showing you some of my early photographs, said Clovis. Having turned the sarcasm into a compliment, he resumed his story. The king had Vespaluus shut up in a dark tower for three days, with nothing but bread and water to live on, the squealing and fluttering of bats to listen to, and drifting clouds to watch through one little window-slit. The anti-pagan section of the community began to talk portentously of the boy martyr. The martyrdom was mitigated, as far as the food was concerned, by the carelessness of the tower warden, who once or twice left a portion of his own supper of broiled meat and fruit and wine by mistake in the prince's cell. After the punishment was over, Vespaluus was closely watched for any further symptom of religious perversity, for the king was determined to stand no more opposition on so important a matter, even from a favourite nephew. If there was any more of this nonsense, he said, the succession to the throne would have to be altered. For a time all went well. The festival of summer sports was approaching, and the young Vespaluus was too engrossed in wrestling and foot-running and javelin-throwing competitions to bother himself with the strife of conflicting religious systems. Then, however, came the great culminating feature of the summer festival, the ceremonial dance round the grove of the sacred serpents, and Vespaluus, as we should say, sat it out. The affront to the state religion was too public and ostentatious to be overlooked, even if the king had been so minded, and he was not in the least so minded. For a day and a half he sat apart and brooded, and every one thought he was debating within himself the question of the young prince's death or pardon. As a matter of fact, he was merely thinking out the manner of the boy's death. As the thing had to be done, and was bound to attract an enormous amount of public attention in any case, it was as well to make it as spectacular and impressive as possible. Apart from his unfortunate taste in religions, said the king, and his obstinacy in adhering to it, he is a sweet and pleasant youth, therefore it is meet and fitting that he should be done to death by the winged envoys of sweetness. Your majesty means, said the royal librarian, I mean, said the king, that he shall be stung to death by bees, by the royal bees, of course. A most elegant death, said the librarian. Elegant and spectacular, and decidedly painful, said the king. It fulfils all the conditions that could be wished for. The king himself thought out all the details of the execution ceremony. Vespaluus was to be stripped of his clothes, his hands were to be bound behind him, and he was then to be slung in a recumbent position immediately above three of the largest of the royal beehives, so that the least movement of his body would bring him in jarring contact with them. The rest could safely be left to the bees. The death throes, the king computed, might last anything from fifteen to forty minutes, though there was division of opinion and considerable wagering among the other nephews as to whether death might not be almost instantaneous, or, on the other hand, whether it might not be deferred for a couple of hours. Anyway, they all agreed it was vastly preferable to being thrown down into an evil-smelling bear pit, and being clawed and mauled to death by imperfectly carnivorous animals. It so happened, however, that the keeper of the royal hives had leanings towards Christianity himself, and moreover, like most of the court officials, he was very much attached to Vespaluus. On the eve of the execution, therefore, he busied himself with removing the stings from all the royal bees. It was a long and delicate operation, 
but he was an expert bee-master and by working hard nearly all night he succeeded in disarming all or almost all of the hive inmates i didn't know you could take the sting from a live bee said the baroness incredulously every profession has its secrets replied clovis if it hadn't it wouldn't be a profession well the moment for the execution arrived the king and court took their places and accommodation was found for as many of the populace as wished to witness the unusual spectacle fortunately the royal bee-yard was of considerable dimensions and was commanded moreover by the terraces that ran round the royal gardens with a little squeezing and the erection of a few platforms room was found for everybody vespaluus was carried into the open space in front of the hives blushing and slightly embarrassed but not at all displeased at the attention which was being centred on him he seems to have resembled you in more things than in appearance said the baroness don't interrupt at a critical point in the story said clovis as soon as he had been carefully adjusted in the prescribed position over the hives and almost before the jailers had time to retire to a safe distance vespaluus gave a lusty and well-aimed kick which sent all three hives toppling over one another the next moment he was wrapped from head to foot in bees each individual insect nursed the dreadful and humiliating knowledge that in this supreme hour of catastrophe it could not sting but each felt that it ought to pretend to vespaluus squealed and wriggled with laughter for he was being tickled nearly to death and now and again he gave a furious kick and used a bad word as one of the few bees that had escaped disarmament got its protest home but the spectators saw with amazement that he showed no signs of approaching death agony and as the bees dropped wearily away in clusters from his body his flesh was seen to be as white and smooth as before the ordeal with a shiny glaze from the honey smear of innumerable bee feet and here and there a small red spot where one of the rare stings had left its mark it was obvious that a miracle had been performed in his favour and one loud murmur of astonishment or exultation rose from the onlooking crowd the king gave orders for vespaluus to be taken down to await further orders and stalked silently back to his midday meal at which he was careful to eat heartily and drink copiously as though nothing unusual had happened after dinner he sent for the royal librarian what is the meaning of this fiasco he demanded your majesty said that official either there is something radically wrong with the bees there is nothing wrong with my bees said the king haughtily they are the best bees or else said the librarian there is something irremediably right about prince vespaluus if vespaluus is right i must be wrong said the king the librarian was silent for a moment hasty speech has been the downfall of many ill-considered silence was the undoing of the luckless court functionary forgetting the restraint due to his dignity and the golden rule which imposes repose of mind and body after a heavy meal the king rushed upon the keeper of the royal books and hit him repeatedly and promiscuously over the head with an ivory chessboard a pewter wine flagon and a brass candlestick he knocked him violently and often against an iron torch sconce and kicked him thrice round the banqueting chamber with rapid energetic kicks finally he dragged him down a long passage by the hair of his head and flung him out of a window into the courtyard below was he much hurt asked the baroness more hurt than surprised said clovis you see the king was notorious for his violent temper however this was the first time he had let himself go so unrestrainedly on the top of a heavy meal the librarian lingered for many days in fact for all i know he may have ultimately recovered but hikros died that same evening vespaluus had hardly finished getting the honey stains off his body before a hurried deputation came to put the coronation oil on his head and what with the publicly witnessed miracle and the accession of a christian sovereign it was not surprising that there was a general scramble of converts to the new religion 
a hastily consecrated bishop was overworked with a rush of baptisms in the hastily improvised cathedral of st odilo and the boy martyr that might have been was transposed in the popular imagination into a royal boy saint whose fame attracted throngs of curious and devout sightseers to the capital vespalius who was busily engaged in organizing the games and athletic contests that were to mark the commencement of his reign had no time to give heed to the religious fervor which was effervescing round his personality the first indication he had of the existing state of affairs was when the court chamberlain a recent and very ardent addition to the christian community brought for his approval the outlines of a projected ceremonial cutting down of the idolatrous serpent grove your majesty will be graciously pleased to cut down the first tree with a specially consecrated axe said the obsequious official i'll cut off your head first with any axe that comes handy said vespalius indignantly do you suppose that i am going to begin my reign by mortally affronting the sacred serpents it would be most unlucky your majesty's christian principles exclaimed the bewildered chamberlain i never had any said vespalius i used to pretend to be a christian convert just to annoy hrikros he used to fly into such delicious tempers and it was rather fun being whipped and scolded and shut up in a tower all for nothing but as to turning christian in real earnest like you people seem to do i couldn't think of such a thing and the holy and esteemed serpents have always helped me when i've prayed to them for success in my running and wrestling and hunting and it was through their distinguished intercession that the bees were not able to hurt me with their stings it would be black ingratitude to turn against their worship at the very outset of my reign i hate you for suggesting it the chamberlain wrung his hands despairingly but your majesty he wailed the people are reverencing you as a saint and the nobles are being christianized in batches and neighboring potentates of that faith are sending special envoys to welcome you as a brother there is some talk of making you the patron saint of beehives and a certain shade of honey yellow has been christened vespaluasian gold at the emperor's court you can't surely go back on all this i don't mind being reverenced and greeted and honoured said vespaluus i don't even mind being sainted in moderation as long as i'm not expected to be saintly as well but i wish you would clearly and finally to understand that i will not give up the worship of the august and auspicious serpents there was a world of unspoken bear pit in the way he uttered those last words and the mulberry dark eyes flashed dangerously a new reign said the chamberlain to himself but the same old temper finally as a state necessity the matter of the religions was compromised at stated intervals the king appeared before his subjects in the national cathedral in the character of saint vespaluus and the idolatrous grove was gradually pruned and lopped away till nothing remained of it but the sacred and esteemed serpents were removed to a private shrubbery in the royal gardens where vespaluus the pagan and certain members of his household devoutly and decently worshipped them that possibly is the reason why the boy king's success in sports and hunting never deserted him to the end of his days and that is also the reason why in spite of the popular veneration for his sanctity he never received official canonization it has stopped raining said the baroness the end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the chronicles of clovis by hector monroe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt berard the chronicles of clovis chapter nineteen the way to the dairy the baroness and clovis sat in a much frequented corner of the park exchanging biographical confidences about the long succession of passers-by 
who are those depressed looking young women who have just gone by asked the baroness they have the air of people who have bowed to destiny and are not quite sure whether the salute will be returned those said clovis are the brimley bomefields i dare say you would look depressed if you had been through their experiences i'm always having depressing experiences said the baroness but i never give them an outward expression it's as bad as looking one's age tell me about the brimley bomefields well said clovis the beginning of their tragedy was that they found an aunt the aunt had been there all the time but they had very nearly forgotten her existence until a distant relative refreshed their memory by remembering her very distinctly in his will it is wonderful what the force of example will accomplish the aunt who had been unobtrusively poor became quite pleasantly rich and the brimley bonefields grew suddenly concerned at the loneliness of her life and took her under their collective wings she had as many wings around her at this time as one of those beast things in revelation so far i don't see any tragedy from the brimley bonefields point of view said the baroness we haven't got to it yet said clovis the aunt had been used to living very simply and had seen next to nothing of what we should consider life and her nieces didn't encourage her to do much in the way of making a splash with her money quite a good deal of it would come to them at her death and she was a fairly old woman but there was one circumstance which cast a shadow of gloom over the satisfaction they felt in the discovery and acquisition of this desirable aunt she openly acknowledged that a comfortable slice of her little fortune would go to a nephew on the other side of her family he was a rather deplorable thing in rotters and quite hopelessly top hole in the way of getting through money but he had been more or less decent to the old lady in her unremembered days and she wouldn't hear anything against him at least she wouldn't pay any attention to what she did hear but her nieces took care that she should have to listen to a good deal in that line it seemed such a pity they said among themselves that good money should fall into such worthless hands they habitually spoke of their aunt's money as good money as though other people's aunts dabbled for the most part in spurious currency regularly after the derby st leger and other notable racing events they indulged in audible speculations as to how much money roger had squandered in unfortunate betting transactions his travelling expenses must come to a big sum said the eldest brimley bonefield one day they say he attends every race meeting in england besides others abroad i shouldn't wonder if he went all the way to india to see the race for the calcutta sweepstake that one hears so much about travel enlarges the mind my dear christine said her aunt yes dear aunt travel undertaken in the right spirit agreed christine but travel pursued merely as a means towards gambling and extravagant living is more likely to contract the purse than to enlarge the mind however as long as roger enjoys himself i suppose he doesn't care how fast or unprofitably the money goes or where he is to find more it seems a pity that's all the aunt by that time had begun to talk of something else and it was doubtful if christine's moralizing had been even accorded a hearing it was her remark however the aunt's remark i mean about travel enlarging the mind that gave the youngest brimley bonefield her great idea for the showing up of roger if aunt could only be taken somewhere to see him gambling and throwing away money she said it would open her eyes to his character more effectually than anything we can say my dear veronique said her sisters we can't go following him to race meetings certainly not to race meetings said veronique but we might go to some place where one can look on at gambling without taking part in it do you mean monte carlo they asked her beginning to jump rather at the idea 
monte carlo is a long way off and has a dreadful reputation said veronique i shouldn't like to tell our friends that we were going to monte carlo but i believe roger usually goes to dieppe about this time of year and some quite respectable english people go there and the journey wouldn't be expensive if aunt could stand the channel crossing the change of scene might do her a lot of good and that was how the fateful idea came to the brimley bonefields from the very first set-off disaster hung over the expedition as they afterwards remembered to begin with all the brimley bonefields were extremely unwell during the crossing while the aunt enjoyed the sea air and made friends with all manner of strange travelling companions then although it was many years since she had been on the continent she had served a very practical apprenticeship there as a paid companion and her knowledge of colloquial french beat theirs to a standstill it became increasingly difficult to keep under their collective wings a person who knew what she wanted and was able to ask for it and to see that she got it also as far as roger was concerned they drew deep blank it turned out that he was staying at poorville a little watering place a mile or two further west the brimley bonefields discovered that deep was too crowded and frivolous and persuaded the old lady to migrate to the comparative seclusion of poorville you won't find it dull you know they assured her there is a little casino attached to the hotel and you can watch the people dancing and throwing their money away at petit chevaux it was just before petit chevaux had been supplanted by bowl roger was not staying in the same hotel but they knew that the casino would be certain of his patronage on most afternoons and evenings on the first evening of their visit they wandered into the casino after a fairly early dinner and hovered near the tables bertie van tong was staying there at the time and he described the whole incident to me the brimley bonefields kept a furtive watch on the doors as though they were expecting someone to turn up and the aunt got more and more amused and interested watching the little horses whirl round and round the board do you know poor little number eight hasn't won for the last thirty-two times she said to christine i've been keeping count i shall really have to put five francs on him to encourage him come and watch the dancing dear said christine nervously it was scarcely a part of their strategy that roger should come in and find the old lady backing her fancy at the petit chevaux table just wait while i put five francs on number eight said the aunt and in another moment her money was lying on the table the horses commenced to move round it was a slow race this time and number eight crept up at the finish like some crafty demon and placed his nose just a fraction in front of number three who had seemed to be winning easily recourse had to be had to measurement and the number eight was proclaimed the winner the aunt picked up thirty-five francs after that the brimley bonefields would have had to have used concerted force to get her away from the tables when roger appeared on the scene she was fifty-two francs to the good her nieces were hovering forlornly in the background like chickens that have been hatched out by a duck and are despairingly watching their parent disporting herself in a dangerous and uncongenial element the supper party which roger insisted on standing that night in honour of his aunt and the three miss brimley bonefields was remarkable for the unrestrained gaiety of two of the participants and the funereal mirthlessness of the remaining guests i do not think christine confided afterwards to a friend who reconfided it to bertie van tan that i shall ever be able to touch pate de foie gras again it would bring back memories of that awful evening for the next two or three days the nieces made plans for returning to england or moving on to some other resort where there was no casino the aunt was busy making a system for winning at petit chevaux number eight her first love had been running rather unkindly for her and a series of plunges on number five had turned out even worse 
do you know i dropped over seven hundred francs at the tables this afternoon she announced cheerfully at dinner on the fourth evening of their visit aunt twenty-eight pounds and you were losing last night too oh i shall get it all back she said optimistically but not here these silly little horses are no good i shall go somewhere where one can play comfortably at roulette you needn't look so shocked i've always felt that given the opportunity i should be an inveterate gambler and now you darlings have put the opportunity in my way i must drink your very good healths waiter a bottle of ponte canet ah it's number seven on the wine list i shall plunge on number seven to-night it won four times running this afternoon when i was backing that silly number five number seven was not in a winning mood that evening the brimley bumfields tired of watching disaster from a distance drew near to the table where their aunt was now an honoured habitue and gazed mournfully at the successive victories of one and five and eight and four which swept good money out of the purse of seven's obstinate backer the day's losses totaled something very near two thousand francs you incorrigible gamblers said roger chaffingly to them when he found them at the tables we are not gambling said christine freezingly we are looking on i don't think said roger knowingly of course you're a syndicate and aunt is putting the stakes on for all of you any one can tell by your looks when the wrong horse wins that you've got a stake on aunt and nephew had supper alone that night or at least they would have if bertie hadn't joined them all the brimley bumfields had headaches the aunt carried them all off to deep the next day and sat cheerily about the task of winning back some of her losses her luck was variable in fact she had some fair streaks of good fortune just enough to keep her thoroughly amused with her new distraction but on the whole she was a loser the brimley bonefields had a collective attack of nervous prostration on the day when she sold out a quantity of shares in argentine rails nothing will ever bring that money back they remarked lugubriously to one another veronique at last could bear it no longer and went home you see it had been her idea to bring the aunt on this disastrous expedition and though the others did not cast the fact verbally in her face there was a certain lurking reproach in their eyes which was harder to meet than actual upbraidings the other two remained behind forlornly mounting guard over their aunt until such time as the waning of the deep season should at least turn her in the direction of home and safety they made anxious calculations as to how little good money might with reasonable luck be squandered in the meantime here however their reckoning went far astray the close of the deep season merely turned their aunt's thoughts in search of some other convenient gambling resort show a cat the way to the dairy i have forgot how the proverb goes on but it summed up the situation as far as the brimley bonevilles aunt was concerned she had been introduced to unexplored pleasures and found them greatly to her liking and she was in no hurry to forgo the fruits of her newly acquired knowledge you see for the first time in her life the old thing was thoroughly enjoying herself she was losing money but she had plenty of fun and excitement over the process and she had enough left to do very comfortably on indeed she was only just learning to understand the art of doing oneself well she was a popular hostess and in return her fellow gamblers were always ready to entertain her to dinners and suppers when their luck was in her nieces who still remained in attendance on her with the pathetic unwillingness of a crew to leave a foundering treasure-ship which might yet be steered into port found little pleasure in these bohemian festivities to see good money lavished on good living for the entertainment of a nondescript circle of acquaintances who were not likely to be in any way socially useful to them did not attune them to a spirit of revelry 
they contrived whenever possible to excuse themselves from participation in their aunt's deplored gaieties the brimley bonefield headaches became famous and one day the nieces came to the conclusion that as they would have expressed it no useful purpose would be served by their continued attendance on a relative who had so thoroughly emancipated herself from the sheltering protection of their wings the aunt bore the announcement of their departure with a cheerfulness that was almost disconcerting it's time you went home and had those headaches seen to by a specialist was her comment on the situation the homeward journey of the brimley bonefields was a veritable retreat from moscow and what made it the more bitter was the fact that the moscow in this case was not overwhelmed with fire and ashes but merely extravagantly over illuminated from mutual friends and acquaintances they sometimes get glimpses of their prodigal relative who has settled down into a confirmed gambling maniac living on such salvage of income as obliging money-lenders have left at her disposal so you need not be surprised concluded clovis if they do wear a depressed look in public which is veronique asked the baroness the most depressed looking of the three said clovis End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of the Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. Chapter Twenty The Peace Offering i want you to help me in getting up a dramatic entertainment of some sort said the baroness to clovis you see there's been an election petition down here and a member unseated and no end of bitterness and ill-feeling and the county is socially divided against itself i thought a play of some kind would be an excellent opportunity for bringing people together again and giving them something to think of besides tiresome political squabbles the baroness was evidently ambitious of reproducing beneath her own roof the pacifying effects traditionally ascribed to the celebrated reel of tullicorum we might do something on the lines of greek tragedy said clovis after due reflection the return of agamemnon for instance the baroness frowned it sounds rather reminiscent of an election result doesn't it it wasn't that sort of return explained clovis it was a homecoming i thought you said it was a tragedy well it was he was killed in his bathroom you know oh now i know the story of course do you want me to take the part of charlotte corday that's a different story and a different century said clovis the dramatic unities forbid one to lay a scene in more than one century at a time the killing in this case has to be done by clytemnestra rather a pretty name i'll do that part i suppose you want to be aga whatever his name is dear no agamemnon was the father of grown-up children and probably wore a beard and looked prematurely aged i shall be his charioteer or bath attendant or something decorative of that kind we must do everything in the sumeran manner you know i don't know said the baroness at least i should know better if you would explain exactly what you mean by the sumeran manner clovis obliged weird music and exotic skippings and flying leaps and lots of drapery and undrapery particularly undrapery i think i told you the county are coming the county won't stand anything very greek you can get over any objection by calling it hygiene or limb culture or something of that sort after all everyone exposes their insides to the public gaze and sympathy nowadays so why not one's outside my dear boy i can ask the county 
to a greek play or to a costume play but to a greek costume play never it doesn't do to let this dramatic instinct carry one too far one must consider one's environment when one lives among greyhounds one should avoid giving lifelike imitations of a rabbit unless one wants one's head snapped off remember i've got this place on a seven years lease and then continued the baroness as to skippings and flying leaps i must ask emily dashford to take a part she's a dear good thing and will do anything she's told or try to but can you imagine her doing a flying leap under any circumstances she can be cassandra and she need only take flying leaps into the future in a metaphorical sense cassandra rather a pretty name what kind of character is she she was a sort of advance agent for calamities to know her was to know the worst fortunately for the gaiety of the age she lived in no one took her very seriously still it must have been fairly galling to have her turning up after every catastrophe with a conscious air of perhaps another time you'll believe what i say i should have wanted to kill her as clytemnestra i believe you gratify that very natural wish then it has a happy ending in spite of it being a tragedy well hardly said clovis you see the satisfaction of putting a violent end to cassandra must have been considerably damped by the fact that she had foretold what was going to happen to her she probably dies with an intensely irritating what did i tell you smile on her lips by the way of course all the killing will be done in the summarum manner please explain again said the baroness taking out a notebook and pencil little and often you know instead of one sweeping blow you see you are at your own home so there's no need to hurry over the murdering as though it were some disagreeable but necessary duty and what sort of end do i have i mean what curtain do i get i suppose you rush into your lover's arms that is where one of the flying leaps will come in the getting up and rehearsing of the play seemed likely to cause in a restricted area nearly as much heart-burning and ill-feeling as the election petition clovis as adapter and stage manager insisted as far as he was able on the charioteer being quite the most prominent character in the play and his panther-skin tunic caused almost as much trouble and discussion as clytemnestra's spasmodic succession of lovers who broke down on probation with alarming uniformity when the cast was at length fixed beyond hope of reprieve matters went scarcely more smoothly clovis and the baroness rather overdid the summarin manner while the rest of the company could hardly be said to attempt it at all as for cassandra who was expected to improvise her own prophecies she appeared to be as incapable of taking flying leaps into futurity as of executing more than a severely plantigrade walk across the stage woe trojans woe to troy was the most inspired remark she could produce after several hours of conscientious study of all the available authorities it's no earthly use for telling the fall of troy expostulated clovis because troy has fallen before the action of the play begins and you mustn't say too much about your own impending doom either because that will give things away too much to the audience after several minutes of painful brain searching cassandra smiled reassuringly i know i'll predict a long and happy reign for george the fifth my dear girl protested clovis have you reflected that cassandra specialized in foretelling calamities there was another prolonged pause and another triumphant issue i know i'll foretell a most disastrous season for the foxhounds on no account entreated clovis do remember that all cassandra's predictions came true 
the m f h and the hunt secretary are both awfully superstitious and they are both going to be present cassandra retreated hastily to her bedroom to bathe her eyes before appearing at tea the baroness and clovis were by this time scarcely on speaking terms each sincerely wished their respective role to be the pivot round which the entire production should revolve and each lost no opportunity for furthering the cause they had at heart as fast as clovis introduced some effective bit of business for the charioteer and he introduced a great many the baroness would remorselessly cut it out or more often dovetail it into her own part while clovis retaliated in a similar fashion whenever possible the climax came when clytemnestra annexed some highly complimentary lines which were to have been addressed to the charioteer by a bevy of admiring greek damsels and put them into the mouth of her lover clovis stood by in apparent unconcern while the words oh lovely stripling radiant as the dawn were transposed into o oh, clytemnestra radiant as the dawn but there was a dangerous glitter in his eye that might have given the baroness warning he had composed the verse himself inspired and thoroughly carried away by his subject he suffered therefore a double pang in beholding his tribute deflected from its destined object and his words mutilated and twisted into what became an extravagant panegyric on the baroness's personal charms it was from this moment that he became gentle and assiduous in his private coaching of cassandra the county forgetting its dissensions mustered in full strength to witness the much talked of production the protective providence that looks after little children and amateur theatricals made good its traditional promise that everything should be right on the night the baroness and clovis seemed to have sunk their mutual differences and between them dominated the scene to the partial eclipse of all the other characters who for the most part seemed well content to remain in the shadow even agamemnon with ten years of strenuous life around troy standing to his credit appeared to be an unobtrusive personality compared with his flamboyant charioteer but the moment came for cassandra who had been excused from any very definite outpourings during rehearsals to support her role by delivering herself of a few well-chosen anticipations of pending misfortune the musicians obliged with appropriately lugubrious wailings and thumpings and the baroness seized the opportunity to make a dash to the dressing-room to effect certain repairs in her make-up cassandra nervous but resolute came down to the footlights and like one repeating a carefully learned lesson flung her remarks straight at the audience i see woe for this fair country if the brood of corrupt self-seeking unscrupulous unprincipled politicians here she named one of the two rival parties in the state continue to infest and poison our local councils and undermine our parliamentary representation if they continue to snatch votes by nefarious and discreditable means a humming as of a great hive of bewildered and affronted bees drowned her further remarks and wore down the droning of the musicians the baroness who should have been greeted on her return to the stage with the pleasing invocation o oh, clytemnestra radiant as the dawn heard instead the imperious voice of lady thistledale ordering her carriage and something like a storm of open discord going on at the back of the room the social divisions in the county healed themselves after their own fashion both parties found common ground in condemning the baroness's outrageously bad taste and tactlessness she had been fortunate in subletting for the greater part of her seven years lease end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the chronicles of clovis 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. Chapter 21. The Peace of Mouths Barton. Crefton Lockyer sat at his ease, an ease alike of body and soul, in the little patch of ground, half orchard and half garden, that abutted on the farmyard at Mouths Barton. After the stress and noise of long years of city life, the repose and peace of the hill begirt homestead struck on his senses with an almost dramatic intensity. Time and space seemed to lose their meaning and their abruptness. The minutes slid away into hours, and the meadows and fallows sloped away into middle distance, softly and imperceptibly. Wild weeds of the hedgerow straggled into the flower garden, and wallflowers and garden bushes made counter raids into farmyard and lane. Sleepy-looking hens and solemn, preoccupied ducks were equally at home in yard, orchard, or roadway. Nothing seemed to belong definitely to anywhere. Even the gates were not necessarily to be found on their hinges, and over the whole scene brooded the sense of a peace that had almost a quality of magic in it. In the afternoon, you felt that it had always been afternoon, and must always remain afternoon. In the twilight, you knew that it could never have been anything else but twilight. Crefton Lockyer sat at his ease in the rustic seat beneath an old medlar tree, and decided that here was the life anchorage that his mind had so fondly pictured, and that latterly his tired and jarred senses had so often pined for. He would make a permanent lodging place among these simple, friendly people gradually increasing the modest comforts with which he would like to surround himself but falling in as much as possible with their manner of living as he slowly matured this resolution in his mind an elderly woman came hobbling with uncertain gait through the orchard he recognized her as a member of the farm household the mother or possibly the mother-in-law of mrs spurfield his present landlady and hastily formulated some pleasant remark to make to her she forestalled him there's a bit of writing chalked up on the door over yonder what is it she spoke in a dull impersonal manner as though the question had been on her lips for years and had thus be got rid of her eyes however looked impatiently over crefton's head at the door of a small barn which formed the outpost of a straggling line of farm buildings martha pillman is an old witch was the announcement that met crefton's inquiring scrutiny and he hesitated a moment before giving the statement wider publicity for all he knew to the contrary it might be martha herself to whom he was speaking it was possible that mrs spurfield's maiden name had been pillamon and the gaunt withered old dame at his side might certainly fulfil local conditions as to the outward aspect of a witch it's something about someone called martha pillamon he explained cautiously what does it say it's very disrespectful said crefton it says she's a witch such things ought not to be written up it's true every word of it said his listener with considerable satisfaction adding as a special descriptive note of her own the old toad and as she hobbled away through the farmyard she shrilled out in her cracked voice martha pillman is an old witch did you hear what she said mumbled a weak angry voice somewhere behind crepton's shoulder turning hastily he beheld another old crumb thin and yellow and wrinkled, and evidently in a high state of displeasure. Obviously, this was Martha Pellman in person. The orchard seemed to be a favorite promenade for the aged women of the neighborhood. "'Tis lies, tis sinful lies,' the weak voice went on. "'Tis Betsy Croot is the old witch, she and her daughter, the dirty rat. I put a spell on him, the old nuisances.' as she limped slowly away her eye caught the chalk inscription on the barn door 
"What's written up there?" she demanded, wheeling round on Crupton. "Vote for Sorger," he responded, with the craven boldness of the practised peacemaker. The old woman grunted, and her mutterings and her faded red shawl lost themselves gradually among the tree trunks. Crupton rose presently and made his way towards the farmhouse. Somehow a good deal of the peace seemed to have slipped out of the atmosphere. The cheery bustle of tea time in the old farm kitchen, which Crupton had found so agreeable on previous afternoons, seemed to have soured today into a certain uneasy melancholy. There was a dull, dragging silence around the board, and the tea itself, when Crupton came to taste it, was a flat, lukewarm concoction that would have driven the spirit of revelry out of a carnival. "'It's no use complaining of the tea,' said Mrs. Burfield hastily, as her guest stared with an air of polite inquiry at his cup. "'The kettle won't boil. That's the truth of it.' Crepton turned to the hearth, where an unusually fierce fire was banked up under a big black kettle, which sent a thin wreath of steam from its bout, but seemed otherwise to ignore the action of the roaring blaze beneath it. "'It's been there more than an hour, and boil it won't,' said Mrs. Spurfield, adding, by way of complete explanation, "'We're bewitched. "'It's Martha Pillman as has done it,' chimed in the old mother. "'I'll be even with the old toad. "'I'll put a spell on her.' "'It must boil in time,' protested Crafton, ignoring the suggestions of foul influences. "'Perhaps the coal is damp.' it won't boil in time for supper nor for breakfast to-morrow morning not if you was to keep the fire a-going all night for it said mrs Spurfield. and it didn't the household subsisted on fried and baked dishes and a neighbour obligingly brewed tea and sent it across in a moderately warm condition i suppose you'll be leaving us now that things have turned up uncomfortable mrs Spurfield observed at breakfast there are folks as deserts one as soon as trouble comes crepton hurriedly disclaimed any immediate change of plans he observed however to himself that the earlier heartiness of manner had in a large measure deserted the household suspicious looks sulky silences or sharp speeches had become the order of the day as for the old mother she sat about the kitchen or the garden all day murmuring threats and spells against martha pillman there was something alike terrifying and piteous in the spectacle of these frail old morsels of humanity consecrating their last flickering energies to the task of making each other wretched hatred seemed to be the one faculty which had survived in undiminished vigour and intensity where all else was dropping into order and symmetrical decay and the uncanny part of it was that some horrid unwholesome power seemed to be distilled from their spite and their cursings no amount of sceptical explanation could remove the undoubted fact that neither kettle nor saucepan would come to boiling point over the hottest fire crefton clung as long as possible to the theory of some defect in the coals but a wood fire gave the same result and when a small spirit lamp kettle which he ordered out by carrier showed the same obstinate refusal to allow its contents to boil he felt that he had come suddenly into contact with some unguessed at and very evil aspect of hidden forces miles away down through an opening in the hills he could catch glimpses of a road where motor cars sometimes passed and yet here so little removed from the arteries of the latest civilization was a bat hunted old homestead where something unmistakably like witchcraft seemed to hold a very practical sway passing out through the farm garden on his way to the lanes beyond where he hoped to recapture the comfortable sense of peacefulness that was so lacking around house and hearth especially hearth crefton came across the old mother sitting mumbling to herself in the seat beneath the medlar tree let em sink as swims let em sink as swims 
she was repeating over and over again as a child repeats a half-learned lesson and now and then she would break off into a shrill laugh with a note of malice in it that was not a, that was not pleasant to hear crefton was glad when he found himself out of earshot in the quiet and seclusion of the deep overgrown lanes that seemed to lead away to nowhere one narrower and deeper than the rest attracted his footsteps and he was almost annoyed when he found that it really did act as a miniature roadway to a human dwelling a forlorn-looking cottage with a scrap of ill-tended cabbage garden and a few aged apple trees stood at an angle where a swift flowing stream widened out for a space into a decent-sized pond before hurrying away again through the willows that had checked its course crepton leaned against a tree trunk and looked across the swirling eddies of the pond at the humble little homestead opposite him the only sign of life came from a small procession of dingy-looking ducks that marched in single file down to the water's edge there is always something rather taking in the way a duck changes itself in an instant from a slow clumsy waddler of the earth to a graceful buoyant swimmer of the waters and crefton waited with a certain arrest attention to watch the leader of the file launch itself on to the surface of the pond he was aware at the same time of a curious warning instinct that something strange and unpleasant was about to happen the duck flung itself confidently forward into the water and rolled immediately under the surface its head appeared for a moment and went under again leaving a train of bubbles in its wake white wings and legs turned the water in a helpless swirl of flapping and kicking the bird was obviously drowning crepton thought at first that it had caught itself in some weeds or was being attacked from below by a pike or a water rat but no blood floated to the surface and the wildly bobbing body made the circuit of the pond current without hindrance from any entanglement a second duck had by this time launched itself into the pond and a second struggling body rolled and twisted under the surface there was something peculiarly piteous in the sight of the gasping beaks that showed now and again above the water as though in terrified protest at this treachery of a trusted and familiar element crefton gazed with something like horror as a third duck poised itself on the bank and splashed in to share the fate of the other two he felt almost relieved when the remainder of the flock taking tardy alarm from the commotion of the slowly drowning bodies drew themselves up with tense outstretched necks and sidled away from the scene of danger quacking a deep note of disquietude as they went at the same moment crefton became aware that he was not the only human witness of the scene a bent and withered old woman whom he recognized at once as martha pillman of sinister reputation had limped down the cottage path to the water's edge and was gazing fixedly at the gruesome whirligig of dying birds that went in horrible procession round the pool presently her voice rang out in a shrill note of quavering rage tis betsy croot a done it the old rat i'll put a spell on her see if i don't crefton slipped quietly away uncertain whether or no the old woman had noticed his presence even before she had proclaimed the guiltiness of betsy croot the latter's muttered incantation let em sink as swims had flashed uncomfortably across his mind but it was the final threat of a retaliatory spell which crowded his mind with misgiving to the exclusion of all other thoughts or fancies his reasoning powers could no longer afford to dismiss these old wives threats as empty bickerings the household of mals barton lay under the displeasure of a vindictive old woman who seemed able to materialize her personal spites in a very practical fashion and there was no saying what form her revenge for three drowned ducks might not take as a member of the household crepton might find himself involved in some general and highly disagreeable visitation of martha pillman's wrath 
of course he knew that he was giving way to absurd fancies but the behaviour of the spirit lamp kettle and the subsequent scene at the pond had considerably unnerved him and the vagueness of his alarm added to its terrors when once you have taken the impossible into your calculations its possibilities become practically limitless crefton rose at his usual early hour the next morning after one of the least restful nights he had spent at the farm his sharpened senses quickly detected that subtle atmosphere of things being not altogether well that hangs over a stricken household the cows had been milked but they stood huddled about in the yard waiting impatiently to be driven out afield and the poultry kept up an importunate querulous reminder of deferred feeding time the yard pump which usually made discordant music at frequent intervals during the early morning was to-day ominously silent in the house itself there was a coming and going of scuttering footsteps a rushing and dying away of hurried voices and long uneasy stillnesses crepton finished his dressing and made his way to the head of a narrow staircase he could hear a dull complaining voice a voice into which an odd hush had crept and recognized the speaker as mrs spurfield he'll go away for sure the voice was saying there are those as runs away from one as soon as real misfortune shows itself crefton felt that he probably was one of those and that there were moments when it was advisable to be true to type he crept back to his room collected and packed his few belongings placed the money due for his lodgings on a table and made his way out by a back door into the yard a mob of poultry surged expectantly towards him shaking off their interested attentions he hurried along under cover of cowstall piggery and hayricks till he reached the lane at the back of the farm a few minutes walk which only the burden of his portmanteau restrained from developing into an undisguised run brought him to a main road where the early carrier soon overtook him and sped him onward to the neighboring town at a bend of the road he caught a last glimpse of the farm the old gabled roofs and thatched barns the straggling orchard and the medlar tree with its wooden seat stood out with an almost spectral clearness in the early morning light and over it all brooded that air of magic possession which crefton had once mistaken for peace the bustle and roar of paddington station smote on his ears with a welcome protective greeting very bad for our nerves all this rush and hurry said a fellow traveller give me the peace and quiet of the country crefton mentally surrendered his share of the desired commodity a crowded brilliantly overlighted music hall where an exuberant rendering of eighteen twelve was being given by a strenuous orchestra came nearest to his ideal of a nerve sedative End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the chronicles of clovis by hector munro this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley the talking out of tarrington heavens exclaimed the aunt of clovis here's someone i know bearing down on us i can't remember his name but he lunched with us once in town tarrington yes that's it he's heard of the picnic i'm giving for the princess and he'll cling to me like a life-belt till i give him an invitation then he'll ask if he may bring all his wives and mothers and sisters with him that's the worst of these small watering places one can't escape from anybody i'll fight a rearguard action for you if you like to do a bolt now volunteered clovis you've a clear ten yards start if you don't lose time the aunt of clovis responded gamely to the suggestion and churned away like a nile steamer with a long brown ripple of pekinese spaniel trailing in her wake pretend you don't know him was her parting advice tinged with the reckless courage of the non-combatant 
The next moment the overtures of an affably disposed gentleman were being received by Clovis with a silent upon a peak in Darien stare, which denoted an absence of all previous acquaintance with the object scrutinised. "'I expect you don't know me with my moustache said the newcomer. "'I've only grown it during the last two months.' "'On the contrary,' said Clovis, "'the moustache is the only thing about you that seems familiar to me. "'I feel certain that I had met it somewhere before.' "'My name is Tarrington,' resumed the candidate for recognition. "'A very useful kind of name,' said Clovis. "'With a name of that sort, no one would blame you "'if you did nothing in particular heroic or remarkable, would they? "'And yet, if you were to raise a troop of light horse in a moment of national emergency tarrington's light horse would sound quite appropriate and pulse quickening whereas if you were called spoopin for instance the thing would be out of the question no one even in a moment of national emergency could possibly belong to spoopin's horse the newcomer smiled weakly as one who is not to be put off by mere flippancy and began again with patient persistence "'I think you ought to remember my name.' "'I shall,' said Clovis, with an air of immense sincerity. "'My aunt was asking me only this morning "'to suggest names for four young owls "'she's just had sent her as pets. "'I shall call them all Tarrington. "'Then, if one or two of them die or fly away, "'or leave us in any of the ways that pet owls are prone to, "'there will always be one or two left to carry on your name.' and my aunt won't let me forget it she will always be asking me have the tarringtons had their mice and questions of that sort she says if you keep wild creatures in captivity you ought to see after their wants and of course she's quite right there i met you at luncheon at your aunt's house once broke in mr tarrington pale but still resolute my aunt never lunches said clovis she belongs to the national anti-luncheon league which is doing quite a lot of good work in a quiet unobtrusive way a subscription of half a crown per quarter entitles you to go without ninety-two luncheons this must be something new exclaimed tarrington it's the same aunt that i've always had said clovis coldly i perfectly well remember meeting you at a luncheon party given by your aunt persisted tarrington who was beginning to flush an unhealthy shade of mottled pink. "'What was there for lunch?' asked Clovis. "'Oh, well, I don't remember that.' "'How nice of you to remember my aunt, when you can no longer recall the names of the things you ate. Now my memory works quite differently. I can remember a menu long after I've forgotten the hostess that accompanied it. When I was seven years old, I recollect being given a peach.' at a garden party by some duchess or other i can't remember a thing about her except that i imagine our acquaintance must have been of the slightest as she called me a nice little boy but i have unfading memories of that peach it was one of those exuberant peaches that meet you halfway so to speak and are all over you in a moment it was a beautiful unspoiled product of a hothouse and yet it managed quite successfully to give itself the airs of a compote. You had to bite it and imbibe it at the same time. To me there has always been something charming and mystic in the thought of that delicate velvet globe of fruit slowly ripening and warming to perfection through the long summer days and perfumed nights, and then coming suddenly athwart my life in the supreme moment of its existence i can never forget it even if i wished to and when i had devoured all that was edible of it there still remained the stone which a heedless thoughtless child would doubtless have thrown away i put it down the neck of a young friend who was wearing a very delicolete sailor suit i told him it was a scorpion and from the way he wriggled and screamed he evidently believed it though where the silly kid imagined i could procure a live scorpion at a garden party i don't know altogether that peach is for me an unfading and happy memory 
the defeated tarrington had by this time retreated out of earshot comforting himself as best he might with the reflection that a picnic which included the presence of clovis might prove a doubtfully agreeable experience i shall certainly go in for a parliamentary career said clovis to himself as he turned complacently to rejoin his aunt as a talker out of inconvenient bills i should be invaluable End of section 22「ニトリ」この番組は「ニトリ」の番組で、この番組は、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、この番組で、Somewhere in front of him, he fancied, lay the sea, and towards the sea his footsteps seemed persistently turning. Why he was struggling wearily forward to that goal, he could scarcely have explained, unless he was possessed by the same instinct that turns a hard pressed stag cliffward in its last extremity. In his case, the hounds of fate were certainly pressing him with unrelenting insistence. Hunger, fatigue, and despairing hopelessness had numbed his brain, and he could scarcely summon sufficient energy to wonder what underlying impulse was driving him onward. Stoner was one of those unfortunate individuals who seemed to have tried everything. A natural slothfulness and improvidence had always intervened to blight any chance of even moderate success, and now he was at the end of his tether. And there was nothing more to try. Desperation had not awakened in him any dormant reserve of energy. On the contrary, a mental torpor grew up round the crisis of his fortunes. With the clothes he stood up in, a halfpenny in his pocket, and no single friend or acquaintance to turn to, with no prospect either of a bed for the night or a meal for the morrow, Martin Stoner trudged stolidly forward. Between moist hedgerows and beneath dripping trees, his mind almost a blank, except that he was subconsciously aware that somewhere in front of him lay the sea. Another consciousness obtruded itself now and then, the knowledge that he was miserably hungry. Presently he came to a halt by an open gateway that led into a spacious and rather neglected farm garden. There was little sign of life about. And the farmhouse at the further end of the garden looked chill and inhospitable. A drizzling rain, however, was setting in, and Stoner thought that here perhaps he might obtain a few minutes' shelter and buy a glass of milk with his last remaining coin. He turned slowly and wearily into the garden and followed a narrow flagged path up to a side door. Before he had time to knock, the door opened. And a bent, withered looking old man stood aside in the doorway as though to let him pass in. Could I come in out of the rain? Stoner began, but the old man interrupted him. Come in, Master Tom. I knew you'd come back one of these days. Stoner lurched across the threshold and stood staring uncomprehendingly at the other. Sit down while I put you out a bit of supper, said the old man with quavering eagerness. Stoner's legs gave way from very weariness, and he sank inertly into the armchair that had been pushed up to him. In another minute, he was devouring the cold meat, cheese, and bread that had been placed on the table at his side. You're a little changed these four years, went on the old man, in a voice that sounded to Stoner as something in a dream, far away and inconsequent. But you'll find us a deal changed, you will. There's no one about the place same as when you left, naught but me and your old aunt. I'll go and tell her that you've come. She won't be seeing you, but she'll let you stay right enough. She always did say, if you was to come back, you should stay, but she'd never set eyes on you or speak to you again. The old man placed a mug of beer on the table in front of Stoner and then hobbled away down a long passage. 
the drizzle of rain had changed to a furious lashing downpour which beat violently against door and windows the wanderer thought with a shudder of what the seashore must look like under this drenching rainfall with night beating down on all sides he finished the food and beer and sat numbly waiting for the return of his strange host as the minutes ticked by on the grandfather clock in the corner a new hope began to flicker and grow in the young man's mind it was merely the expansion of his former craving for food and a few minutes rest into a longing to find a night's shelter under this seemingly hospitable roof a clattering of footsteps down the passage heralded the old farm servant's return the old missus won't see you master tom but she says you are to stay tis right enough seeing the farm will be yours when she be put under the earth i've had a fire lit in your room master tom and the maids has put fresh sheets on to the bed you'll find naught changed up there maybe you'm tired and would like to go there now without a word martin stoner rose heavily to his feet and followed his ministering angel along a passage up a short creaking stair along another passage and into a large room lit with a cheerfully blazing fire there was but little furniture plain old-fashioned and good of its kind a stuffed squirrel in a case and a wall calendar of four years ago were about the only symptoms of decoration but stoner had eyes for little else than the bed and could scarce wait to tear his clothes off before rolling in a luxury of weariness into its comfortable depths the hounds of fate seemed to have checked for a brief moment in the cold light of morning stoner laughed mirthlessly as he slowly realized the position in which he found himself perhaps he might snatch a bit of breakfast on the strength of his likeness to this other missing ne'er-do-well and get safely away before anyone discovered the fraud that had been thrust on him in the room downstairs he found the bent old man ready with a dish of bacon and fried eggs for master tom's breakfast while a hard-faced elderly maid brought in a teapot and poured him out a cup of tea as he sat at the table a small spaniel came up and made friendly advances tis old bowker's pup explained the old man whom the hard-faced maid had addressed as george she was main fond of you never seemed the same after you went away to australia she died about a year agone tis her pup stoner found it difficult to regret her decease as a witness for identification she would have left something to be desired you'll go for a ride master tom was the next startling proposition that came from the old man we've a nice little roan cob that goes well in saddle old biddy is getting a bit up in years though er goes well still but i'll have the little roan saddled and brought round to door i, I i've got no riding things stammered the castaway almost laughing as he looked down at his one suit of well-worn clothes master tom said the old man earnestly almost with an offended air all your things is just as you left them a bit of airing before the fire and they'll be all right twill be a bit of a distraction like a little riding and wild fowling now and again you'll find the folk around here has hard and bitter minds towards you they hasn't forgotten nor forgiven no one'll come nigh you so you'd best get what distraction you can with horse and dog they're good company too old george hobbled away to give his orders and stoner feeling more than ever like one in a dream went upstairs to inspect master tom's wardrobe a ride was one of the pleasures dearest to his heart and there was some protection against immediate discovery of his imposture in the thought that none of tom's aforetime companions were likely to favour him with a close inspection as the interloper thrust himself into some tolerably well-fitting riding cords he wondered vaguely what manner of misdeed the genuine tom had committed to set the whole countryside against him the thud of quick eager boots on damp earth cut short his speculations the roan cob had been brought up to the side door 
Talk of beggars on horseback, thought Stoner to himself, as he trotted rapidly along the muddy lanes where he had tramped yesterday as a down-at-heel outcast, and then he flung reflection indolently aside and gave himself up to the pleasure of a smart canter along the turf-grown side of a level stretch of road. At an open gateway he checked his pace to allow two carts to turn into a field. The lads driving the carts found time to give him a prolonged stare, and as he passed on he heard an excited voice call out, "'Tis Tom Prike! I knowed him at once! Showed yourself here again, is he?' Evidently the likeness which had imposed at close quarters on a doddering old man was good enough to mislead younger eyes at a short distance. In the course of his ride he met with ample evidence to confirm the statement that local folk had neither forgotten nor forgiven the bygone crime which had come to him as a legacy from the absent Tom. Scowling looks, mutterings, and nudgings greeted him whenever he chanced upon human beings. Bowker's pup, trotting placidly by his side, seemed the one element of friendliness in a hostile world. As he dismounted at the side door, he caught a fleeting glimpse of a gaunt, elderly woman peering at him from behind the curtain of an upper window. Evidently this was his aunt by adoption. Over the ample midday meal that stood in readiness for him, Stoner was able to review the possibilities of his extraordinary situation. The real Tom, after four years of absence, might suddenly turn up at the farm, or a letter might come from him at any moment. Again, in the character of heir to the farm, the false Tom might be called on to sign documents, which would be an embarrassing predicament. Or a relative might arrive, who would not imitate the aunt's attitude of aloofness. All these things would mean ignominious exposure. On the other hand, the alternative was the open sky and the muddy lanes that led down to the sea. The farm offered him, at any rate, a temporary refuge from destitution. Farming was one of the many things he had tried, and he would be able to do a certain amount of work in return for the hospitality to which he was so little entitled. "'Will you have cold pork for your supper?' asked the hard-faced maid, as she cleared the table. "'Or will you have it otted up?' "'Hot, with onions,' said Stoner. It was the only time in his life that he had made a rapid decision, and as he gave the order he knew that he meant to stay. Stoner kept rigidly to those portions of the house which seemed to have been allotted to him by a tacit treaty of delimitation. When he took part in the farm work, it was as one who worked under orders and never initiated them. Old George, the roan cob, and Bowker's pup were his sole companions in a world that was otherwise frostily silent and hostile. Of the mistress of the farm he saw nothing. Once, when he knew she had gone forth to church, he made a furtive visit to the farm parlour, in an endeavour to glean some fragmentary knowledge of the young man whose place he had usurped, and whose ill repute he had fastened on himself. There were many photographs hung on the walls, or stuck in prim frames, but the likeness he sought for was not among them. At last, in an album thrust out of sight, he came across what he wanted. There was a whole series labelled Tom, a podgy child of three in a fantastic frock, an awkward boy of about twelve, holding a cricket bat as though he loathed it, a rather good-looking youth of eighteen with very smooth, evenly parted hair, and finally a young man with a somewhat surly daredevil expression. At this last portrait Stoner looked with particular interest. The likeness to himself was unmistakable. From the lips of old George, who was garrulous enough on most subjects, he tried again and again to learn something of the nature of the offence, which shut him off as a creature to be shunned and hated by his fellow men. "'What do the folk around here say about me?' he asked one day as they were walking home from an outlying field. The old man shook his head. "'They be bitter again, you mortal bitter. Ay, tis a sad business, a sad business.' And never could he be got to say anything more enlightening. 
on a clear frosty evening a few days before the festival of christmas stoner stood in a corner of the orchard which commanded a wide view of the countryside here and there he could see the twinkling dots of lamp or candle glow which told of human homes where the goodwill and jollity of the season held their sway behind him lay the grim silent farmhouse where no one ever laughed where even a quarrel would have seemed cheerful as he turned to look at the long grey front of the gloom-shadowed building a door opened and old george came hurriedly forth stoner heard his adopted name called in a tone of strained anxiety instantly he knew that something untoward had happened and with a quick revulsion of outlook his sanctuary became in his eyes a place of peace and contentment from which he dreaded to be driven master tom said the old man in a hoarse whisper you must slip away quiet from here for a few days michael lay is back in the village and he swears to shoot you if he can come across you he'll do it too there's murder in the look of him get away under cover of night tis only for a week or so he won't be here longer but but where am i to go stammered stoner who had caught the infection of the old man's obvious terror go right away along the coast to punchford and keep hid there when michael's safe gone i'll ride the roan over to the green dragon at punchford when you see the cob stabled at the green dragon tis a sign you may come back again but began stoner hesitatingly tis all right for money said the other the old missus agrees you'd best do as i say and she's given me this the old man produced three sovereigns and some odd silver stoner felt more of a cheat than ever as he stole away that night from the back gate of the farm with the old woman's money in his pocket old george and bowker's pup stood watching him a silent farewell from the yard he could scarcely fancy that he would ever come back and he felt a throb of compunction for those two humble friends who would wait wistfully for his return some day perhaps the real tom would come back and there would be wild wonderment among those simple farm folks as to the identity of the shadowy guest they had harboured under their roof for his own fate he felt no immediate anxiety three pounds goes but little way in the world where there is nothing behind it but to a man who has counted his exchequer in pennies it seems a good starting point fortune had done him a whimsically kind turn when last he trod these lanes as a hopeless adventurer and there might yet be a chance of his finding some work and making a fresh start as he got further from the farm his spirits rose higher there was a sense of relief in regaining once more his lost identity and ceasing to be the uneasy ghost of another he scarcely bothered to speculate about the implacable enemy who had dropped from nowhere into his life since that life was now behind him one unreal item the more made little difference for the first time for many months he began to hum a careless light-hearted refrain then there stepped out from the shadow of an overhanging oak tree a man with a gun there was no need to wonder who he might be the moonlight falling on his white set face revealed a glare of human hate such as stoner in the ups and downs of his wanderings had never seen before he sprang aside in a wild effort to break through the hedge that bordered the lane but the tough branches held him fast the hounds of fate had waited for him in those narrow lanes, and this time they were not to be denied. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of The Chronicles of Clovis – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Recessional – Clovis sat in the hottest zone but two of a Turkish bath, alternately inert in statuesque contemplation and rapidly manoeuvring a fountain pen over the pages of a notebook. "'Don't interrupt me with your childish prattle,' he observed to Bertie Van Tarn, who had slung himself languidly into a neighbouring chair and looked conversationally inclined. "'I'm writing deathless verse,' Bertie looked interested." i say what a boon you would be to portrait painters 
if you really got to be notorious as a poetry writer, if they couldn't get your likeness hung in the academy as Clovis Sangriel Esquire at work on his latest poem, they could slip you in as a study of the nude or Orpheus descending into German Street. They always complain that modern dress handicaps them, whereas a towel and a fountain pen... It was Mrs. Packletide's suggestion that I should write this thing, said Clovis, ignoring the bypaths to fame that Bertie von Tarn was pointing out to him. You see, Luna Bimberton had a coronation ode accepted by the New Infancy, a paper that has been started with the idea of making the New Age seem elderly and hidebound. So clever of you, dear Luna, the Packletide remarked when she had read it. Of course, anyone could write a coronation ode, but no one else would have thought of doing it. Luna protested that these things were extremely difficult to do, and gave us to understand that they were more or less the province of a gifted few. Now, the Packletide has been rather decent to me in many ways. A sort of financial ambulance, you know, that carries you off the field when you're hard hit, which is a frequent occurrence with me and I've no use whatever for Luna Bimberton. So I chipped in and said I could turn out that sort of stuff by the square yard if I gave my mind to it. Luna said I couldn't, and we got bets on. And between you and me, I think the money's fairly safe. Of course, one of the conditions of the wager is that the thing has to be published in something or other, local newspapers barred. But Mrs. Packletide has endeared herself by many little acts of thoughtfulness to the editor of the Smoky Chimney. So if I can hammer out anything at all approaching the level of the usual ode output, we ought to be all right. So far I'm getting along so comfortably that I begin to be afraid that I must be one of the gifted few. It's rather late in the day for a coronation ode, isn't it? said Bertie. Of course, said Clovis. This is going to be a Durbar recessional, the sort of thing that you can keep by you for all time if you want to. Now I understand your choice of a place to write it in, said Bertie von Tarn, with the air of one who has suddenly unravelled a hitherto obscure problem. You want to get the local temperature. I came here to get freedom from the inane interruptions of the mentally deficient, said Clovis. But it seems I asked too much of fate. Bertie von Tarn prepared to use his towel as a weapon of precision, but reflecting that he had a good deal of unprotected coastline himself, and that Clovis was equipped with a fountain pen as well as a towel, he relapsed pacifically into the depths of his chair. May one hear extract from the immortal work? he asked. I promise that nothing that I hear now shall prejudice me against borrowing a copy of the smoky chimney at the right moment. It's rather like casting pearls into a trough, remarked Clovis pleasantly, but I don't mind reading you bits of it. It begins with a general dispersal of the Durbar participants. Back to their homes in Himalayan heights, the stale, pale elephants of Kutch Behar, roll like great galleons on a tideless sea. I don't believe Kutch Behar is anywhere near the Himalayan region, interrupted Bertie. You ought to have an atlas on hand when you do this sort of thing. And why stale and pale? After the late hours and the excitement, of course, said Clovis, and I said that their homes were in the Himalayas. You can have Himalayan elephants in Kutch Behar, I suppose, just as you have Irish-bred horses running at Ascot. You said they were going back to the Himalayas, objected Bertie. Well, they would naturally be sent home to recuperate. It's the usual thing out there to turn elephants loose in the hills, just as we put horses out to grass in this country. Clovis could at least flatter himself that he had infused some of the reckless splendour of the East into his mendacity. Is it all going to be in blank verse? asked the critic. Of course not. Durbar comes at the end of the fourth line. That seems to be so cowardly. However, it explains why you pitched on Kutch Behar. There is more connection between geographical place names and poetical inspiration than is generally recognized, 
one of the chief reasons why there are so few really good poems about russia in our language is that you can't possibly get a rhyme to names like smolensk and tobolsk and minsk clovis spoke with the authority of one who has tried of course you could rhyme omsk with tomsk he continued in fact they seem to be there for that purpose but the public wouldn't stand that sort of thing indefinitely the public will stand a good deal said bertie malevolently and so small a proportion of it knows russian that you could always have an explanatory footnote asserting that the last three letters in smolensk are not pronounced it's quite as believable as your statement about putting elephants out to grass in the himalayan range i've got rather a nice bit resumed clovis with unruffled serenity giving an evening scene on the outskirts of a jungle village where the coiled cobra in the gloaming gloats and prowling panthers stalk the wary goats there is practically no gloaming in tropical countries said bertie indulgently but i like the masterly reticence with which you treat the cobra's motive for gloating the unknown is proverbially the uncanny i can picture nervous readers of the smoky chimney keeping the light turned on in their bedrooms all night out of sheer sickening uncertainty as to what the cobra might have been gloating about cobras gloat naturally said clovis just as wolves are always ravening from mere force of habit even after they've hopelessly overeaten themselves i've got a fine bit of colour painting later on he added where i describe the dawn coming up over the brahmaputra river the amber dawn dredged east with sun shafts kissed stained sanguine apricot and amethyst o'er the washed emerald of the mango groves hangs in a mist of opalescent mauves while painted parrot flights impinge the haze with scarlet chalcedon and chrysoprase i've never seen the dawn come up over the brahma putra river said bertie so i can't say if it's a good description of the event but it sounds more like an account of an extensive jewel robbery anyhow the parrots give a good useful touch of local colour i suppose you've introduced some tigers into the scenery an indian landscape would have rather a bare unfinished look without a tiger or two in the middle distance i've got a hen tiger somewhere in the poem said clovis hunting through his notes here she is the tawny tigress mid the tangled teak drags to her purring cubs enraptured ears the harsh death rattle in the peafowl's beak a jungle lullaby of blood and tears bertie von tarn rose hurriedly from his recumbent position and made for the glass door leading into the next compartment i think your idea of home life in the jungle is perfectly horrid he said the cobra was sinister enough but the improvised rattle in the tiger nursery is the limit if you're going to make me turn hot and cold all over i may as well go into the steam-room at once just listen to this line said clovis it would make the reputation of any ordinary poet and overhead the pendulum patient punka parent of stillborn breeze most of your readers will think punka is a kind of iced drink or half time at polo said bertie and disappeared into the steam the smoky chimney duly published the recessional but it proved to be its swan song for the paper never attained to another issue luna bimberton gave up her intention of attending the durbar and went into a nursing home on the sussex downs nervous breakdown after a particularly strenuous season was the usually accepted explanation but there are three or four people who know that she never really recovered from the dawn breaking over the Brahma Putra River? End of chapter twenty four.
Chapter twenty five of the Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Wales. Chapter twenty five A Matter of Sentiment. It was the eve of the great race, and scarcely a member of Lady Susan's house party had as yet a single bet on. It was one of those unsatisfactory years when one horse held a commanding market position, not by reason of any general belief in its crushing superiority, but because it was extremely difficult to pitch on any other candidate to whom to pin one's faith. Peradventure, too, was the favorite, not in the sense of being a popular fancy, but by virtue of a lack of confidence in any one of his rather undistinguished rivals. The brains of clubland were much exercised in seeking out possible merit, where none was very obvious to the naked intelligence, and the house-party at Lady Susan's was possessed by the same uncertainty and irresolution that infected wider circles. "'It is just the time for bringing off a good coup,' said Bertie Van Tan. "'Undoubtedly, but with what?' demanded Clovis for the twentieth time." The women of the party were just as keenly interested in the matter, and just as helplessly perplexed. Even the mother of Clovis, who usually got good racing information from her dressmaker, confessed herself fancy-free on this occasion. Colonel Drake, who was professor of military history at a minor cramming establishment, was the only person who had a definite selection for the event but as his choice varied every three hours he was worse than useless as an inspired guide the crowning difficulty of the problem was that it could only be fitfully and furtively discussed lady susan disapproved of racing she disapproved of many things some people went as far as to say that she disapproved of most things disapproval was to her what neuralgia and fancy needlework are to many other women she disapproved of early morning tea and auction bridge, of skiing and the two-step, of the Russian ballet and the Chelsea Arts Club ball, of the French policy in Morocco and the British policy everywhere. It was not that she was particularly strict or narrow in her views of life, but she had been the eldest sister of a large family of self-indulgent children, and her particular form of indulgence had consisted in openly disapproving of the foibles of the others. Unfortunately, the hobby had grown up with her. As she was rich, influential, and very, very kind, most people were content to count their early tea as well lost on her behalf still the necessity for hurriedly dropping the discussion of an enthralling topic and suppressing all mention of it during her presence on the scene was an affliction at a moment like the present when time was slipping away and indecision was the prevailing note after a lunch-time of rather strangled and uneasy conversation clovis managed to get most of the party together at the further end of the kitchen gardens on the pretext of admiring the himalayan pheasants he had made an important discovery motkin the butler who as clovis expressed it had grown prematurely gray in lady susan's service added to his other excellent qualities an intelligent interest in matters connected with the turf. On the subject of the forthcoming race he was not illuminating, except in so far that he shared the prevailing unwillingness to see a winner in Peradventure too. But where he outshone all the members of the house party was in the fact that he had a second cousin, who was head stable lad at the neighboring racing establishment, and usually gifted with much inside information as to private form and possibilities. Only the fact of her ladyship having taken it into her head to invite a house party for the last weekend of May had prevented Mr. Motkin from paying a visit of consultation to his relative with respect to the big race. There was still time to cycle over if he could get leave of absence for the afternoon on some specious excuse. "'Let's jolly well hope he does,' said Bertie Van Tan. "'Under the circumstances a second cousin is almost as useful as second sight.' the stable ought to know something if knowledge is to be found anywhere said mrs packletide hopefully 
"'I expect you'll find he'll echo my fancy for motorboat,' said Colonel Drake. At this moment the subject had to be hastily dropped. Lady Susan bore down upon them, leaning on the arm of Clovis's mother, to whom she was confiding the fact that she disapproved of the craze for Pekingese spaniels. It was the third thing she had found time to disapprove of since lunch, without counting her silent and permanent disapproval of the way Clovis's mother did her hair. "'We have been admiring the Himalayan pheasants,' said Mrs. Packletide suavely. "'They went off to a bird show at Nottingham early this morning,' said Lady Susan, with the air of one who disapproves of hasty and ill-considered lying." their uh, house i mean such perfect roosting arrangements and all so clean resumed mrs packletide with an increased glow of enthusiasm the odious bertie van ton was murmuring audible prayers for mrs packletide's ultimate estrangement from the paths of falsehood i hope you don't mind dinner being a quarter of an hour late to-night said lady susan motkin has had an urgent summons to go and see a sick relative this afternoon he wanted to bicycle there but i am sending him in the motor how very kind of you of course we don't mind dinner being put off the assurances came with unanimous and hearty sincerity at the dinner-table that night an undercurrent of furtive curiosity directed itself towards motkin's impassive countenance one or two of the guests almost expected to find a slip of paper concealed in their napkins, bearing the name of the second cousin's selection. They had not long to wait. As the butler went round with the murmured question, Sherry, he added in an even lower tone the cryptic words, Better not. Mrs. Packletide gave a start of alarm and refused the sherry there seemed some sinister suggestion in the butler's warning, as though her hostess had suddenly become addicted to the Borgia habit. A moment later the explanation flashed on her that Better Not was the name of one of the runners in the big race. Clovis was already penciling it on his cuff, and Colonel Drake, in his turn, was signaling to every one in hoarse whispers and dumb show the fact that he had all along fancied B.N. Early next morning a sheaf of telegrams went townward, representing the market commands of the house party and servants' hall. It was a wet afternoon, and most of Lady Susan's guests hung about the hall, waiting apparently for the appearance of tea, though it was scarcely yet due. The advent of a telegram quickened every one into a flutter of expectancy. The page who brought the telegram to Clovis waited with unusual alertness to know if there might be an answer. Clovis read the message and gave an exclamation of annoyance no bad news i hope said lady susan every one else knew that the news was not good it's only the result of the derby he blurted out sadawa won an utter outsider sadawa exclaimed lady susan you don't say so how remarkable it's the first time i've ever backed a horse in fact i disapprove of horse racing but just for once in a way i put money on this horse and it's gone and won may i ask said mrs packletide amid the general silence why you put your money on this particular horse none of the sporting prophets mentioned it as having an outside chance well said lady susan you may laugh at me but it was the name that attracted me you see i was always mixed up with the franco-german war i was married on the day that the war was declared and my eldest child was born the day that peace was signed so anything connected with the war has always interested me and when i saw there was a horse running in the derby called after one of the battles in the franco-german war i said i must put some money on it for once in a way though i disapprove of racing and it's actually won there was a general groan no one groaned more deeply than the professor of military history end of chapter twenty five Chapter 26 of The Chronicles of Clovis 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. Chapter 26. The Secret Sin of Septimus Brope. Who and what is Mr. Brope? demanded the aunt of Clovis suddenly. Mrs. Riversedge, who had been snipping off the heads of defunct roses and thinking of nothing in particular, sprang hurriedly to mental attention. She was one of those old-fashioned hostesses who considered that one ought to know something about one's guests, and that the something ought to be to their credit. I believe he comes from Leighton Buzzard, she observed by way of preliminary explanation. In these days of rapid and convenient travel, said Clovis, who was dispersing a colony of green fly with visitations of cigarette smoke, to come from Leighton Buzzard does not necessarily denote any great strength of character it might only mean mere restlessness now if he had left it under a cloud or as a protest against the incurable and heartless frivolity of its inhabitants that would tell us something about the man and his mission in life what does he do pursued mrs troyle magisterially he edits the cathedral monthly said her hostess and he's enormously learned about memorial brasses and transepts and the influence of byzantine worship on modern liturgy and all those sort of things perhaps he is just a little bit heavy and immersed in one range of subjects but it takes all sorts to make a good house party you know you don't find him too dull do you dullness i could overlook said the aunt of clovis what i cannot forgive is his making love to my maid my dear mrs troyle gasped the hostess what an extraordinary idea i assure you mr brooke would not dream of doing such a thing his dreams are a matter of indifference to me for all i care his slumbers may be one long indiscretion of unsuitable erotic advances in which the entire servants hall may be involved but in his waking hours he shall not make love to my maid it's no use of arguing about it i'm firm on the point but you must be mistaken persisted mrs riversedge mr brope would be the last person to do such a thing he is the first person to do such a thing as far as my information goes and if i have any voice in the matter he certainly shall be the last of course i am not referring to respectably intentioned lovers i simply cannot think that a man who writes so charmingly and informingly about transepts and byzantine influences would behave in such an unprincipled manner said mrs riversedge what evidence have you that he's doing anything of the sort i don't want to doubt your word of course but we mustn't be too ready to condemn him unheard must we whether we condemn him or not he has certainly not been unheard he has the room next to my dressing-room and on two occasions when i dare say he thought i was absent i have plainly heard him announcing through the wall i love you florey those partition walls upstairs are very thin one can almost hear a watch ticking in the next room is your maid called florence her name is florinda what an extraordinary name to give a maid i did not give it to her she arrived in my service already christened what i mean is said mrs riversedge that when i get maids with unsuitable names i call them jane they soon get used to it an excellent plan said the aunt of clovis coldly unfortunately i have got used to being called jane myself it happens to be my name she cut short mrs riversedge's flood of apologies by abruptly remarking the question is not whether i am to call my maid florinda but whether mr brope is to be permitted to call her florrie i am strongly of opinion that he shall not he may have been repeating the words of some song said mrs riversedge hopefully there are lots of those sorts of silly refrains with girls names she continued turning to clovis as a possible authority on the subject you mustn't call me mary i shouldn't think of doing so 
clovis assured her in the first place i've always understood that your name was henrietta and then i hardly know you well enough to take such a liberty i mean there's a song with that refrain hurriedly explained mrs riversedge and there's rhoda rhoda kept a pagoda and maisie is a daisy and heaps of others certainly it doesn't sound like mr Burke to be singing such songs but i think we ought to give him the benefit of the doubt i have already done so said mrs troyle until further evidence came my way she shut her lips with the resolute finality of one who enjoys the blessed certainty of being implored to open them again further evidence exclaimed her hostess do tell me as i was coming upstairs after breakfast mr Brope was just passing my room in the most natural way in the world a piece of paper dropped out of a packet that he held in his hand and fluttered to the ground just at my door i was going to call out to him you've dropped something and then for some reason i held back and didn't show myself till he was safely in his room you see it occurred to me that i was very seldom in my room just at that hour and that florinda was almost always there tidying up things about that time so i picked up that innocent-looking piece of paper mrs troyle paused again with the self-applauding air of one who has detected an asp lurking in an apple charlotte mrs riversedge snipped vigorously at the nearest rosebush incidentally decapitating a viscountess folkstone that was just coming into bloom what was on the paper she asked just the words in pencil i love you florrie and then underneath crossed out with a faint line but perfectly plain to read meet me in the garden by the yew there is a yew tree at the bottom of the garden admitted mrs riversedge at any rate he appears to be truthful commented clovis to think that a scandal of this sort should be going on under my roof said mrs riversedge indignantly i wonder why it is that scandal seems so much worse under a roof observed clovis i have always regarded it as proof of the superior delicacy of the cat tribe that it conducts most of its scandals above the slates now i come to think of it resumed mrs riversedge there are things about mr Brope that i have never been able to account for his income for instance he only gets two hundred a year as editor of the cathedral monthly and i know that his people are quite poor and he hasn't any private means yet he manages to afford a flat somewhere in westminster and he goes abroad to bruges and those sorts of places every year and always dresses well and gives quite nice luncheon parties in the season you can't do all that on two hundred a year can you does he write for any other papers queried mrs troyle no you see he specializes so entirely on liturgy and ecclesiastical architecture that his field is rather restricted he once tried the sporting and dramatic with an article on church edifices in famous fox-hunting centres but it wasn't considered of sufficient general interest to be accepted no i don't see how he can support himself in his present style merely by what he writes perhaps he sells various transepts to american enthusiasts suggested clovis how could you sell a transept said mrs riversedge such a thing would be impossible whatever he may do to eke out his income interrupted mrs troyle he is certainly not going to fill in his leisure moments by making love to my maid of course not agreed her hostess that must be put a stop to at once but i don't quite know what we ought to do you might put a barbed wire entanglement round the yew tree as a precautionary measure said clovis i don't think that the disagreeable situation that has arisen is improved by flippancy said mrs riversedge a good maid is a treasure i am sure i don't know what i should do without florinda admitted mrs troyle she understands my hair i've long ago given up trying to do anything with it myself i regard one's hair as i regard husbands as long as one is seen together in public one's private divergences don't matter surely that was the luncheon gong 
septimus brope and clovis had the smoking-room to themselves after lunch the former seemed restless and preoccupied the latter quietly observant what is a lorry asked septimus suddenly i don't mean the thing on wheels of course i know what that is but isn't there a bird with a name like that the larger form of a lorikeet i fancy it's a lorry with one r said clovis lazily in which case it's no good to you septimus broke stared in some astonishment how do you mean no good to me he asked with more than a trace of uneasiness in his voice won't rhyme with flory explained clovis briefly septimus sat upright in his chair with unmistakable alarm on his face how did you find out i mean how did you know i was trying to get a rhyme to flory he asked sharply i didn't know said clovis i only guessed when you wanted to turn the prosaic lorry of commerce into a feathered poem flitting through the verdure of a tropical forest i knew you must be working up a sonnet and flory was the only female name that suggested itself as rhyming with lorry septimus still looked uneasy i believe you know more he said clovis laughed quietly but said nothing how much do you know septimus asked desperately the yew tree in the garden said clovis there i felt certain i dropped it somewhere but you must have guessed something before look here you have surprised my secret you won't give me away will you it is nothing to be ashamed of but it wouldn't do for the editor of the cathedral monthly to go in openly for that sort of thing would it well i suppose not admitted clovis you see continued septimus i get quite a decent lot of money out of it i could never live in the style i do on what i get as editor of the cathedral monthly clovis was even more startled than septimus had been earlier in the conversation but he was better skilled in repressing surprise do you mean to say you get money out of flory he asked not out of flory as yet said septimus in fact i don't mind saying that i'm having a good deal of trouble over flory but there are a lot of others clovis's cigarette went out that is very interesting he said slowly and then with septimus brope's next words illumination dawned on him there are heaps of others for instance coral with the lips of coral you and i will never quarrel that was one of my earliest successes and it still brings me in royalties and then there is esmeralda when i first beheld her and fair teresa how i love to please her both of those have been fairly popular and there is one rather dreadful one continued septimus fleshing deep carmine which has brought me in more money than any of the others lively little lucy with her naughty nez retrousse of course i loathe the whole lot of them in fact i'm rapidly becoming something of a woman-hater under their influence but i can't afford to disregard the financial aspect of matter and at the same time you can understand that my position as an authority on ecclesiastical architecture and liturgical subjects would be weakened if not altogether ruined if it once got about that i was the author of cora with the lips of coral and all the rest of them clovis had recovered sufficiently to ask in a sympathetic if rather unsteady voice what was the special trouble with flory i can't get her into lyric shape try as i will said septimus mournfully you see one has to work in a lot of sentimental sugary compliment with a catchy rhyme and a certain amount of personal biography or prophecy they've all of them got to have a long string of past successes recorded about them or else you've got to foretell blissful things about them and yourself in the future for instance there is dainty little girly mavis she is such a rare avis all the money i can save is all to be for mavis mine it goes to a sickening namby famby waltz tune and for months nothing else was sung and hummed in blackpool and other popular centres this time clovis's self-control broke down badly please excuse me he gurgled but i can't help it when i remember 
the awful solemnity of that article of yours that you so kindly read us last night on the coptic church in its relation to early christian worship septimus groaned you see how it would be he said as soon as people knew me to be the author of that miserable sentimental twaddle all respect for the serious labors of my life would be gone i dare say i know more about memorial brasses than any one living in fact i hope one day to publish a monograph on the subject but i should be pointed out everywhere as the man whose ditties were in the mouths of nigger minstrels along the entire coastline of our island home can you wonder that i positively hate florrie all the time that i'm trying to grind out sugar-coated rhapsodies about her why not give free play to your emotions and be brutally abusive an uncomplimentary refrain would have an instant success as a novelty if you were sufficiently outspoken i've never thought of that said septimus and i'm afraid i couldn't break away from the habit of fulsome adulation and suddenly change my style you needn't change your style in the least said clovis merely reverse the sentiment and keep to the inane phraseology of the thing if you'll do the body of the song i'll knock off the refrain which is the thing that principally matters i believe i shall charge half shares in the royalties and throw in my silence as to your guilty secret in the eyes of the world you shall still be the man who has devoted his life to the study of transepts and byzantine ritual only sometimes in the long winter evenings when the wind howls drearily down the chimney and the rain beats against the windows i shall think of you as the author of cora with the lips of coral of course if in sheer gratitude at my silence you like to take me for a much-needed holiday to the adriatic or somewhere equally interesting paying all expenses i shouldn't dream of refusing later in the afternoon clovis found his aunt and mrs riversedge indulging in gentle exercise in the jacobean garden i've spoken to mr brope about f he announced how splendid of you what did he say came in a quick chorus from the two ladies he was quite frank and straightforward with me when he saw that i knew his secret said clovis and it seems that his intentions were quite serious if slightly unsuitable i tried to show him the impracticability of the course that he was following he said he wanted to be understood and he seemed to think that florinda would excel in that requirement but i pointed out that there were probably dozens of delicately nurtured pure-hearted young english girls who would be capable of understanding him while florinda was the only person in the world who understood my aunt's hair that rather weighed with him for he's not really a selfish animal if you take him in the right way and when i appeal to the memory of his happy childish days spent amid the daisy fields of leighton buzzard i suppose daisies do grow there he was obviously affected anyhow he gave me his word that he would put florinda absolutely out of his mind and he has agreed to go for a short trip abroad as the best distraction for his thoughts i am going with him as far as ragusa if my aunt should wish to give me a really nice scarf pin to be chosen by myself as a small recognition of the very considerable service i have done her i shouldn't dream of refusing i'm not one of those who think that because one is abroad one can go about dressed anyhow a few weeks later in blackpool and places where they sing the following refrain held undisputed sway how you bore me florrie with those eyes of vacant blue you'll be very sorry florrie if i marry you though i'm easy going florrie this i swear is true i'll throw you down a quarry florrie if i marry you End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of the Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Wales. Chapter twenty seven Ministers of Grace. Although he was scarcely yet out of his teens, the Duke of Skaw was already marked out as a personality widely differing from others of his caste and period. Not in externals, therein he conformed correctly to type 
His hair was faintly reminiscent of Oubigon, and at the other end of him his shoes exhaled the right soupçon of harness-room. His socks compelled one's attention without losing one's respect and his attitude in repose had just that suggestion of Whistler's mother so becoming in the really young. It was within that the trouble lay, if trouble it could be accounted, which marked him apart from his fellows. The Duke was religious. Not in any of the ordinary senses of the word. He took small heed of high church or evangelical standpoints. He stood outside of all the movements and missions and cults and crusades of the day, uncaring and uninterested. Yet in a mystical practical way of his own, which had served him unscathed and unshaken through the fickle years of boyhood, he was intensely and intensively religious. His family were naturally, though unobtrusively, distressed about it. "'I am so afraid it may affect his bridge,' said his mother." The Duke sat in a pennyworth of chair in St. James Park, listening to the pessimisms of Bell Turbot, who reviewed the existing political situation from the gloomiest of standpoints. "'Where I think you political spade-workers are so silly,' said the Duke, "'is in the misdirection of your efforts. You spend thousands of pounds of money, and heaven knows how much dynamic force of brain-power and personal energy, in trying to elect or displace this or that man, whereas you could gain your end so much more simply by making use of the men as you find them. If they don't suit your purpose as they are, transform them into something more satisfactory." "'Do you uh, refer to hypnotic suggestion?' asked Bell Turbot, with the air of one who is being trifled with. "'Nothing of the sort. Do you understand what I mean by the verb to Kopenek? That is to say, to replace an authority by a spurious imitation that would carry just as much weight for the moment as the displaced original. The advantage, of course, being that the Kopenek replica would do what you wanted, whereas the original does what seems best in its own eyes. "'I suppose every public man has a double, if not two or three, said Belturbet. "'But it would be a pretty hard task to Kopenek a whole bunch of them and keep the originals out of the way. "'Well, there have been instances in European history of highly successful Kopenekery, said the Duke dreamily. Oh, of course, there have been false Dimitris and Perkin Warbecks who imposed on the world for a time, assented Bell Turbot, but they personated people who were dead or safely out of the way. That was a comparatively simple matter. It would be far easier to pass oneself off as dead Hannibal than as living Haldane, for instance. I was thinking, said the Duke, of the most famous case of all, the angel who Copenhagen King Robert of Sicily with such brilliant results. Just imagine what an advantage it would be to have angels deputizing, to use a horrible but convenient word, for Quinston and Lord Hugo Sizzle, for example. How much smoother the parliamentary machine would work than at present. Now you're talking nonsense, said de Belturbet. Angels don't exist nowadays, at least not in that way. So what is the use of dragging them into a serious discussion? It's merely silly. If you talk to me like that, I shall just do it, said the Duke. Do what? asked Belturbet. There were times when his young friend's uncanny remarks rather frightened him. I shall summon angelic forces to take over some of the more troublesome personalities of our public life, and I shall send the ousted originals into temporary retirement in suitable animal organisms. It's not every one who would have the knowledge or the power necessary to bring such a thing off. Oh, stop that inane rubbish, said Bell Turbot angrily. It's getting wearisome. Here's Quinston coming. He added, as there approached along the almost deserted path the well-known figure of a young cabinet minister, whose personality evoked a curious mixture of public interest and unpopularity. "'Hurry along, my dear man,' said the young duke to the minister, who had given him a condescending nod. "'Your time is running short,' he continued in a provocative strain. "'The whole inept crowd of you will shortly be swept away into the world's waste-paper basket.' 
you poor little strawberry-leafed nonentity said the minister checking himself for a moment in his stride and rolling out his words spasmodically who is going to sweep us away i should like to know the voting masses are on our side and all the ability and administrative talent is on our side too no power of earth or heaven is going to move us from our place till we choose to quit it no power of earth or bell turbot saw with bulging eyes a sudden void where a moment earlier had been a cabinet minister a void emphasized rather than relieved by the presence of a puffed-out bewildered-looking sparrow which hopped about for a moment in a dazed fashion and then fell to a violent cheeping and scolding if we could understand sparrow language said the duke serenely i fancy we should hear something infinitely worse than strawberry-leafed nonentity but good heavens eugene said belturbet hoarsely what has become of why there he is how on earth did he get there and he pointed with a shaking finger towards a semblance of the vanished minister which approached once more along the unfrequented path the duke laughed it is quinston to all outward appearance he said composedly but i fancy you will find on closer investigation that it is an angel understudy of the real article the angel quinston greeted them with a friendly smile how beastly happy you two look sitting there he said wistfully i don't suppose you'd care to change places with poor little us replied the duke chaffingly how about poor little me said the angel modestly i've got to run about behind the wheels of popularity like a spotted dog behind a carriage getting all the dust and trying to look as if i was an important part of the machine i must seem a perfect fool to you onlookers sometimes i think you are a perfect angel said the duke the angel that had been quinston smiled and passed on his way pursued across the breadth of the horse guards parade by a tiresome little sparrow that cheeped incessantly and furiously at him that's only the beginning said the duke complacently i've made it operative with all of them irrespective of parties belturbet made no coherent reply he was engaged in feeling his pulse the duke fixed his attention with some interest on a black swan that was swimming with haughty stiff-necked aloofness amid the crowd of lesser waterfowl that dotted the ornamental water for all its pride of bearing something was evidently ruffling and enraging it in its way it seemed as angry and amazed as the sparrow had been at the same moment a human figure came along the pathway belturbet looked up apprehensively kedzen he whispered briefly an angel kedzen if i am not mistaken said the duke look he is talking affably to a human being that settles it a shabbily dressed lounger had accosted the man who had been viceroy in the splendid east and who still reflected in his mien some of the cold dignity of the himalayan snow peaks could you tell me sir if them white birds is storks or halbatrosses i had a argument the cold dignity thawed at once into genial friendliness those are pelicans my dear sir are you interested in birds if you would join me in a bun and a glass of milk at the stall yonder i could tell you some interesting things about indian birds right o now the hill miner for instance the two men disappeared in the direction of the bun stall chatting volubly as they went and shadowed from the other side of the railed enclosure by a black swan whose temper seemed to have reached the limit of inarticulate rage belturbet gazed in an open-mouthed wonder after the retreating couple then transferred his attention to the infuriated swan and finally turned with a look of scared comprehension at his young friend lolling unconcernedly in his chair there was no longer any room to doubt what was happening the silly talk had been translated into terrifying action i think a prairie oyster on the top of a stiffish brandy and soda might save my reason said belturbet weakly as he limped towards his club it was late in the day before he could steady his nerves sufficiently to glance at the evening papers the parliamentary report proved significant reading and confirmed the fears that he had been trying to shake off 
mr Afdabi, the chancellor whose lively controversial style endeared him to his supporters and embittered him politically speaking to his opponents had risen in his place to make an unprovoked apology for having alluded in a recent speech to certain protesting taxpayers as skulkers he had realized on reflection that they were in all probability perfectly honest in their inability to understand certain legal technicalities of the new finance laws the house had scarcely recovered from this sensation when lord hugo sizzle caused a further flutter of astonishment by going out of his way to indulge in an outspoken appreciation of the fairness loyalty and straightforwardness not only of the chancellor but of all the members of the cabinet a wit had gravely suggested moving the adjournment of the house in view of the unexpected circumstances that had arisen belturbet anxiously skimmed over a further item of news printed immediately below the parliamentary report wildcat found in an exhausted condition in palace yard now i wonder which of them he mused and then an appalling idea came to him supposing he's put them both into the same beast he hurriedly ordered another prairie oyster belturbet was known in his club as a strictly moderate drinker his consumption of alcoholic stimulants that day gave rise to considerable comment the events of the next few days were piquantly bewildering to the world at large to belturbet who knew dimly what was happening the situation was fraught with recurring alarms the old saying that in politics it's the unexpected that always happens received a justification that it had hitherto somewhat lacked and the epidemic of startling personal changes of front was not wholly confined to the realm of actual politics the eminent chocolate magnate sadbury whose antipathy to the turf and everything connected with it was a matter of general knowledge had evidently been replaced by an angel sadbury who proceeded to electrify the public by blossoming forth as an owner of racehorses giving as a reason his matured conviction that the sport was after all one which gave healthy open-air recreation to large numbers of people drawn from all classes of the community and incidentally stimulated the important industry of horse-breeding his colors chocolate and cream hoops spangled with pink stars promised to become as popular as any on the turf at the same time in order to give effect to his condemnation of the evils resulting from the spread of the gambling habit among wage-earning classes who lived for the most part from hand to mouth he suppressed all betting news and tipsters forecasts in the popular evening paper that was under his control his action received instant recognition and support from the angel proprietor of the evening news the principal rival evening halfpenny paper who forthwith issued an ukase decreeing a similar ban on betting news and in a short while the regular evening press was purged of all mention of starting prices and probable winners a considerable drop in the circulation of all these papers was the immediate result accompanied of course by a falling off in advertisement value while a crop of special betting broadsheets sprang up to supply the newly created want under their influence the betting habit became if anything rather more widely diffused than before the duke had possibly overlooked the futility of copenicking the leaders of the nation with excellently intentioned angel understudies while leaving the mass of the people in its original condition Further sensation and dislocation was caused in the press world by the sudden and dramatic rapprochement which took place between the angel editor of the Scrutator and the angel editor of the Anglian Review, who not only ceased to criticize and disparage the tone and tendencies of each other's publication, but agreed to exchange editorships for alternating periods. Here again public support was not on the side of the angels constant readers of the scrutator complained bitterly of the strong meat which was thrust upon them at fitful intervals in place of the almost vegetarian diet to which they had become confidently accustomed 
even those who were not mentally averse to strong meat as a separate course were pardonably annoyed at being supplied with it in the pages of the scrutator to be suddenly confronted with a pungent herring salad when one had attuned oneself to tea and toast or to discover a richly truffled segment of pate de foie dissembled in a bowl of bread and milk would be an experience that might upset the equanimity of the most placidly disposed mortal an equally vehement outcry rose from the regular subscribers of the anglian review who protested against being served from time to time with literary fare which no young person of sixteen could possibly want to devour in secret to take infinite precautions they complained against the juvenile perusal of such eminently innocuous literature was like reading the riot act on an uninhabited island both reviews suffered a serious falling off in circulation and influence peace hath its devastations as well as war the wives of noted public men formed another element of discomfiture which the young duke had almost entirely left out of his calculations it is sufficiently embarrassing to keep abreast of the possible wobblings and veerings round of a human husband who from the strength or weakness of his personal character may leap over or slip through the barriers which divide the parties for this reason a merciful politician usually marries late in life when he has definitely made up his mind on which side he wishes his wife to be socially valuable but these trials were as nothing compared to the bewilderment caused by the angel husbands who seemed in some cases to have revolutionized their outlook on life in the interval between breakfast and dinner without premonition or preparation of any kind and apparently without realizing the least need for subsequent explanation the temporary peace which brooded over the parliamentary situation was by no means reproduced in the home circles of the leading statesmen and politicians it had been frequently and extensively remarked of mrs x that she would try the patience of an angel now the tables were reversed and she unwittingly had an opportunity for discovering that the capacity for exasperating behaviour was not all on one side and then with the introduction of the navy estimates parliamentary peace suddenly dissolved it was the old quarrel between ministers and the opposition as to the adequacy or the reverse of the government's naval programme the angel quinston and the angel hugo sizzle contrived to keep the debates free from personalities and pinpricks but an enormous sensation was created when the elegant lackadaisical halfen halfor threatened to bring up fifty thousand stalwarts to wreck the house if the estimates were not forthwith revised on a two-power basis it was a memorable scene when he rose in his place in response to the scandalized shouts of his opponents and thundered forth gentlemen i glory in the name of apache belturbet who had made several fruitless attempts to ring up his young friend since the fateful morning in st james's park ran him to earth one afternoon at his club smooth and spruce and unruffled as ever tell me what on earth have you turned coxley coxon into belturbet asked anxiously mentioning the name of one of the pillars of unorthodoxy in the anglican church i don't fancy he believes in angels and if he finds an angel preaching orthodox sermons from his pulpit while he's been turned into a fox terrier he'll develop rabies in less than no time oh, i rather think it was a fox terrier said the duke lazily belturbet groaned heavily and sank into a chair look here you jane he whispered hoarsely having first looked well round to see that no one was within hearing range you've got to stop it consoles are jumping up and down like broncos and that speech of halfor's in the house last night has simply startled everybody out of their wits and then on top of it thistleberry what has he been saying asked the duke quickly nothing that's just what's so disturbing everyone thought it was simply inevitable that he should come out with a great epoch-making speech at this juncture and i've just seen on the tape that he has refused to address any meetings at present giving as a reason his opinion that something more than mere speech-making was wanted 
the young duke said nothing but his eyes shone with quiet exultation it's so unlike thistlebury continued belturbet at least he said suspiciously it's unlike the real thistlebury the real thistlebury is flying about somewhere as a vocally industrious lapwing said the duke calmly i expect great things of the angel thistlebury he added at this moment there was a magnetic stampede of members towards the lobby where the tape machines were ticking out some news of more than ordinary import coup d'etat in the north thistlebury seizes edinburgh castle threatens civil war unless government expands naval program in the babble which ensued bell turbot lost sight of his young friend for the best part of the afternoon he searched one likely haunt after another spurred on by the sensational posters which the evening papers were displaying broadcast over the west end general baden-baden mobilizes boy scouts another coup d'etat feared is windsor castle safe this was one of the earlier posters and was followed by one of even more sinister purport will the test match have to be postponed it was this disquieting question which brought home the real seriousness of the situation to the london public and made people wonder whether one might not pay too high a price for the advantages of party government Belturbet, questing around in the hope of finding the originator of the trouble with a vague idea of being able to induce him to restore matters to their normal human footing came across an elderly club acquaintance who dabbled extensively in some of the more sensitive market securities he was pale with indignation and his pallor deepened as a breathless newsboy dashed past with a poster inscribed premier's constituency harried by moss troopers how four sends encouraging telegram to rioters lechforth garden city threatens reprisals foreigners taking refuge in embassies and national liberal club this is devil's work he said angrily bell turbot knew otherwise at the bottom of st james's street a newspaper motor-cart which had just come rapidly along pell-mell was surrounded by a knot of eagerly talking people and for the first time that afternoon bell turbot heard expressions of relief and congratulation it displayed a placard with the welcome announcement crisis ended government gives way important expansion of naval program there seemed to be no immediate necessity for pursuing the quest of the errant duke and bell turbot turned to make his way homeward through st james's park his mind attuned to the alarums and excursions of the afternoon became dimly aware that some excitement of a detached nature was going on around him in spite of the political ferment which reigned in the streets quite a large crowd had gathered to watch the unfolding of a tragedy that had taken place on the shore of the ornamental water a large black swan which had recently shown signs of a savage and dangerous disposition had suddenly attacked a young gentleman who was walking by the water's edge dragged him down under the surface and drowned him before any one could come to his assistance at the moment when bell turbot arrived on the spot several park keepers were engaged in lifting the corpse into a punt bell turbot stooped to pick up the hat that lay near the scene of the struggle it was a smart soft felt hat faintly reminiscent of Ubigon. more than a month elapsed before bell turbot had sufficiently recovered from his attack of nervous prostration to take an interest once more in what was going on in the world of politics the parliamentary session was still in full swing and a general election was looming in the near future he called for a batch of morning papers and skimmed rapidly through the speeches of the chancellor quinston and other ministerial leaders as well as those of the principal opposition champions and then sank back in his chair with a sigh of relief evidently the spell had ceased to act after the tragedy which had overtaken its invoker there was no trace of angel anywhere. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Monroe This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dawn 
The Remolding of Groby Lington A man is known by the company he keeps. In the morning room of his sister-in-law's house, Groby Lington fidgeted away the passing minutes with the demure restlessness of advanced middle age. About a quarter of an hour would have to elapse before it would be time to say his goodbyes and make his way across the village green to the station, with a selected escort of nephews and nieces. He was a good-natured, kindly dispositioned man, and in theory he was delighted to pay periodical visits to the wife and children of his dead brother William. In practice, he infinitely preferred the comfort and seclusion of his own house and garden, and the companionship of his books and his paddock, to these rather meaningless and tiresome incursions into a family circle with which he had little in common. It was not so much the spur of his own conscience that drove him to make the occasional short journey by rail to visit his relatives, as an obedient concession to the more insistent but vicarious conscience of his brother, Colonel John, who was apt to accuse him of neglecting poor old William's family. Groby usually forgot or ignored the existence of his neighbour kinsfolk until such time as he was threatened with a visit from the colonel, when he would put matters straight by a hurried pilgrimage across the few miles of intervening country to renew his acquaintance with the young people and assume a kindly, if rather forced, interest in the well-being of his sister-in-law. On this occasion, he had cut matters so fine between the timing of his exculpatory visit and the coming of Colonel John that he would scarcely be home before the latter was due to arrive. Anyhow, Groby had got it over, and six or seven months might decently elapse before he need again sacrifice his comforts and inclinations on the altar of family sociability. He was inclined to be distinctly cheerful as he hopped about the room, picking up first one object, then another, and subjecting each to a brief, bird-like scrutiny. Presently, his cheerful listlessness changed sharply to an attitude of vexed attention. In a scrapbook of drawings and caricatures belonging to one of his nephews, he had come across an unkindly clever sketch of himself and his paddock, solemnly confronting each other in postures of ridiculous gravity and repose, and bearing a likeness to one another that the artist had done his utmost to accentuate. After the first flush of annoyance had passed away, Groby laughed good-naturedly and admitted to himself the cleverness of the drawing. Then the feeling of resentment repossessed him. Resentment not against the caricaturist, who had embodied the idea in pen and ink, but against the possible truth that the idea represented. Was it really the case that people grew in time to resemble the animals they kept as pets, and had he unconsciously become more and more like the comically solemn bird that was his constant companion? Groby was unusually silent as he walked to the train with his escort of chattering nephews and nieces, and during the short railway journey his mind was more and more possessed with an introspective conviction that he had gradually settled down into a sort of parrot-like existence. What, after all, did his daily routine amount to but a sedate meandering and pecking and perching in his garden, among his fruit-trees, in his wicker chair on the lawn, or by the fireside in his library? and what was the sum total of his conversation with chance encountered neighbours quite a spring day isn't it it looks as though we should have some rain glad to see you about again you must take care of yourself how the young folks shoot up don't they strings of stupid inevitable perfunctory remarks came to his mind remarks that were certainly not the mental exchange of human intelligences but mere empty parrot talk one might really just as well salute one's acquaintances with pretty polly Puss, puss, meow. Groby began to fume against the picture of himself as a foolish, feathered fowl which his nephew's sketch had first suggested, and which his own accusing imagination was filling in with such unflattering detail. I'll give the beastly bird away, he said resentfully, though he knew at the same time he would do no such thing. It would look so absurd after all the years that he had kept the paddock and made much of it, suddenly to try and find it a new home. Has my brother arrived? he asked of the stable-boy who had come with the pony carriage to meet him yes sir came down by the two fifteen your paddock's dead the boy made the latter announcement with the relish which his class finds in proclaiming a catastrophe my paddock dead said grooby what caused its death the ipe said the boy briefly the ipe queried grooby whatever's that the ipe what the colonel brought down with him came the rather alarming answer do you mean to say my brother is ill asked Groby. Is it something infectious? The colonel so well as he ever was, said the boy, and as no further explanation was forthcoming, Groby had to possess himself in mystified patience till he reached home. 
His brother was waiting for him at the hall door. "'Have you heard about the paddock?' he asked at once. "'Pon my soul, I'm awfully sorry. The moment he saw the monkey I'd brought down as a surprise for you, he squawked out, "'Rats to you, sir,' and the blessed monkey made one spring at him, got him by the neck, and whirled him round like a rattle. He was as dead as mutton by the time I'd got him out of the little beggar's paws. Always been such a friendly little beast, the monkey has. Should never have thought he'd got it in him to see red like that. Can't tell you how sorry I feel about it, and now, of course, you'll hate the sight of the monkey. Not at all, said Groby sincerely. A few hours earlier, the tragic end which had befallen his paddock would have presented itself to him as a calamity. Now it arrived almost as a polite attention on the part of the fates. The bird was getting old, you know, he went on, in explanation of his obvious lack of decent regret at the loss of his pet. I was really beginning to wonder if it was an unmixed kindness to let him go on living till he succumbed to old age. What a charming little monkey, he added, when he was introduced to the culprit. The newcomer was a small, long-tailed monkey from the western hemisphere, with a gentle, half-shy, half-trusting manner that instantly captured Groby's confidence. A student of Simeon character might have seen in the fitful red light in its eyes some indication of the underlying temper which the paddock had so rashly put to the test with such dramatic consequences for itself. The servants, who had come to regard the defunct bird as a regular member of the household, and one who gave really very little trouble, were scandalized to find his bloodthirsty aggressor installed in his place as an honored domestic pet. A nasty heathen ape what don't never say nothing sensible and cheerful same as poor Polly did, was the unfavorable verdict of the kitchen quarters. One Sunday morning, some twelve or fourteen months after the visit of Colonel John and the Paddock tragedy, Miss Wepley sat decorously in her pew at the Paddish church, immediately in front of that occupied by Groby Lington. She was, comparatively speaking, a newcomer in the neighborhood, and was not personally acquainted with her fellow worshipper in the seat behind, but for the past two years the Sunday morning service had brought them regularly within each other's sphere of consciousness. Without having paid particular attention to the subject, she could probably have given a correct rendering of the way in which he pronounced certain words occurring in the responses, while he was well aware of the trivial fact that in addition to her prayer book and handkerchief, a small paper packet of throat lozenges always reposed on the seat beside her. Miss Webley rarely had recourse to her lozenges, but in case she should be taken with a fit of coughing, she wished to have the emergency duly provided for. On this particular Sunday, the lozenges occasioned an unusual diversion in the even tenor of her devotions, far more disturbing to her personally than a prolonged attack of coughing would have been. As she rose to take part in the singing of the first hymn, she fancied that she saw the hand of her neighbor, who was alone in the pew behind her, make a furtive downward grab at the packet lying on the seat. On turning sharply round, she found that the packet had certainly disappeared, but Mr. Lington was, to all outward seeming, serenely intent on his hymn-book. No amount of interrogatory glaring on the part of the despoiled lady could bring the least shade of conscious guilt to his face. Worse was to follow, as she remarked afterwards to a scandalized audience of friends and acquaintances, I had scarcely knelt in prayer when a lozenge, one of my lozenges, came whizzing into the pew just under my nose. I turned round and stared, but Mr. Lincoln had his eyes closed, and his lips moving as though engaged in prayer. The moment I resumed my devotions, another lozenge came rattling in, and then another. I took no notice for a while, and then turned round suddenly, just as the dreadful man was about to flip another one at me. He hastily pretended to be turning over the leaves of his book, but I was not to be taken in that time. He saw that he had been discovered, and no more lozenges came. Of course, I have changed my pew. No gentleman would have acted in such a disgraceful manner said one of her listeners. And yet Mr. Lington used to be so respected by everybody. He seems to have behaved like a little ill-bred schoolboy. He behaved like a monkey, said Miss Webley. Her unfavorable verdict was echoed in other quarters about the same time. Groby Lington had never been a hero in the eyes of his personal retainers, but he had shared the approval accorded to his defunct parrot as a cheerful, well-dispositioned body who gave no particular trouble. Of late months, however, this character would hardly have been endorsed by the members of his domestic establishment. The stolid stable-boy, who had first announced to him the tragic end of his feathered pet, was one of the first to give voice to the murmurs of disapproval which became rampant and general in the servants' quarters, and he had fairly substantial grounds for his disaffection. 
In a burst of hot summer weather, he had obtained permission to bathe in a modest-sized pond in the orchard, and thither one afternoon Groby had bent his steps, attracted by loud imprecations of anger mingled with the shriller chattering of monkey language. He beheld his plump diminutive servitor, clad only in a whisket and a pair of socks, storming ineffectually at the monkey, which was seated on a low branch of an apple tree, abstractedly fingering the remainder of the boy's outfit, which he had removed just out of his reach. "'I've spin and took my clothes,' whined the boy, with the passion of his kind for explaining the obvious. His incomplete toilet effect rather embarrassed him, but he hailed the arrival of Groby with relief, as promising moral and material support in his efforts to get back his raided garments. The monkey had ceased its defiant jabbering, and doubtless with a little coaxing from its master it would hand back the plunder. "'If I lift you up,' suggested Groby, "'you will just be able to reach the clothes.' The boy agreed, and Groby clutched him firmly by the waistcoat, which was about all there was to catch hold of, and lifted him clear of the ground. Then, with a deft swing, he sent him crashing into a clump of tall nettles, which closed receptively round him. The victim had not been brought up in a school which teaches one to repress one's emotions. If a fox had attempted to gnaw at his vitals, he would have flown to complain to the nearest hunt committee rather than have affected an attitude of stoical indifference. On this occasion, the volume of sound which he produced under the stimulus of pain and rage and astonishment was generous and sustained, but above his bellowings he could distinctly hear the triumphant chattering of his enemy in the tree and a peal of shrill laughter from Groby. When the boy had finished an improvised St. Vitus catacomb, which would have brought him fame on the boards of the Colosseum, and which indeed met with ready appreciation and applause from the retreating figure of Groby Lington, he found that the monkey had also discreetly retired, while his clothes were scattered on the grass at the foot of the tree. "'Thine two apes, that's what they be,' he muttered angrily, and if his judgment was severe, at least he spoke under the sting of considerable provocation. It was a week or two later that the parlour-maid gave notice, having been terrified almost to tears by an outbreak of sudden temper on the part of the master anent some underdone cutlets. "'He gnashed his teeth at me, he did really!' she informed a sympathetic kitchen audience. "'I'd like to see him talk like that to me, I would,' said the cook defiantly, but her cooking from that moment showed a marked improvement. It was seldom that Groby Lington so far detached himself from his accustomed habits as to go and form one of a house-party, and he was not a little piqued that Mrs. Glen Duff should have stowed him away in the musty old Georgian wing of the house in the next room, moreover, to Leonard Spadink, the eminent pianist. He plays list like an angel, had been the hostess's enthusiastic testimonial. He may play him like a trout, for all I care, had been Groby's mental comment, but I wouldn't mind betting that he snores. He's just the sort and shape that would, and if I heard him snoring through those ridiculous thin-panelled walls, there'll be trouble. He did, and there was. Groby stood it for about two and a quarter minutes, and then made his way through the corridor into Spebbing's room. Under Groby's vigorous measures, the musician's flabby, redundant figure sat up in bewildered semi-consciousness, like an ice cream that has been taught to beg. Groby prodded him into complete wakefulness, and then the pettish, self-satisfied pianist fairly lost his temper and slapped his domineering visitant on the hand. In another moment, Spabink was being nearly stifled and very effectually gagged by a pillowcase tightly bound round his head, while his plump, pajamaed limbs were hauled out of bed and smacked, pinched, kicked, and bumped in a catch-as-catch-can progress across the floor, towards the flat, shallow bath in whose utterly inadequate depths Groby perseveringly strove to drown him. For a few moments the room was almost in darkness. Groby's candle had overturned in an early stage of the scuffle, and its flicker scarcely reached to the spot where splashing smacks, muffled cries and splutterings, and a chatter of ape-like rage told of the struggle that was being waged round the shores of the bath. A few instants later, the one-sided combat was brightly lit up by the flare of blazing curtains and rapidly kindling panelling. When the hastily aroused members of the house party stampeded out onto the lawn, the Georgian wing was well alight and belching forth masses of smoke, but some moments elapsed before Groby appeared with the half-drowned pianist in his arms, having just bethought him of the superior drowning facilities offered by the pond at the bottom of the lawn. 
the cool night air sobered his rage and when he found that he was innocently acclaimed as the heroic rescuer of poor leonard spabbink and loudly commended for his presence of mind in tying a wet cloth round his head to protect him from smoke suffocation he accepted the situation and subsequently gave a graphic account of his finding the musician asleep with an overturned candle by his side and the conflagration well started spabbink gave his version some days later when he had partially recovered from the shock of his midnight castigation and immersion but the gentle pitying smiles and evasive comments with which his story was greeted warned him that the public ear was not at his disposal he refused however to attend the ceremonial presentation of the royal humane society's life-saving medal it was about this time that groby's pet monkey fell a victim to the disease which attacks so many of its kind when brought under the influence of a northern climate its master appeared to be profoundly affected by its loss and never quite recovered the level of spirits that he had recently attained in company with the tortoise which colonel john presented to him on his last visit he potters about his lawn and kitchen garden with none of his erstwhile sprightliness and his nephews and nieces are fairly well justified in alluding to him as old uncle groby End of chapter twenty eight recording by dawn Chapter Twenty Nine of the Chronicles of Clovis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro. Acknowledgement. The background originally appeared in the Leinster's Magazine. The stampeding of Lady Bastable in the Daily Mail. Mrs. Packletide's Tiger, The Chaplet, The Peace Offering, Philboyd Studge and Ministers of Grace, in an abbreviated form, in The Bystander, and the remainder of the stories, with the exception of The Music on the Hill, The Story of St. Vespalus, The Secret Sin of Septimus Brope, The Remolding of Groby Lington, and The Way to the Dairy, which have never previously been published, in the Westminster Gazette. To the editors of these papers I am indebted for courteous permission to reprint them. End of Acknowledgement End of the Chronicles of Clovis by Hector Munro